I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which stands one nation under God. I'm just as John, man, I'm all oh, oh, never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I okay. soon. I wanted to thank you, Representative Sanchez. Everybody else should, should be on mute. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Vose. As chair of the House Science, Technology, and Energy Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing of bills referred to the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee. Executive session on pending legislation may be held at any time. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select, select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the house calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at ledge.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to, unable to access this meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. The staff for this meeting who is assisting us today is Jennifer Four, committee researcher. Please note that all votes that, have, that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. And we will start the meeting in just a minute by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting because that's required under the right to know law. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I noticed that the person We cannot hear Representative Thomas. I was merely stating that uh, I do not see the clerk here in presence, so we're asking someone to please uh, take notes until he arrives. Representative Platt, do you have a roster of uh, members of the committee? Representative Platt is searching his briefcase. <laughs> Sorry for the delay, committee members, but um, we did not anticipate that Representative Myrner would not be here this morning. He is our acting clerk for this week. For Representative Platt will be returning as our clerk on next Monday. Forgive me, um, just wanted to mention there is a list of all the committee members on the House website, the uh, committee. Thank you, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Can you quickly- We actually uh, have a contact list with all of those names. I believe 
Representative McGee prepared that. He probably doesn't know. Oh, there, I couldn't unmute myself. I have here uh, a uh, roll call for votes, but it has all the members and I'll use that for attendance. Uh, okay, Representative Plett, would you call the roll call then? For attendance purposes. Chairman Bowes, are you here? I am here. Tom, uh, Doug, uh, Representative Thomas, are you here? I'm here. Representative Harrington. Representative Nodder. Here. Oh. Here. Representative Werner, late. Uh, rep I'm not on the, uh, I, uh, for the moment, I'm not on the committee. Um, uh, Representative Berezny. Present. Representative Bernardi. Here in committee. Representative Kimbrels. Here in committee. Representative Plosage. How will you say it? Jose. Jose, how do you say it? Okay. Are you here? Yes. President in committee, Plosage. Plosage. Uh, Representative White. Representative Sumshich. Yes, I'm here. And my home. Kelly Pitts. And I'm alone. Representative Kelly Pitts. Representative Mann, I know you're here. Representative Oxenham, here. Representative Vincent. Vincent. Present. Yeah. yeah. Representative Vincent. Rep Representative McGee. Present. Representative McWilliams. Here. Representative Christian. You're muted. Representative Christian. Yes, I'm here. Representative Pimentel. Here and alone. Representative Pasha. Here and alone. And uh, a representative Hamola. I'm here and in the committee room. Okay. okay. We have attendance. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen present. And no, go ahead. Pardon? What say? Fred? It's Jackie. Yes. It's Jackie, Gally Pitts. Okay. Let's see. Thank you, Representative Platt. With 17 members present, we have a quorum oh. to conduct our business for today. And before we start our first public hearing, the chair recognizes Representative Somsich for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to bring up an issue that you and I have had communications about, um, and that's really regarding a presentation by DES that they didn't get a chance to do beforehand. I know we are short of time, but a lot of the bills coming up soon uh, will be in the area of their responsibilities. And if we could have maybe next Friday, a short 30 minute presentation, maybe using some of our uh, lunch period, as well as maybe a 15 minute delay in the other hearings, we could squeeze them in perhaps. So I think that would be advantageous if we could do that. Thank you, Representative Somsich. I will check with DES to uh, find out if they could do a presentation at lunchtime. The chair recognizes Representative Christian for a question. Gosh, I'm sorry, that was uh, from raising my hand earlier about the list of uh, committee members on the website. I apologize. Okay, thank you very much. Without further ado then, let us begin the business of the day. And I will call to order the public hearing on House Bill 168-FN, which requires the adoption of innovative vehicle emission standards pursuant to section 177 of the Federal Clean Air Act. 
And I recognize Representative McWilliams, the prime sponsor, to introduce this legislation. Representative McWilliams. Thank you, uh, Chair Bowes, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Representative Rebecca McWilliams. I represent the west side of Concord uh, at large. Um, and I am bringing this bill again um, because we've had a robust discussion uh, during the last session year about what New Hampshire can do to address air emissions quality and uh, catch up to some of the surrounding states and policy that seems to be moving forward towards air emissions concerns in the United States. So the bill is back. Um, there are some changes to this bill since you've last seen it, if you were participating in ST&E the last go around. Um, <clears throat> right now, the focus on the bill is really to create an on-ramp for um, car dealers here in New Hampshire uh, who would receive retroactive credit for having cars on their lots. So for everyone else who has not yet seen this bill, let me just provide a little bit of background. Um, the intention of this bill is to protect public health here in New Hampshire. Uh, motor vehicles account for half of the emissions of ground level ozone, which is a contributing factor to asthma. And we certainly have low lying areas within the state that are in valleys, um, Keene is an example, uh, where uh, the emissions will sort of settle <clears throat> and cause issues with human health um, and breathing problems. Uh, in addition, uh, motor vehicle emissions contribute to one third of New Hampshire's greenhouse gas emissions, which are also a contributing factor to climate change. So uh, considering both of those factors, this is a, a proactive, proactive step to address those things. Those things. Um, uh, in addition, this bill also provides an emissions specific warranty for the vehicles that fall under this legislation. That is a 15 year, 150 mile uh, warranty specific to emissions, um, which is obviously much greater than what we have right now under New Hampshire law for any of our warranty requirements for cars. Uh, finally, this sets percentage requirements for car dealers here in New Hampshire to carry zero emissions vehicles, which we call ZEVs and low emissions vehicles, which we call LEVs. So when I talk about ZEVs and LEVs, that's the acronym. Um, <clears throat> so right now we have limited choices when someone decides on a Saturday morning that they wanna go out and buy a car and they'll head to their local dealership. And depending on where they're located in the state, whether it's a metro or more rural area, um, they'll go to their local dealership and test drive some vehicles. Um, because New Hampshire is the only Northeast state right now that's not participating in Section 177, which is the California Air Emission Standard, there is no requirement that a certain percentage of vehicles on all dealer lots in New Hampshire actually meet the Zevin Lev requirements. So basically that, what that means is when someone goes out and decides they want to test drive vehicles, <clears throat> depending on what their local dealership is carrying, they may or may not actually have an opportunity to test drive that type of vehicle. So there are limited choices. Um, <clears throat> so knowing that, um, let me just give you a little bit of background about exactly what that means for credits and uh, dealerships carrying uh, certain types of ZEVs and LEVs. So credits are based on a vehicle's zero emission ranges. So a long range vehicle like a Tesla or a Chevy Bolt could earn as much as three to four credits. Plug-in hybrids, like uh, the Chevy Volt as opposed to Bolt, the Volt is more like a half of a credit. So the credits translate roughly into the automakers selling a certain percentage in each of the um, increasing requirement years. So less than 5% ZEVs in 2023, less than 6% in 2025. And this is based on the total volume sold of each dealership. So the requirements for having these vehicles on the lot change depending on the scale of how many vehicles are sold per dealership. Um, so if a dealership fails to meet the credit requirement, then they have another year to comply um, or they will end up paying a fine. It really is flexible. And right now, nobody in the Northeast has been required to pay a fine for missing um, or not hitting that credit requirement. This has been um, fair and flexible up to this date. Um, these rules don't take any vehicles off the road. 
Uh, these rules do not force anyone to buy a ZEV. Um, and the ZEV rule increases customer choice, meaning there are more options for that type of vehicle made by that manufacturer on the lot. The rules do apply primarily to the automakers, not to the dealers, because it, because it is forcing the automakers to push out more ZEVs and LEVs. Um, and it is a statewide rule, but it's typically met through the larger dealerships. Uh, the goal here is to address the need in the state and start increasing our overall state availability starting in 2023 and moving forward 2025, 2027 until it becomes mainstream. This is also not a um, financial credit system. You may have received some testimony um, <clears throat> from folks who oppose this bill saying, well, the really the way to uh, get people to change behavior and buy Zevs and Lebs is to provide some kind of state cash on the hood program so that they will actually buy the vehicle and get a tax write-off or get money back. That's not the way this program is written. This program is written to simply put the cars on lots in New Hampshire, make it available to the public so that they're able to test drive. And the more they test drive, the more they buy. Um, just a little bit of data about what's been changing in the automotive, automotive industry since I last presented uh, a similar version of this bill. Um, Volkswagen Group has now committed to go all electric by 2030. Uh, GM will phase out combustion engines worldwide by 2035 and will be carbon neutral by 2040. Ford is rolling out an all electric F-150 this year, which is their flagship vehicle. Um, and they have a goal of carbon neutrality worldwide by 2050. And Mercedes-Benz will produce electrified versions of all of their cars by 2022. So the future is now. Um, certainly we are seeing more and more of these vehicles available. And the, the intent of this goal is to make New Hampshire an opportunity for everyone who lives here to test drive and potentially buy a ZEV or a LEV. Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, McWilliams for your bill introduction. Uh, do we have any questions for Representative McWilliams? I see there are a few. I have a question myself and I will start. Uh, Representative McWilliams, last year when we heard this bill, we were told that without a buyer's incentive, uh, this bill would simply unnecessarily penalize automotive dealers. Does the new version concern, uh, contain a buyer's incentive pr provision? Uh, thank you for your question, Chairman Vose. Uh, just to be clear, this is not a cash on the head program and there are no monies from the state that are being give given to people who purchase vehicles as an incentive. Uh, that's intentional. I, I have heard from the opponents that you mentioned uh, who say that this program is not going to work without the cash on the hood incentive. Um, and I, I would respond to that by saying, we now have the critical momentum that we did not have last year. The automotive manufacturers are now seeing the writing on the wall and switching to producing ZEVs and LEVs as a standard. And so the industry has now moved over that huge hurdle. Therefore, the state does not need to take on that additional financial requirement, taking everyone's tax dollars and incentivizing individuals purchasing and upgrading to Zev and Lev. Um, so I think you'll see that um, the market has shifted. We're past that now. Thank you for that answer. Follow-up question would be, if the manufacturers of these vehicles have already pledged to make more of them, then why do we need to uh, penalize them for not making enough? So to be clear, this is not meant to be a penalty to automotive manufacturers. This is meant to be a, please take those cars you've made and deliver them to New Hampshire, just like you're delivering them to Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, We'd like them too. You don't need to have your truck stop there and not bring them here to New Hampshire. So it's not a penalty, it's an incentive. Okay, uh, well, I'm gonna have to follow up one more time and I apologize for uh, that, but if it's not a penalty, then why on page two of the bill, line 25, 
does it state that the Department of Environmental Services shall impose a civil penalty not to exceed $37,500 on any manufacturer who sells, attempts to sell, or causes to be offered for sale a new motor vehicle that fails to meet the applicable emission standards? That sounds like a penalty to me. So just to be clear, what you're talking about is someone who's making a false representation, which obviously through law, we don't want a false representation about uh, the air emissions quality of a vehicle. So the, the intent of that provision is to prevent manufacturers from claiming. I, I know we've already had a very large lawsuit about this a couple of years back. Um, from claiming that the tailpipe emissions are a certain standard. Uh, the Volkswagen lawsuit was fought about this. And then it turns out that that's not the case. Okay, thank you for that. The chair now recognizes Representative Oxenham for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for taking my question, Representative McWilliams. Um, is it not the case that the dealers themselves are in, in a, an inferior position <laughs> against their competitors across the state border because of the fact that this provision exists in other states? Am I, am I understanding that correctly or could you, could you help me out there? Sure. So I mentioned the shift to Chairman Vos. Uh, we are now experiencing um, a total shift when it comes to manufacturers and commitments to ZEVs and LEVs. Uh, that means that the states who are already on board to having a certain percentage of ZEVs and LEVs on their dealer lots are now already receiving the latest up-to-date, latest and greatest ZEVs and LEVs from the manufacturers. And that puts us in New Hampshire at a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, because the dealers who choose, and there are some in New Hampshire who choose to nonetheless request ZEVs and LEVs, even though there is no credit associated with that, um, they are often borrowing those cars from across state lines in order to have an appointment for a test drive for, um, let's just say, a, a Chevy uh, Bolt. Uh, someone has called the dealer, usually um, this is in a metro area, so let's just say someone calls a dealer in Portsmouth and says, hey, I want to test drive a che Chevy Bolt. Dealer in Portsmouth says, sure, no problem. Come by Saturday, we'll let, we'll let you drive one. So in Portsmouth, they go to Massachusetts or Maine and get themselves a bolt shipped to the Portsmouth dealership. They do the test drive. And if the person wants to purchase the vehicle, they can. So this is sort of shifting and rotating stock. But in terms of actually being able to schedule an appointment and drive the vehicle you want, there's no guarantee that you'll be able to do that in New Hampshire as opposed to if you drive out of state, you will be able to find those cars you're looking for. May I have a follow-up? Follow-up. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I live on the uh, Connecticut River boundary and when I was trying to buy a zero emission vehicle, I couldn't find one in, in New Hampshire and had to talk to a manufacturer in Manchester and drive to Manchester after they brought the car in and I was able to test drive it. Whereas I could go 15 minutes away in Vermont and have bought that car. So this, I, I, what I'm trying to concentrate our attention on is this is a benefit to New Hampshire businesses and dealerships and it gives them leverage. Is, is, isn't, isn't that also the, the case represented? And, and then I'll, I'll stop asking questions. Doesn't it give leverage to our dealers to be able to obtain these hot ticket items having this on, on the books? Yes, Representative Oxenham, this does give them leverage to have those latest and greatest Zevs and Levs on the lot when, when they come out rather than having to request them for a specific buyer. Yes. Thank you. Thank so you. The chair now recognizes Representative Homola for a question. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Representative McWilliams, for taking my question. Uh, the question I had, is there anything that currently prohibits these uh, manufacturers and dealers from having these ZEVs and LEVs on their lot? A great question. The answer is availability. Uh, because we are the only state in the Northeast that has not signed on to uh, section 177, uh, it's very difficult to get these vehicles because they end up going to lots in other states. So availability is the, the big hurdle. Thank you. Can I have a follow on chair? Follow up. 
Um, the follow-up I have is that, you know, from what I understand, car manufacturers seem to do whatever is financially advantageous for them. And so I don't, I'm not really understanding why they wouldn't do this if it's costing them money, why they would not want to offer this product. So I, I'm just not clear on how they can't have this stock uh, in place already, should, should they choose. Uh, sure. So just to give you a little bit of background about how it works at individual dealerships in New Hampshire, uh, let's say that you're a Ford dealership. Um, Ford will require that you carry a certain percentage of your stock to be um, pickup trucks, right? Uh, those are the ones that usually sell hot ticket item construction vehicles. Uh, they will also require that you have a certain percentage be um, sedans, which are not as popular and don't sell as much. So the manufacturers are already putting requirements on the dealers for what they keep in their lots and their percentages. However, the manufacturers are not shifting down the Zevin Love requirements at this time. Um, and that is something that the 14 states across the US have adopted in order to provide some kind of air emissions control because the manufacturers are not doing that. And I would say that that's probably the role of the legislature to come up with what our expectations are for air emissions, not putting that on a manufacturer. One more follow-up. Thank you. Thank you for the follow-up. Um, I understand what your uh, what you're saying here. The one question I do have, is it appropriate for the legislator, the legislation to be telling the manufacturers what they should be doing with their stock? So that is what the 14 states who've adopted section 177 are doing. And I would argue that it has not died in court. So appropriateness from a judicial perspective is yes, it's allowed. Um, and certainly if we're talking about changing the industry and pushing for more and more emissions regulation here in New Hampshire, then yes, it would be appropriate for the legislature to be asking uh, manufacturers and dealers to provide ZEVs and LEVs to New Hampshire residents to test drive and purchase potentially. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Nodder for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking the question. New Hampshire already has more electric vehicle registrations than Maine or Vermont. So why do we need a bill? Uh, Representative Nodder, our, our total fleet here in New Hampshire is less than half a percentage of the entire state that is electric vehicles. So we have a long way to go for it to become the norm or the accepted practice. And therefore we need uh, to provide more options to buyers. Okay, thank you, uh, Representative. Cambrils. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Representative, for taking the question. Uh, is, could you uh, tell me if there is anything prohibiting New Hampshire dealers, if they should get a request for this, such vehicles from their customers, from having vehicles transferred from the other states to their lots? Because I believe that that's a common practice. Is there anything prohibiting them from doing that with these type of vehicles? So Representative Cambrels, as I stated earlier in my testimony, this has become fairly common practice that uh, a New Hampshire buyer will request a New Hampshire dealership to source a vehicle from out of state. There is no prohibition to this practice, but there is an availability issue. You cannot always get the vehicle you are looking for as a dealership requesting from out of state. Okay. Thank you for that question. The chair now recognizes Representative Sonsich for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Representative McWilliams, for taking my question. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about what is the additional extra warranty that buyers would have if, if the state signed up to this program? Uh, sure. Um, so New Hampshire uh, is fairly well known for being a state where we don't provide a great warranty, especially for lemons and used vehicles. Um, we don't currently have a lot of law on the books that protects buyers from a lemon. Um, that's certainly something that could be brought up as a separate bill at another time, um, but it's sort of buyer beware environment here in New Hampshire. Um, so one of the things that we're very interested in doing with this bill is 
allowing an emissions related warranty. And that is part of the section 177 uh, that will be brought into effect once this legislation passes. Um, the emissions specific warranty is a 15 year, 150,000 miles for emissions specific issues. So let's say that your tailpipe starts getting smoky um, because you're driving a hybrid low emissions vehicle. And obviously that's emissions related. So it's covered under the warranty. It's not going to cost anything out of pocket for that specific owner. Um, and I do wanna be super clear that there are um, quite a bit of savings related to emissions, um, not just under the warranty program, which of course is an excellent 15 years, almost unheard of for standard vehicles. Um, you're, you probably would pay a little bit more than a thousand dollars above your usual price to purchase a LEV, but your <clears throat> less fuel and maintenance net savings is approximately $3,000 over the life of the vehicle. So you pay a thousand more, you save three grand. So you've actually reduced your cost by 2000. Um, for ZEVs, this is where we're talking about Teslas and um, really vehicles that are focused on zero emissions. Approximate upcharge is going to be 6,000 upfront but you'll spend much less in fuel and maintenance. So your net savings is approximately somewhere between 4,000 and 11,000 over the vehicle's life. And that depends on which one you purchased. Um, so the, there is a really big potential for savings if you're looking at 11,000 for a vehicle that's a ZEV and you keep it for quite a significant amount of time. So when we're talking about people saving money through warranty, we're also talking about paying a little more upfront, but being able to save over the duration and long term of owning that vehicle. Uh, Mr. Chairman, follow up. Follow up. Uh, yes. follow up? Oh. Representative McWilliams, uh, can, uh, can you tell me uh, regarding these credits, what, what are the benefits of this program to the dealers? And how does, how does that, are the credits the, providing any benefit to the dealer? So the dealers are required to uh, achieve a certain number of credits based on their sales volume. Credits are not from sale of a vehicle. Credits are from having a ZEV or a LEV located on their lot at their dealership. So once the vehicle is delivered, once it arrives at say this Ford dealership that we're talking about, once the vehicle arrives on the lot, that dealer gets the credit for having it on the lot. If they then sell it and have another one delivered, they get the credit as soon as it arrives on their lot. Um, so the, the benefit to the dealer is really to have these vehicles available for test driving and for sales immediately, not having to coordinate with an out-of-state dealership to bring in a specific vehicle that someone would like to test drive and being able to have cutting edge, top of the line, whatever the manufacturer is, is now pumping out for their latest and greatest, most efficient fuel emission um, emissions reduction vehicle. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Representative Plett for a question. Thank you. Don't forget to unmute. Yes, thank you. Uh, Rep Representative McWilliams, earlier you made statements that uh, the manufacturers all have goals to become 100% electric over a period of time. And I think you mentioned Volkswagen by 2030 and GM in a similar time frame. If so, why do we need this bill if it's going to happen anyway? That's a great question, Representative Platt, and it's good to see you. Um, I think the biggest concern really is making sure that New Hampshire is right there at the front of the line, along with the rest of the Northeast. Uh, we want to make sure that New Hampshire is not going to lose its edge or potentially competitive advantage in receiving these vehicles at the time that they are being released. We know that those percentage requirements for credits for dealers outside of the state will take precedence over dealers inside the state. So once again, if there is an 18 wheeler delivering vehicles to the Northeast, they're going to drop off those vehicles to the states that have these credit requirements first, and then New Hampshire will be second. Okay, the chair recognizes uh, Representative Bernardi for a question. Don't forget then, to use the microphone. I have a question for the chair. I see- uh, You're not recognized to speak just yet. Uh, it, it, 
Allie Pitts, you're next on the list. What? Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, you, you may have just answered this, uh, uh, but uh, I, I'm having great difficulty understanding if these are the hot Thanks. ticket items, why uh, there's an availability problem. Uh, if, if consumers want these, uh, dealerships are going to have them on their lot. If they don't want them, they're not going to be there. So please explain the, this uh, availability issue. Make it very clear. Sure. Uh, so right now, if there are brand new Chevy Bolts available for delivery to the Northeast region, they're coming from the manufacturer and they're being shipped up to the Northeast, there is an order of precedence based on dealership volume and the relationship of the dealership with Chevy. So there's sort of a pecking order already as to who gets the new cars. And they are shipping them to the states that already have the section 177 requirement. So that's all of the Northeast except for New Hampshire as a priority because they're required to get those credits. So New Hampshire falls later in line because there is no credit for the manufacturer to deliver that vehicle to New Hampshire right now. Mr. Chair. Follow up, go ahead. Okay, so I understand that the dealers in Massachusetts and uh, other surrounding states get some kind of credit, but we have very high volume dealers in Manchester and other areas here, why are they not getting these vehicles if they are the hot ticket items and consumers really want them? So to be clear, these dealers in Manchester and Portsmouth can request the vehicles and sometimes they do, but they can be turned down in favor of another state that has the credit requirement. They fall later in line. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Now, uh, Representative Callie Pitts, you are recognized for a question. My first question is to the chair as a procedural matter. I guess I had too much Super Bowl last night because I'm seeing things that I shouldn't see, like gentlemen in your mountain. Uh, and the other is that I'm not seeing all the participants on the screen. So even the ones that are on the phone don't appear with a phone number. So I'm very confused and I, I wish you could um, explain that to me. Then I have a question for the for Ms. McWilliams, but I guess okay. I'm a little lost. Now there he is again. I Again, <laughs> I'm not on drugs, but somebody's appearing in your mountain. Okay. Can you explain that? So the mountain that you see behind me is simply a background that I've chosen to display uh, when I'm on Zoom. And uh, that particular mountain is Potash Mountain, if you care about that, the view from Hedgehog Mountain. Um, the other question you had is you can't see all the participants. Um, no, one of not the even the phone in ones. Pardon? Not they, even the phone in ones. And that gentleman, is he sitting next to you? Who keeps popping up in your mouth? Representative Murner is sitting next to me on my left and Representative Thomas is sitting next to me on my right. There was a view of the room here a minute ago, but right here. Oh, there I is. see the room, view of the room. Oh, okay. But apparently somebody keeps coming into your camera view and it really, it bothers me. I, let me get on with Ms. McWilliams, but I can't, I only see 16 people. I don't see 17 and I didn't see Representative Nada's phone. Usually when somebody phones in, you see their number. Are Representative McWilliams, <laughs> don't pop up anywhere, please. Representative McWilliams, I remember when we did the conversion to catalytic conversions, and now we have 
we try to, ev uh, to avoid tailpipe testing in New Hampshire. Can you tell me what, what happens with tailpipe testing in New Hampshire? I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, this bill does not address tailpipe testing in New Hampshire. This bill is starting from a specific date certain, January 1st, 2023, onward into the future. Dealerships in New Hampshire are required to have a certain percentage based on volume and their relationship with the manufacturer and the requirements of section 177. They're required to provide ZEVs and LEVs for test drive and sale to the public. It's not about tailpipe testing, at least not this legislation. Uh, yes, Representative Callie Pitts, and I now see what you were talking about when you said somebody was popping up in my picture. It was Representative Murner to my left. So I've adjusted my laptop a little bit, so hopefully he won't pop up in my frame again. But yes, please follow up. Oh, I didn't have too much Tom Brady. Um, the other question I have is, when you we, could you clarify a ZEV and a LEV? I low emissions. I I believe and this is my assumption are hybrids and zero are electric. Am I correct in that assumption? So yes, the the zero emissions vehicle is just what it says. It it has no emissions at all. It's zero. The low emissions is some, but not zero. And that's why the credits for low emissions can range fairly significantly depending on how much emissions we're talking about. But it's still a reduction from a typical automotive vehicle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Parshall is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And as a side note, to uh, uh, Representative uh, Kelly Pitts. I'd be glad to spend two minutes uh, during our lunchtime if you'd like to get your gallery view up. I've got a full view gallery in it. That's all I can get. Oh, okay, then maybe I can't help you. Uh, on to my questions. Uh, Representative McWilliams, there's an earlier question about the incentivizing consumers. Isn't it less of a factor when incentivize purchase of ZEVs for those who seek 150 plus miles per gallon equivalent? such as my leaf provides? That sounds accurate, but I don't claim to be an expert on this. Okay, uh, second question. Follow up. Yes, please, thank you. This sounds like a bill that would give our dealers the same market access as states that have adopted the 177 standards. Would I have had a greater choice in New Hampshire market had I access to the same ZEVs that are being marked, made available to our neighboring states that have already subscribed to the 177 standards? Absolutely. Thank you. No doubt. Point of order. Okay, thank you. What is your point of order? Um, you mentioned that uh, Representative Murner is sit sitting to your left. Has he taken over minutes? Because I've been squ scrivening away here. Uh, yeah. Still getting I'm just getting in. Not yet. Maybe he'll take over at the next public hearing. If you could complete this one, we'd appreciate that, Representative. Thank you. Okay. Um, Representative McGee has a question. You're recognized uh, to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Representative McWilliams, for taking my question. Um, I read in a recent energy report that the estimate for uptake in New Hampshire of electric vehicles in the next decade would be around 17,000 vehicles. And I'm curious, uh, so it's basically, you know, um, uh, forecasting what they think the demand will be for people buying these new types of vehicles. And then you testified about how the major car manufacturers actually have set targets now for when they will stop creating combustion vehicles and really convert to all electric vehicles. So I guess my question is, how does this bill support, and I'm a co-sponsor, but I still think you can answer this better than I could. Uh, how does this bill support uh, those folks who are clearly seeking these vehicles? Uh, and as others have said, rather than leaving it the way it is. 
So that's a really interesting statistic that you bring up. I think you said 17,000. Yes. Um, that's a fa fairly low number. Um, the working numbers that we have from the last time um, we went through this sort of bill research and presentation process with DES um, was approximately 1.4 million cars in New Hampshire. That's the existing fleet numbers that we've been using for annual registrations of vehicles in New Hampshire. Um, so 17,000 out of 1.4 million is just a drop in the bucket. You know, we only have 1.3 million people in New Hampshire, so obviously we've got some two, three, four car households, um, but 17,000 is super low. Um, I mentioned earlier that the industry is now shifting. We've, we've gotten over that hump, that hurdle that required cash on the hood to change behavior because the manufacturers, Ford, Volkswagen Group, GM, and Mercedes-Benz have all made commitments to go electric, which is great. Um, so now what we're talking about is trying to make sure that people can test drive those vehicles. Um, I, I will pull up the data and send an email to the committee because I think it's important that you understand that the, the numbers are super high of people who actually have an opportunity to test drive an electric vehicle who actually do purchase. So getting them behind the wheel to try it out is really important. And that's one of the goals here is to just increase the supply on dealer lots so that that can happen. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I may, this may have been misleading because honestly, uh, Representative I, McGee, oh, uh, do you need a follow-up? Yeah, it's a follow-up to what uh, the data that please, I put up there. Please make sure it's a question and not a statement. You are a co-sponsor in this bill. Typically we don't allow co-sponsors to, to ask questions. So oh, make it- we those rules at the beginning and you, I thought you had changed that, Mr. Chairman. Oh. We asked no. that question at the beginning and you said that they would be able to. Well, time permitting, but okay. the problem is we have four more people who wanna speak on this bill. Yeah, that's and, fine, uh, you can move on. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, everyone who has their hand raised has already asked questions. So we're going to, of this uh, um, person who's testifying, Representative uh, McWilliams. So we're gonna move on and uh, I'm gonna recognize now a member of the public represented himself. Uh, his name is Gerald, and I apologize if I mispronounce this, uh, Gerald Bochelli or Bochelt. Bouchelt. Good morning. Bouchelt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My name is Gerald Bouchelt, um, president of uh, Bethlehem, New Hampshire. And uh, uh, like I said, speaking on my behalf, um, just for my background, I have a uh, um, master's degree in theoretical physics, and I've been working in a number Could you of move a little closer to your microphone? Or oh, sorry. Up? Yeah, I'll try to speak up a little bit. Um, so uh, I just wanted to speak up for this. Uh, I'm not necessarily in favor uh, of this bill for a number of reasons, and I want to keep it brief. Um, I think California rules are probably really good for California. Uh, I do recognize, though, that there's a different uh, type of economy, a different type of ecology. They have uh, large metropolitan areas that they have to deal with, and I think we don't have quite as many. Um, so, uh, especially in some of those areas where I live in Bethlehem, we do have um, different needs for cars. We don't need uh, that many zero emission or low emission vehicles, but more trucks and SUVs. And I fear that they could get uh, more expensive down the road. Um, I think there's also something that concerns me generally, um, which is the dependence on other states' regulators. So, if California decides to make changes or um, adjust stuff, it feels odds that uh, our regulations would automatically change by that with little or no oversight from what we're doing. We could obviously opt out of the program again, but that would int uh, introduce a lot of increased uncertainty, I guess. Um, I think there's um, some concern for me about the cost. Um, we already see some implementation costs, some additional staffing. Um, there's an un it's unclear um, to what extent uh, there's uh, um, uh, additional third party services, um, what that cost would look like. Uh, I think there will be uh, likely secondary costs in the form of implementation costs for the businesses, um, potentially increases in the car prices. Uh, we may see like a, a shift from uh, out of state um, um, uh, buyers that could ultimately end up uh, not buying quite as much in New Hampshire because our car prices are going up. And honestly, it's like uh, there's a 15% increase in sticker cost um, that is also already called out in the, um, in the um, thing as well. And, I'm just thinking it's like during the fairly tough economic times we're in right now, I don't see that this is necessarily the right time 
to start uh, going into a, uh, a regime where we increase the cost for our businesses and for our citizens across the board. So I'm worried about that. And then lastly, um, the benefits seem to me is like based on what I've been hearing and, and reading, it's like really not that uh, instrumental. Yes, we may be, some of the dealers may uh, get a little bit higher on the pecking order for certain vehicles, but generally speaking, those vehicles have been available to, uh, to New Hampshire residents across the board and to the dealers as well. Like, like I said, maybe not quite as much as we would like them to be, but um, uh, that's true for other models as well. If I want a certain specific model of a car, then I may have to get out of state in order to get that as well. So it's like, it's not only true for these, but it's like a true across the board. And generally speaking, it's like just looking at the kind of progress we've made based on voluntary or the federal kind of standards. I think um, over the last 20, 30 years, uh, the emissions from noxious gases and uh, uh, greenhouse gases have gone down quite significantly, despite us uh, uh, traveling a lot more when our, with our cars and having a lot more traffic on the roads. Uh, final thing I just want to say is like, I'm not sure that emulating California or adopting California regulations is a particularly good thing to do. Uh, we're seeing that the overregulation that California has been promoting has led to uh, companies and uh, citizens leaving the state. So it's like I'm, I'm fearing that similar things could happen to us if we just follow that kind of model in general. I think it's best to leave the decision on what to buy and what to offer to the citizens to the businesses and the manufacturers and not in interfere with this because the markets seem to be doing quite well in terms of regulating as long as there's some broad general guidelines. And uh, again, it's like, I think California is like not really great uh, to emulate from an energy policy in general. It's like they have rolling bro uh, brownouts, they have electricity shortages. And uh, like I said, co uh, companies leaving, I, I would rather not see uh, New Hampshire emulate that. So I'd ask you to vote against this bill. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boschelt, for your testimony. Are there questions for Representative Bosch? I mean, for Mr. Boschelt? Uh, Representative Bernardi, I think you had a question. Uh, yes. Uh, you made uh, some very interesting comments, and I'm interesting, interested if you have done the analysis of. Uh, how much the electric rates uh, or the electric demand would go up if we implemented this? How much more additional electricity would we need to have available in New Hampshire? Unfortunately, I have not done that research, but uh, I'd be more than happy to sit down and look uh, hard at that afterwards if, 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 if it's of interest. I'll circle back. Any follow-up? Okay. Any other questions? Uh... Seeing none, we'll move to our next uh, testifier who will be Nicholas Thomas, a member of the public uh, representing himself. Mr. Thomas, you have the floor. Mr. Thomas is not there. Okay, in that case, we'll move on to um, the next speaker, who is Joseph Kwasnick, a member of the public representing himself. Mr. Kwasnick, you're recognized to speak. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, today I'm providing oral testimony in support of House Bill 168. And the reason for my support is that, um, as we've heard today- Okay, now we can't hear you, uh, at least very, very uh, softly. You need to speak up, move closer to the mic, or do something to uh, make well, yourself heard. Can you hear me better now? No? Can you hear me now? <laughs> That's a little bit better. I'm sorry. Uh, not sure what the technical issues are. Uh, can you hear? Uh, let me at least try to give my testimony. And if it doesn't work, I'll keep it offline. Okay. Um, as you've heard today, uh, both LEVs and ZEVs will uh, reduce tailpipe emissions, both in increasing the health of our uh, citizens in New Hampshire and also reducing more traditional tailpipe emissions that cause smog. Uh, recent studies have shown that um, LEVs and ZEVs are less expensive to own and operate over the lifetime relative gas and diesel fueled options. In fact, studies indicate that vehicles, these vehicles save consumers between $200 and $1,300 just in fuel costs alone uh, at, uh, in these studies. 
Uh, as we pointed out before, 14 states have already uh, adopted these standards and they surround New Hampshire within the New England and Northeastern United States. And finally, uh, adopting these standards will improve the overall health of our citizens of New Hampshire. Let's do something to protect our citizens and ensure that our environment is cleaner and remains attractive to our tourist and recreational industry. Many of these tailpipe emissions create smog, which uh, causes visibility issues within the high peaks of New Hampshire. And I know that um, unable to see the high peaks will certainly divert tourists to other states that are actually have adopted this legislation. I thank you for the time today and uh, hope you'll um, uh, vote uh, in favor of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kwasnick. Any questions for Mr. Kwasnick? Before we move on to our next speaker, I have a couple of, uh, oh, I see a hand up from Representative Callie Pitts. Would you like to ask a question? Don't forget to unmute. Yes, please. Um, Mr. Kwasnick, one of the concerns that I have is that electric vehicles are fine and I've actually driven one. Uh, the cost and the infrastructure, um, is that a problem in New Hampshire, particularly New Hampshire? Because in order to drive these vehicles, we have to charge them somehow. So is this a little bit premature? Uh, a, a very good question. Uh, a couple of things that to points to point out here is that um, electric vehicles, uh, their emissions is equivalent to what the, um, what the emissions are for our, our system power that's supplied through the region of ISO New England. So a point there is that system to get cleaner then the emissions associated with the electricity generated to supply for those vehicles goes down. So they get cleaner over time. But also importantly, electric vehicles are part of the strategy in the electric distribution companies in New Hampshire as part of their time of use rates. In other words, uh, what the utilities would like to do is actually shift the load from these electric vehicles to the evening or off peak hours, where you actually have um, sufficient supply, in fact, more, more supply than you need. So these actually would be part of the strategy within these companies to utilize these to actually reduce load. And in many cases, um, some of the more uh, forward thinking people in this industry see them as actually supplying energy uh, during times when there's not enough supply. So they also could be part of what's called the spinning reserve. So they actually will be beneficial for our utility system going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before we move on to our next speaker, I have a couple of, uh, I neglected to make a couple of announcements uh, earlier. The first announcement is that the members of the committee who are in the legislative office building are in a different room today. We're in the finance committee room, which is rooms 210 and 211. We're not in rooms 202, 203, where we've been the last two meetings. So if it looks different to you on screen, that's because it is. The other thing that I forgot to mention earlier is that for this bill in particular, Representative, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Department uh, uh, Air Division uh, Leader Mike Fitzgerald is here today and he's available to answer questions if anybody has any. Uh, and I apologize to Mr. Fitzgerald for, for forgetting to mention that earlier. So with that said, we'll move on to our uh, final speaker for the day. This is Dan Bennett, who is a lobbyist representing the New Hampshire Automobile Dealers Association. So Mr. Bennett, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Dan Bennett and from the New Hampshire Automobile Dealers Association. We're a trade group representing the motor vehicle industry of car, truck, snowmobile, ATV, construction farm equipment dealers uh, statewide, about 500 businesses in all corners of the state and every um, community. So I will be brief um, and I'll also try and answer some of the questions or comments that I've heard. Uh, we once again, uh, similar to as we did last year, we oppose HB 168, but as written. And our proposal once again is that uh, the ST&E committee 
consider creating a legislative study commission on this bill, on this issue, to further explore the possibility of creating a successful New Hampshire solution for the adoption of a Z vehicle emission standard. We worked with the sponsor last year, as well as Department of Environmental Services and NESCOM and others when the bill was originally filed. However, some of our concerns still remain unresolved, which is why we again request uh, that the bill, uh, the issue be made into a study commission. So for a successful program, emerging markets like this need to be pulled, not pushed. Incentives work. You have to grow demand. And you all may remember cash for clunkers in New Hampshire. New Hampshire had the highest take rate per capita nationwide in cash for clunkers because there was an incentive program. All of our neighboring states have incentive programs. Even Rhode Island, which doesn't, really does because they have a state fleet mandate for EVs. So that is the incentive there. When Georgia repealed their incentive program, sales of their EVs plummeted 83%. When Massachusetts was on the brink of repealing theirs, they had the highest take rate because customers, car buyers, saw that, that demand go away. Plug in America is the largest EV advocate group in the US. Last week, they released a report on the top 25 states for EVs nationwide. New Hampshire was number 15. I, I think that's a, a, great, um, a great stat. However, to quote from the report that was just published last week, an EV incentive is among the most effective means of increasing EV adoption in each of the states in the top 10 featured a purchase incentive. So uh, again, our, our request for a study commission is, is in the hopes of a successful program and without some type of market incentive this will not be an, a, a successful program uh, to address them. Dealers sell what customers want. So they do swaps and trades on a daily basis. They can get vehicles um, in all makes, models, trims, uh, whatever the power source happens to be. They, 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 do, they trade on a, constantly. Um, so uh, a couple other things that I'll mention real quick. Um, vehicle credit at the time of delivery by the manufacturer really is an unfair uh, way of handling it. And it doesn't really help the, the true goal of emissions reductions, if, if that's what this, uh, the goal of this is. Just because they're delivered to the dealer um, and the credit is issued doesn't mean the vehicle is on the road. And that's where the emissions reduction comes from. So uh, this should really be at the time of registration program, not the time of delivery to reduce emissions just because it lands in New Hampshire, but it's backlotted doesn't help with uh, emissions reductions in air quality and health issues. So uh, I offer that um, as, as something to be considered um, if the committee does in fact decide to do a study commission. Um, you know, something I, I heard before just to answer, you know, this is in fact a penalty system. You know, if the manufacturer doesn't deliver the vehicle to the state based on a proportion or a percentage, they pay a fine. So it is in fact a, a, a penalty system. Um, some of the things that should be analyzed, you know, through this is we have no idea what this is gonna do in the road toll. So our gas tax, this type of long-term analysis and the health of our road toll should be conducted. Uh, analysis of the manufacturer's production schedules should be performed. Um, they've stated electrification goals and long-term goals, but in the short term, in 2024, 2025, it's unclear whether we can meet, whether those production goals will even be, um, will be met. We asked last time when we looked at, to, to look at some of the state fleet numbers um, so that we had a clearer picture of what it is that we're committing to. In 2023, are we committing to go from 700 vehicles to 1,700 or 700 vehicles to 7,000 and whether the manufacturer can meet those goals. So um, as mentioned, a, a legislative study commission um, really I think would be an appropriate step. It should include the legislature, DES, DOT, uh, the Office of Strategic Initiatives, 
the Public Utilities Commission about electricity demand, uh, Nescom would be a good one, ourselves, um, and importantly, the vehicle manufacturers to continue the discussion, to explore the potential, but to come up with a successful program. And that's what we're stating here. So um, with that, I will uh, end my testimony other than just to answer one other quick question. I heard from Representative Callie Pitts regarding tailpipe testing. In New Hampshire, we don't tailpipe test. When we made the uh, agreement with the APA multiple years back, in lieu of tailpipe testing in our um, more polluting counties, what the state agreed to was to do OBD2, which is onboard diagnostic testing, um, statewide. Uh, and it's actually a more thorough uh, check of the emission system as a whole. It can actually detect whether you have a loose, uh, a loose uh, fuel cap, as opposed to just testing at the tailpipe, the muffler as well. So that's why we arrived at OBD2 testing statewide in New Hampshire. So um, other than that, thank you for your time. I know I moved through rather quickly. Uh, that's our, uh, our stand on HB 168. And if there are any questions, I will attempt to, um, to answer them. And if I can't, I'll get back to the committee with those answers. Okay, thank you for uh, your testimony. The chair recognizes Representative Thomas for a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Ben, for taking my question. Um, I apologize. Your testimony came over very fuzzy here, and I really didn't catch a lot of it, so I apologize if I'm asking something that you may have already said. But my question is, if there was a large demand here in this state for these vehicles, what is preventing the manufacturers from offering incentives like they do with other vehicles to sell more of, of those cars. Could you explain that for me, please? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'll do, I'll do my best. The, the one thing I'll say is manufacturers make cars, dealers sell cars. So dealers sell what the customers want and they source their vehicle fleet based on demand. New Hampshire has a higher take rate of pickup trucks. So dealers stock their lots with more pickup trucks than say commuter passenger sedans. So uh, the dealers sell and, and market their product based on what their customer base wants and desires. Follow up. Follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, to paraphrase, I believe what you just said, are, are you, to, to clarify, are you saying that the dealers here in the state don't see the demand for these vehicles, and so therefore, uh, they're not getting incentives to sell more of them. Is that what you're saying? The dealers see the demand, and when they do, they go out. If they don't have that vehicle, they easily go out and swap and obtain that vehicle from a dealership that does, whether it's in state or whether it's cross state borders. Swaps and trades happen on a daily basis, whether it's for an electric vehicle or whether it's for. Uh, the Harley Davidson edition Ford F-150. Thank you. The chair recognizes Representative Notter for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking the question. I was struggling with the, with the audio quality as well. Uh, if you haven't done so already, could you please email us your testimony? Yes, and I apologize for the audio quality, Representative Nara. I will certainly get written copy of my testimony to the committee. Um, again, uh, emphasizing that our request for 168 uh, be formed into a study commission. You need a follow up? Okay. Uh, next up then is uh, Representative Christian. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Bennett, for taking my question. Um, so you mentioned a few times that you were eager to have a successful program uh, established. Can you just tell me a little bit about what your criteria for a successful program would look like? Uh, well, I mean, one, some of the things I mentioned, and I'm sorry if it didn't come across, the successful program would have to do with analysis of the impact on the road toll, analysis of what our vehicle fleet would look like. And as you 
you know, history and other states have shown, um, a mandate such as this that does not have an incentive does not set up a program for success. I mean, we do it with solar, right? That's how we put more panels on rooftops. We have incentive programs. Emerging states like this, they need to be pulled along. And the way that you pull that along is through incentive programs. And that's what creates success. New Jersey has a very robust program. Do you know why? They put $5,000 on the hood of the car to the customer to incent those vehicles. Other states that do, they have HOV lanes and electric vehicles get access, even with solo drivers, to those, those HOV lanes. So uh, innovative ways, uh, and it's not just always, as mentioned, you know, dollars on the hood, but innovative incentive programs so that the programs can be successful so that these vehicles make it out into the market and, and, and they're, they're driven the same way we do with the example I use is we put more panels on roofs. So, so just to clarify, you would be in favor of a, an incentive program where the state of New Hampshire was providing dollars to customers for adopting these vehicles? Uh, the, so I don't want to commit, the devil's in the details, right? But our belief is that if there is an incentive program, it's got a much, much higher chance of success. So if there is a program, the incentive really definitely should be part of it. Uh, Representative Bernardi is recognized for a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, so, and thank you, Speaker. If, if New Hampshire has more uh, EVs than both Vermont and Maine, who already have this program, how do we know it's going to work in New Hampshire? We don't. Hence the need for or our request or belief that a study commission is justified to explore the issue to see whether it will be successful. Okay, thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Pimentel for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bennett for being here. Um, I have a question. Are, are you familiar with the uh, EV and uh, uh, LED vehicle sales in our surrounding states that uh, do have this program? Basically, the question is, do you know how they're doing with this with this program uh, in in effect? I mean, one statistic that we've talked about before, and I believe maybe one of the agencies that's listening in could weigh in on it is, is that we basically have equal to the EV registration as Maine does, and Maine has this program in place and we don't. Okay, and thank you. Vermont? I don't know about the Vermont statistics. What I do know again, I go back to is that Vermont has an incentive program to, to you know, financially incentivize and get more vehicles out on the road. Okay, thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Ploget for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Bennett, you mentioned- uh... Speak closely to the mic. Your mic is not working. Or can they handle that themselves? Thank you. So, um, 
I apologize. The, the question was was um, very tough to hear, but, but I think what you're asking is whether the study committee would look at manufacturers providing the vehicles to the dealerships. Um, and if so, if that, if that is in fact the question, our belief is that the manufacturers wholeheartedly should be part of the study commission um, to offer input and insight as to what even their production volume will be um, and whether we have these targeted goals of X percentage of vehicles on the road, whether they can even make so many Chevy Bolts, Nissan Leafs, electric Ford F-150s, uh, or Rivians for that matter, uh, that, that those fleet targets could be obtained. So yes, just like um, some of the regulatory agencies that I mentioned, DES, NESCOM, DOT, uh, the dealers and the manufacturers should be part of that study commission um, to, to chart that, that path forward. Okay, uh, next up, uh, the chair recognizes Representative Somsich for a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Bennett for taking my question. Um, just to clarify, if, if uh, like you mentioned about the swapping of vehicles, um, if I decide to look for a ZEV vehicle in New Hampshire and the local dealership gets me that vehicle from another state, and I purchased that vehicle in light of the fact that we're not part of this California arrangement, do I still get the extended warranty that was mentioned? Uh, thanks for the question, Representative Sonsich. Uh, I don't believe you do because the state of New Hampshire is not, uh, has not adopted the California ZEV mandate. So, that would not apply. So, uh, follow up. Mr. Follow up. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so, to clarify, I wouldn't get that extended warranty, uh, but it would get credited to the Massachusetts dealership as far as having sold that vehicle. Is that correct? Well, to, so. Uh, and thank you for the question, two part question coming there. So one, you as the New Hampshire resident, I don't believe, um, and Department of Environmental Service maybe I'll answer this pretty better, would not get that warranty. However, the credit is not issued to the dealership. The, the credit and the penalty is the state to the manufacturer. It's at the time of delivery. When that vehicle manufacturer drops that vehicle on the lot, of the, they get the, the, the credit. It's a, uh, it's a delivery credit. It's not a sale credit. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The chair recognizes Representative Plett for a question. Don't forget to unmute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for taking my question, Mr. Bennett. If, uh, the ZEVs and LEVs are truly competitive. Why do we need an incentive? I, I think the, the nature of this, of this bill is showing that the market is not quite ready. And this is, this is the way to spur the market. This is the way to grow the, the ZEV um, you know, zero emission or uh, battery hybrid electric vehicle, the BHAV uh, market. So this is acknowledgement that we're trying, that the attempt is to try and grow the market. That's what this program is. And so we ain't trying to grow a market, you need to pull it along. And that's what the incentive does. Same thing with, I take that example that I use cash for clunkers. We were trying, they were trying to get dirtier, heavier polluted vehicles off the road. What did they do? They gave an incentive, a trade-in credit. Get the dirty vehicle, a dirtier vehicle off the road, we'll give you $3,500 to trade it in towards the purchase of a newer, cleaner vehicle. And that's when New Hampshire had um, a highly successful, highly positive take rate. 
Do you need a follow-up, Representative Platt? Apparently, Representative Platt is now on the phone, so <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, I have a question for you, um, Mr. Bennett. Charlie Baker, the governor of Massachusetts, recently signed into law a bill that forbids the sale of internal combustion engine cars after the year 2035, although it apparently isn't binding. Uh, I don't know what kind of a law that would be, but uh, in his uh, explanation of the law, he suggested that Massachusetts needs to acquire 750,000 electric vehicles by the year 2035. Now that is only 14 years from now. And in order for Massachusetts, which currently has about 30,000 electric vehicles to get 750,000 vehicles by 2035, they would need to sell 51,500 electric vehicles per year for 14 years. And at an average cost of $50,000 a vehicle, that would be about $2.5 billion that Massachusetts consumers would have to fork over to buy these cars. That would generate about $155 million in taxes for the state of Massachusetts. My question is, doesn't a policy just as the one Massachusetts just adopted kind of subvert this legislation? Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I too uh, concur with you that I believe that um, Governor Baker's announcement was a, um, a policy statement. Um, I don't believe it was anything that he had signed into law. However, in looking at those Massachusetts numbers, um, what I would say is it's, it's detailed analysis to see the numbers and the rate and um, how quickly and the absorption rate and the cost at which that would come to both the state and the citizens. Uh, and that is something that this proposed legislation has not even done. So we don't know what uh, that massive number of volume uh, of cost um, or purchase level by customers to achieve the goals prescribed in the bill to not have the manufacturers incur penalties that could potentially be cost off, passed on to the dealer to raise the cost of vehicles. That type of analysis as the Massachusetts stuff that you brought up has not been done for a New Hampshire model, which is why our suggestion again is to, to slow walk and study it and do that detailed level of analysis. Thank you, my apologies for misspeaking. It's not legislation, it's a plan, according to uh, news reports. Uh, the chair now recognizes Representative Pimentel for a question. Uh, I don't have a hand up, do I? I'm sorry, I miss, uh, <laughs> I meant to say Representative Partial, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, a question, did I hear right? Where in the bill did it state there would be a fine for not carrying LEV and ZEV emission cars? I did not see that in the bill. Did I miss something? Thank you, Representative. Um, in Section 3, Roman numeral 1 and Roman numeral 2 talks about civil penalties, and uh, Roman 3 talks about the funds received from the penalties will be deposited into the Motor Vehicle Air Pollution Abatement Fund established in RSA 125. So if the manufacturer does not deliver the prescribed number of vehicles to the state, then the Department of Environmental Services is empowered to find the manufacturers for not meeting those delivery targets. And that's my follow-up question. You follow up? Yes, please. Um, what would, as we are not uh, undertaking commissions at this time, what would your alternative be to creating a study commission to solve this problem? Uh, I, I, if, if what the legislature wanted to do was convene an informal ad hoc 
study commission the way it happened over the summer related to uh, zero emissions goals. I, I assume that might be an opportunity, um, but a, a study commission, uh, you know, and our belief and our advocacy for a study commission, as we did last year, as we do again this year, is the best chance of success to keep the discussion going and moving towards potentially um, a, a positive result and a successful program. So we continue to believe that a study commission is the best course of action. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Thomas is recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing one more question for me. Thank you, Mr. Bennett, for taking this question. Uh, this is more of a technical question uh, based on an article I, I recently read a day or two ago. Um, I seem to recall, uh, what is your, what is your, um, can you verify or clarify for me the um, emissions that we might be saving from having EVs in our, in our, in our field here in, in our state? My, uh, my readings uh, indicated to me that uh, the uh, environmental damage that is done in the manufacture of EVs because of the batteries that they use and, and so forth that the average EV would have to uh, be used approximately seven years before um, uh, they'd have a, a zero sum. Can you tell me what the expected life uh, uh, expectancy is of an EV and uh, here in the state of what people are driving and, and, and uh, comment on that uh, statement that, that I just made? Yes, and thank you for the question, Representative Thomas. I will uh, do my best. I am unfamiliar with the study that you're referencing um, as far as uh, the emissions reduction, um, you know, per EV. Uh, however, that's something that the, uh, the study commission that we're proposing certainly should review and look at. It's one of the reasons we're suggesting, uh, you know, folks from Department of Environmental Services and NESCOM certainly be involved. Uh, those are the experts at looking at emissions reductions, targets, and goals. Um, however, I do know according to RL Pope, which is you know an industry data uh, compiler, the average life cycle of a vehicle is just shy of 12 years. So the average vehicle on the road, I believe, is like 11.9, 11.10 months old. So um, that's the age of uh, the average age of vehicles on the road. So uh, to reference your seven-year number. Um, Industry averages about eleven. Shy of twelve. Thank you. Thank you. We're just about a, out of time. Representative uh, Oxenham, do you have a very quick question? I do. Thank you very much. I, I, I would ask that that question was just answered. Could be directed to Mike Fitzgerald. He's been waiting to to provide information on this um, related points about emissions. Mr. Fitzgerald, you are now permitted to speak. Oh, don't tell me you stepped out of the room. I'm sorry, I had to unmute. Um, Go ahead, thank you, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, first, I, I also would like to send my uh, greetings to Representative Platt and best wishes in his continued recovery. Um, and uh, uh, in response to the uh, question that was asked, um, the department has not run specific uh, current specific numbers for this legislation. We did provide some information um, last year, which could be updated. Um, there are there are emissions and environmental benefits. Um, depending on the number of vehicles that would be uh, that that are uh, are purchased in response to the to the requirements, um, uh, and uh, um, but I I can't quantify those at the uh, at the moment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald. Before we go any further, I want to open the public hearing on HB two eighty nine and then recess that hearing for the time being. 
Uh, Rex, Representative Oxenham, did you have, excuse me, did you have another question? Don't forget Forgive to unmute. Forgive me for not lowering my hand. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Plett is recognized for a question. Don't forget to unmute. I just wanted to thank Mike Fitzgerald for his uh, uh, well wishes. I'm off oxygen, except for when I'm active, uh, walking actively. Otherwise, I'm totally off it. So I'm making rapid progress. Okay, thank you, Representative Plett. Uh, Representative Pimentel is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Um, I have a question. Uh, one of the things that came up is, and we're putting the cart before the horse as far as uh, trying to get more electric vehicles in the state because we have nowhere to charge them. And I was just wondering, where are we as a state as far as charging electric vehicles? Sure. Um, thank you very much for that question, uh, Representative. And uh, um, the department uh, is actively participating in the uh, Volkswagen funding uh, program with the uh, um, Governor's Office of Strategic Initiative. And um, that is part of the uh, uh, strategy is to increase the uh, number, the amount of EV infrastructure in the state. Currently, New Hampshire does lag uh, many <coughs> other um, New England states. The governor has recognized this and has uh, authorized that the full 15% that is allowed under the VW agreement be authorized for use of uh, in, in incentivizing additional EV infrastructure. Um, it's also been recognized as a tourism issue here in New Hampshire that many people in the metro region south of us um, uh, may or may not choose to, uh, to come here if they have electric vehicles and they want to, um, uh, you know, be able to, to, uh, to come to New Hampshire and charge their vehicle and get back home safely and get around. Um, many resorts are starting to adopt uh, and hotels are starting to adopt technology and have parking spaces for EVs. Um, and um, so uh, it is. It is coming along, but um, we we do uh, we do fall behind other states uh, surrounding us. Thank you, thank Mr. You, Fitzgerald. Follow, uh, follow up. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, so on the on the uh, public on on the public side. Um, do you know how many charging stations are actually in, uh, installed in the state, whether they're in uh, bank parking lots or hotels or uh, whatever? Do you know where we are there on, the, on that? Uh, I know that we have that information available. I can send it to the committee uh, following the hearing. I don't have it right with me at the moment. Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Somsich is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, um, can you confirm the fact that there are, uh, there are, there are at least uh, some models out there that are zero emission that operate on hydrogen and not just EVs? And a second question I have is regarding the penalties in this bill. Um, I believe uh, Representative McMill has mentioned that those penalties apply when a vehicle is delivered uh, and doesn't meet the emissions requirements. Not, not that this is a penalty for not delivering such a vehicle. Is that correct? Um, so you, you had a two part question there. Um, I, I guess the, the response to your first part is there are uh, ZEV vehicles um, that that are hydrogen, they're very advanced technology vehicles, and I believe there's extremely limited supply of those. Um, again, those would be directed to other, other states if they're available, um, other states that have adopted the, uh, the ZEV program. Um, in um, your uh, uh, second question, I'm sorry, could you ask, uh, repeat the uh, second question? You, you wanted yeah, me to confirm yeah. something? 
Yeah, sure. The the bill in, in this in all oh, the penalties. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I believe, although I haven't had a chance to, to, to look at it overly carefully, but I, I believe it, one point to make is that um, Section 177 of the Clean Air Act only allows New Hampshire to adopt the California program um, or, or other Section 177 states. Um, a, a state cannot create a third car program. There's either the federal program or the California program. And if a state wants to adopt the California program, they must adopt it in its entirety with no changes. Um, and uh, in particular, no changes that would, so to speak, create a third, uh, third type of vehicle that the manufacturers would have to, to purchase if it had a different warranty requirement or say or something like that. So that's one key point. Um, so whatever penalty provisions are in the California regulation would be the same as those <coughs> um, uh, those here, um, again, to the best of my knowledge, no penalties have ever been levied by a, by a, uh, no pun, a no pun intended, Lev State. Um, and, uh, uh, but the, the provisions would be against, as I understand it, they would be against the manufacturer for failure to deliver the vehicles that were required in a given model year to the state. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald. The chair now recognizes Representative Tim Lang, who is substituting today for Representative Nick White. Representative Lang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to let you know I've been on a call for a while. I am alone. I'm in my car. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes uh, Representative Bernardi for a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald. Uh, I'm gonna go back to uh, a question I asked one of the, the, the previous uh, speakers. Is there been an assessment of what the net additional electric supply would need to be if we adopted this program and moved to electric uh, fleet? And the second part of that question, given a need for additional production and that that production would likely be in the evening because that's when cars are being charged, not during the day, not when solar is operating, but at night. What, what does that mean for net change of emissions? Um, thank you. I, I will attempt to answer that question to the best of my ability. I think also that's a question perhaps for utilities. Um, the, we have not conducted any particular assessment I do believe there's an ongoing conversation in New England and other parts of the country in terms of electric supply. Um, ISO New England certainly recognizes the growth in electric vehicles. Um, as Mr. Kwasnick, I believe it was, uh, mentioned, um, and um, although he did not state so, I believe Mr. Kwasnick used to be um, a representative of a, a utility, used to work for a utility, um, one, of New, one of New Hampshire's utilities. Uh, as he stated, there is um, certainly there would be some in increased demand um, uh, for uh, electricity. There is also the opportunity for electric vehicles to store electricity and for that electricity to be drawn upon at, at certain points of time. Um, and I think that that, uh, um, uh, as I say, ISO New England and, uh, and the utilities are all studying those opportunities um, I, I believe there may be some reports or, that uh, have been done or studies that, uh, and, and if I can locate any of those, I will uh, forward them on to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Representative Callie Pitts is recognized for a question and don't forget to unmute. I'd forget my head if it wasn't attached. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. Yes. Do you know or can you tell me where New Hampshire stands right now as far as emissions go among the 50 states? Are we in the, you know, in the middle? Are we on the most emissions? Can you tell us where we stand? And I know that's apples and oranges because of populations, but where do we stand? Ab absolutely, it is, um, you know, it would be impossible for us. I, I think, I guess, um, I, I don't have the information with me right now, but we, I certainly could provide 
you know, where we stand on a per capita basis. Um, and to, and to, I assume you're talking about emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I could certainly try to um, follow up with some information on a, on a per capita basis that might allow for comparison. And one of the things, may I follow up? Yes, you may follow up. One of the things that I'm concerned about because I is what happens to the revenue we now derive from gasoline tax if the, a major switch is made, even in 2030. Has yeah. anybody thought of that or anybody worked that out? Yes, actually, the legislature has been looking that at that for a number of years. There have been a number of study commissions, um, uh, and actually, um, I believe Representative Major has uh, proposed legislation several times over the past few years, which I believe he may have introduced this year as well, um, that would uh, um, in, in, that is intended to sort of equalize the playing field to. Uh, um, collect some type of fee from electric vehicles. Um, we've always looked at this as um, an equity issue and we've wanted to make, make certain that, um, that any fee um, is, that is based, that is intended uh, for that purpose um, is based on actual mileage or emissions because um, as you well know, there, may, there are certain um, internal combustion engine vehicles that actually get better mileage than uh, certain types of electric vehicles. The, the vehicles vary widely, um, but we, we certainly um, uh, have always testified and encouraged that there be equitable representation and that the road toll, um, if that's New Hampshire's mechanism for continuing to uh, pay for infrastructure uh, for, our, for our roads and bridges and so on, um, that, that road toll is going to be affected and whether we do this or not. There's going to be um, growth in electric vehicles over the next several years as evidenced by the announcements that the major vehicle manufacturers that was referenced by Representative McWilliams. Um, and that growth is going to occur in New England, New, Ham New Hampshire, and all, and all across the country. Um, so this is an issue that is, is being looked at nationally and certainly um, uh, it hasn't had a major impact now because of the relatively low number of vehicles, but the, there certainly will be an impact to, to road toll that is based on gasoline consumption. That, that impact is occurring right now because mileage is going up on almost all vehicles. And um, so there certainly is, uh, is, is a trend and an impact on lower gasoline usage, whether it's electric vehicles or other uh, or, or just more efficient internal combustion vehicles. I hope that addresses your question. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, seeing that we have no further questions uh, for um, Mr. Fitzgerald, I'm going to close the public hearing on- Representative Bell, so I'm sorry to interrupt, um, but we did have Mr. John Gage who did sign up after the sheets were printed today. He did sign up to speak for two minutes and he is on the line. Okay, uh, I will call on Mr. Gage and I will hold him to two minutes and we will not be uh, entertaining any questions for Mr. Gage. Uh, so Mr. Gage, you are on for two minutes and I'm starting my uh, uh, stopwatch. So uh, be careful. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to offer my support for HB 168. Um, I disagree with the statement that sale, dealers are selling what the customers want from personal experience. I um, was looking to buy a car two years ago and the, I was looking for an electric vehicle, um, but dealership after dealership told me that they didn't have uh, the models that I'd been reading about online. And it was because of the, what, what this bill addresses. Um, the states all around us have, um, have rules that are getting uh, the, the newest, best electric vehicles on their lots and New Hampshire doesn't. And so um, I think we can change consumer behavior by doing two things, um, informing them, you know, dealerships could talk about 
the cost savings over the life time of the car, of an EV over an internal combustion engine, and by offering the best vehicles on the lots instead of customers having to know that, oh, if they call mass, if they call a dealership and ask, you know, to have a car brought up from another state, then they can test drive it. That's really not how most people buy cars. They, they go to a couple lots and they buy what's there that meets their, um, you know, requirements the best. Um, there's unmet demand for EVs. Um, my own case, I was looking for an EV and there were a couple that I just couldn't get in the state and I didn't feel like driving uh, to other states to, to test drive. Um, 30 I, seconds. I would say I'd propose that you change how we fund um, road uh, work, use um, miles driven and the weight of vehicles instead of a gas tax because gas cars are going away whether we help consumers get informed and, and choose them early or it happens naturally over time. Um, and I'd also like to invite any of the members of this committee to a meeting um, tomorrow morning or Wednesday afternoon, or Wednesday evening, I sent a mail um, to offer an explanation about why carbon is such a scientifically identified pollution. Um, I believe there's some members of the committee that may not grasp the, the full nature of why our whole- um, Okay, Mr. Gage, thank you. We appreciate your uh, testimony. And with that, we're going to close the uh, hearing on uh, House Bill 168, our report that 53 people signed in in support of the bill and 17 people signed in in opposition, um, including uh, Representative Jason Osborne, who signed in in opposition of the um, proposal, and Representative Josh Yokella. Um, Also, Representative Latha Menjaputi signed in in favor of it, and uh, Representative Raymond Howard signed in opposed to the bill. Are there more? Oh, we have more. So, uh, Representative Don, Johns, um, Don Johnson signed in to oppose the bill, Representative Bob Green, Representative Jonathan Smith, Representative Erica Leon, Leon and uh, Representative Elaine Thomas signed in in support of the bill. So that's the, uh, the blue sheet for House Bill 168. And with that, that hearing, public hearing is closed. And now we will uh, resume or take out of recess the public hearing on House Bill 289 which is a bill relative to including electrical storage facilities and the definition of energy facility. Representative Michael Harrington is the prime sponsor of that bill. Representative Harrington, <clears throat> like many of us, uh, had a regularly scheduled dentist appointment today and has not returned from that yet. So he asked me to introduce the bill. <clears throat> which I will do at this time. This bill is basically, did someone speak? Point of, let's see if I'm, I'm, point of order, this is Representative Fred Plett, is, uh, is Representative Murner taking over the clerk role? I'm, I'm ready, I'm gonna take over. Yes, Representative Murner will take over uh, the clerk role from this point forward. Thank and you. thank you to Representative Plett for doing it for the previous bill. Okay, so to introduce uh, House Bill 289, this is a uh, bill that basically is a housekeeping bill that adds an electrical storage facility to the definition of uh, energy facilities. It adds this electrical storage facility with a peak storage capacity of 30 megawatts hours or greater uh, to the existing statutory definition of uh, energy facility. Uh, it's been supported by everyone who signed up um, on the blue sheet. 
no one signed up to speak for or against it. Um, and since Representative Harrington is not here, I don't know if I'll be able to answer any questions, but I'll give it a shot. Representative Oxenham is recognized for a question. Uh, thank you very much. The definition is in terms of megawatt hours, whereas other facilities in the, um, the uh, statute are in megawatts. One is capacity, uh, one is usage. And I wonder if we, we had problems with this bill when it was brought up previously. And I wonder if this was not caught by OLS. Um, I, I think we have a problem here. If it's 30 megawatt hours in terms of megawatts, it's a quarter of that capacity. Other facilities in this same statute are 30 megawatts. I believe this should be 30 megawatts not 30 megawatt hours. What, what, what you're establishing here would be a limit of 7.5 megawatts. That's a good point. And uh, I wish Representative Harrington was here to address it, but since he is not, uh, we'll have to hold that question for later. Thank Representative you. Pimentel is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I went online looking to see if I could bring up a picture of a 30 megawatt hour um, uh, storage facility. Um, and to, to Lee's point, uh, to uh, Representative Ox Oxenham's point, they were usually rated in megawatts. But still, I wasn't able to see anything on size. And I guess my question is, because this kind of legislation makes sense but I, I don't know how big of a facility we are. I mean, if it's something as big as uh, my car, for instance, or even uh, a semi truck, I'm not, I, I question whether or not we need it, but if this is a big facility, uh, it makes sense. So size is important if I could get that kind of an idea. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I just recalled that the RSA that's being modified here is RSA 162H, which is the uh, statute that governs the site evaluation committee. So what this um, bill is actually modifying is the definition of a facility that would require site evaluation committee uh, right. jurisdiction. Uh, if you read the, the section H that follows section G, it talks about how a facility like this uh, can be taken on by the site evaluation committee. So I think that is a, a clear, uh, an important distinction about this bill. Uh, it, it, it specifically apl applies to the site evaluation committee. Uh, Representative uh, Tim and tell, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, yeah I, I, I understand what the bill is about. And, and my follow-up is whether or not it should be uh, in a, go to a site evaluation committee if it's really not, you know, that onerous of, of a, I don't know how big it is. You know, what are we talking about for size? I, I, I can understand a site evaluation committee for a, 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 a wind turbine, which takes up a lot of area. And I guess, so that's really the question. And I think knowing the size will give me an idea of how I wanna vote on this. Okay, so, without so the knowing issue here, so the issue here is if a, if, a, if a facility is 30 megawatts or greater, it automatically goes to the site evaluation committee. If it's 30 megawatts or less or under 30 megawatts, it can go to the site evaluation committee only by petition uh, of the, I think it's the persons who are uh, in charge of determining whether the facility should be allowed to be built or not, uh, like a planning board or a zoning board. So, 
some towns don't feel they have the expertise to deal with facilities like a uh, like an inter electrical energy storage facility uh, facilities. Um, so they want the site evaluation committee to take that over. And this legislation will permit the site evaluation committee to do that for electrical storage facilities uh, of 30 megawatt hours or uh, greater. So that's the essence of the, now I'm remembering uh, my discussion with uh, Michael Harrington about this. So that's the essence of the, um, of the situation. Uh, Representative Platt is recognized for a question. Um, I was just, let's see if I'm unmuted. I am. Um, I just wanted to, with respect to uh, represent, Representative uh, Kelly Pitt's concern, I think it was Kelly Pitt's about the megawatt hours versus megawatts. You can discharge this in one hour, then it's 30 megawatts. Okay, uh, thank you. Representative Somsich, you're recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I actually uh, had- Actually, before you ask your question, uh, I apologize for interrupting. I have to leave. Um, so I'm not sure who you can direct your question to. I have to step out of the room for a half hour or so. I have another meeting that I have to conduct. I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Representative Thomas and um, I won't be here to answer questions, but maybe somebody else on the committee can. So Representative Thomas, take over, please. Okay, uh, not being familiar uh, with talking with Representative Harrington on this bill, I have no further knowledge on any other questions, but you can ask your questions. And if anybody here in the room can answer, that'd be fine. Uh, so let's proceed. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, I'm following up on what uh, Representative Platt just mentioned. So I think we got to be clear about this. 30 megawatts is used to identify a energy generator. 30 megawatt hours is an energy storage device, meaning like he said, if you didn't discharge 30 megawatts of energy within an hour, that battery had 30 megawatt hours of storage. So they have to include hours. We can't just say 30 megawatts, that's generation capacity, that's not a storage battery. So I think that is a difference. And I think last year we had a bill that just said 30 megawatt hours with that, 30 megawatts without the hours, and that is not a battery. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the bill says hours. Could, could I answer that? Thank you. What I see here now is I see, um, I'm not quite sure who was next, but I see uh, Representative Kelly Pitt's hands raised for a question. Is there anybody in the room uh, from a utility? Because the storage facilities get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm, I, I'm not sure what Representative Harrington had in mind or of the size. This isn't a home storage facility. It, we're talking about large, large facilities that would come under, I believe, SEC control or SNC, SEC permitting. So I'm not sure. And I, I just wondered everybody's questions. Could we postpone that until we actually find out what Representative Harrington was intending? Uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, I will note, I, I see that uh, Donna Gamash from Eversource is on a participant line. If she would care to comment at all on this, uh, uh, Ms. Gamash, would you care to comment at all or uh, refrain? Can you hear me? This is Donna. Yes. 
Um, uh, I, we don't really have a position on this bill, but um, we were taking a look at it, you know, our lawyers and they, they saw that, you know, this clearly is for larger storage and all we could figure was that potentially um, a community was asking that somebody else, you know, take over the review. Um, we, we aren't, we aren't, we're still trying to get um, smaller versions through the Public Utilities Commission. So it's not anything that, um, you know, we would have a concern with. And even if um, the SEC took jurisdiction over that, it would just be one other um, layer of approvals, which we typically are used to. So um, I, we're, I think that to everybody's point before us, that the sole purpose of this is to make sure that if a community doesn't know how to act on it, they want the SEC to do so, but we don't have an actual position on that. We'd have to leave that to the communities and to you. So I don't. I, I know that was rather vague. I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Ms. Gosh. Representative Thomas, I apologize for interrupting. I just wanted to let you know that Mr. James Monahan is on the line and he did request to testify. I'm not sure if he can speak to this point necessarily, but his hand is raised if you'd like to recognize him. I would like to follow up. Yeah, yes, I'll give a follow up to Representative uh, Kelly Pitts. I did see Mr. Monahan's hands raised and I had the same question you did, but uh, I'll go to Representative Kelly Pitts first. Go ahead. Donna, do you have any idea what the size of a seven megawatt hour facility would be? Or what a 30 megawatt hour would be? I would need somebody to do the math for me. So I'm sorry, probably Representative Plett would be spot on because he's done this so much. I'm not the expert there, I'm sorry. I mean, I could have been if I had thought about, if I, if I knew I was going to get the question, I would have been the expert. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> what you get for showing up. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Mr. Chair, I actually have some specifications here for energy. Representative, uh, you have me recognized chef to, to speak. Um, if you have I'm a- I was asking, Mr. Chair, I'm asking to go out of turn because I actually have some specifications that would be useful. Uh, be brief, like a few seconds, please. Sure. Um, for transmission uh, purposes, energy storage is often in the 10 megawatt range. For distribution, energy storage is often in the two megawatt range. It's generally these batteries discharge for a period of four hours. So the difference between your megawatt and your megawatt hours is a factor of four. Batteries are usually listed with both. They specify the megawatts and the megawatt hours. Um, I, I think that's probably sufficient for our purposes. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to Mr. Monahan now because he has been waiting for a while. Uh, Mr. Monahan, uh, if you, uh, you're you on to, to, uh, to testify. Great, um, thank you. Um, so I, I, um, I think both Representative Somschitz and Oxenham have addressed the issue of whether or not it should be megawatts or megawatt hours based upon the discharge. Uh, and let me just start off by saying, I'm Jim Monaghan, I'm actually here today supporting the bill on behalf of the New England Power Generators Association, uh, Granite Shore Power and Revision Energy. Um, in answer to the question with regard to the size, um, I do believe a 30 megawatt hour facility would be sizable, it wouldn't be in your garage, for example. I think you could probably look at it like it's um, a, a, a substation uh, that you might be familiar with on the side of the road or back of a parking lot. Um, and obviously the bigger they get, um, the larger the substation comparison would be. Um, part of the reason for our support of the bill is twofold. First, as the committee has addressed, uh, uh, some communities may be in a position where they would prefer to have the site evaluation committee take over what is essentially a bulk energy facility. Uh, and the other piece of it is, um, while we haven't seen any utility scale stor storage come to New Hampshire yet, uh, we anticipate that it will and believe that the option for developers to use the site evaluation process is uh, predictable. Um, and something that would be built into the soft cost of developing a project like this. Um, so we just start looking about um, how we wanna make sure that the capital flows to New Hampshire for these projects, uh, that predictability and the control of the soft costs is, uh, is important. 
Um, it just seems logical to us as well when the site evaluation um, statute was and, and updated. Uh, the concept of utility scale storage was really not something that was part of the industry. Uh, it is now, and we think it's uh, reasonable to uh, amend the site of evaluation uh, statute. But I can answer, on a, I'll do my best to answer, answer any other questions you all might have. Thank you, Mr. Moynihan. I see a representative man had his hand raised for a while. Uh, representative man, do you have a question? Uh, well, I was just going to ask whether um, whether we need to go much further. It does seem like it's a, so, you know, it could possibly be a dangerous object if it can discharge, um, uh, <laughs> what do I call it, um, you know, a million or so watts in a short period of time, somebody running a car into it or something like that by accident. And so I, and it's, I don't think it's a huge, huge battery. It starts small when we can always change the specification. If, if this is, uh, this battery is smaller than we really, really need to worry about. Um, so why don't we just go ahead with it and let it go? Um, the only, um, you know, the only reason not to uh, pass the bill was it would be that um, uh, that it may be much smaller batteries would also be dangerous, but I don't believe that's the case. I'm thinking of uh, 60 watts for 500 hours is equivalent to that. So it's a 60 watt bulb for 500 hours. You know. Eh. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you, uh, Representative Mann. I see a uh, a rather shaded pale yellow hand for Representative McGee. Does that mean your question is uh, uh, not as strong as the others or how come yours is faded and the others haven't been? The but whatever it is, you're next, to, you're next to have a question that, anyway. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, and thank you for the question about the color of my hand. Um, you can actually pick different colors and my daughter made fun of me because my hand was, was bright orange or some other color. And so I, I picked a different color. Um, so that's that. Uh, I do have a question for Mr. Monahan because I think he might be able to answer it. When we were going through reviews of the bill, I know a question came up that I jotted down in pencil because I often make notes on the bills because I can't remember everything. And the question was, how would uh, this added uh, storage component uh, in the uh, definitions of facilities how would it affect uh, power purchase agreements, if at all? Is there anything we should understand about how a power purchase agreement might be involved or affected by our um, adding the storage facilities here? Yeah, I don't think that that uh, would be applicable uh, to any amendments to the site evaluation uh, statute. When you get into the issue of uh, PPAs for power discharge and whether or not you're going to be based that. and if it's a wholesale or retail um, activity that discharging that really falls into any sort of amendment to the restructuring act which i think is 374f so i don't think i think this change here uh would be in would be indifferent to the types of questions you're asking okay thank you okay thank you uh Representative Callie Pitts, do you have an urgent question? We need it's to sir, close it, this. It, yeah, what about forward capacity payments? Go ahead. Yeah, again, I think it's indifferent to that. Uh, other provisions of state and federal war would uh, detail whether or not the discharge of a large battery into the wholesale market would qualify for a forward capacity payment. Uh, it's a great question. I'll try to find out the answer for that. This is a good week to ask because the uh, the auction is taking place over uh, today and next couple of days, but I. Thank you. It's currently being discussed at the PUC. I know. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll close this uh, public hearing. I will report that we had pe seven people sign in supporting the bill, zero people signed in to oppose it. Two of those people were were um, elected officials, including Elaine Thomas, Representative Elaine Thomas, and Representative Latha Manjaputi. So with that, HB 289 is closed, and Point we will order, be Mr. on. Chair. Uh, could, could, uh, yes, Representative Oxenham, you're recognized for a question. Could we make sure that the issue was brought to the attention of the sponsor, that he might want to amend this to make it megawatts 
and specify megawatt hours, the typical battery formulation? Absolutely. We will have that discussion with Representative Harrington. Thank and you. with that, we will recess uh, until one o'clock. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.
uh, our public hearings. It's one o'clock and at one o'clock we have a public hearing scheduled on HB 308. So I will call that public hearing to order. This uh, bill is about is relative to broadband access to poll attachments and the prime sponsor of this bill is Representative Marsh, Representative Bill Marsh from Brookfield. Representative Marsh is uh, present and Representative Marsh, I will uh, now give you, boy, I, I wish this thing would, ah, he's, he's already been given permission. Okay, Representative Marsh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Science Committee. It's a pleasure coming before you today. Uh, I will be very brief. For the record, I'm Representative William Marsh, Carroll County 8, representing seven towns in Southern Carroll County. I am pleased today to offer for your consideration House Bill 308 relative to broadband access to poll attachments, which I found at the request of the selectmen of the town of Brookfield. The issue in Brookfield is most of the polls are old enough that they need to be replaced to allow poll attachments. The, this, the existing polls are not tall enough per standards adopted in the 1990s. The electric company has been pushing for the cable people to pay the full cost of replacing the polls before allowing cable to be attached. The Brookfield selectmen feel this is unreasonable. Apparently, this is the case in other towns as well. I contacted Krista Schutt, the consumer advocate of the PUC. She said that the electric company receives money in their rates to pay for the periodic replacement of poles. She gave me the language here. The suggestion is to value the existing poles at their depreciated cost so that the cable people pay that amount and the pole owner pays the remainder, which they should have already seen offset in electric rates over the years. The selectmen of Brookfield tell me that if the replacement cost for the poles in Brookfield is the depreciated value, which is of course less than the full replacement cost, then the cable company Spectrum says they will run broadband in Brookfield as the density is sufficient for them to recover their costs. I thank you and I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you, Representative Marsh. Uh, Representative Thomas is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative, for taking my question. Um, just to be clear, does the, when you, when you refer to the replacement cost of the poles, do you also mean the replacement cost of the poles plus the costs associated with transferring the, um, the other equipment from the old pole to the new pole as well? Uh, I believe that to be the case, but Christina Schutt, I believe, has also signed up to testify and is far better qualified than I to answer that question. Thank you. Okay, uh, okay Representative Platt is recognized for a question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for taking my question, Representative Marsh. I'm gonna use uh, an example, numbers. Let's say a new poll costs a thousand bucks and uh, it's written off over 30 years. Uh, so uh, in year 30, it's zero. Let's say year 29, there's uh, a small amount of money left. Are you saying that the, the uh, cable company will only pay a portion of that small amount of money left after 29 years and the utility has to put in the brand new poll at a thousand dollars and therefore that thousand, that thousand minus the small contribution winds up on rate payers rates uh, as, as an undepreciated poll? Uh, Representative, it's a pleasure seeing you again. I'm glad that you're well and before us today. Uh, my, understa my understanding is that the electric company has already received in its electric rates over the years, the majority of the cost of a poll that old and therefore uh, for them to be paying uh, the cost of a poll that would then presumably last for the foreseeable lifetime of that telephone poll and for which they would continue to receive a reimbursement in their electrical rates is entirely reasonable. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Representative Marsh? Uh, Representative McGee, you're recognized for a question. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative Marsh. My question is, what necessitates a replacement condition? So I guess what I'm trying to get at is, what is the scale of the operation if we do implement a bill that says we're going to start uh, allowing, supporting, or uh, enforcing replacement of poles? Which, which poles get replaced? It's obviously not just Brookfield. Well, clearly there's no reason to replace uh, the poles uh, for taller poles to allow pole attachments unless somebody is wanting to attach something to those poles. So I believe this is something that the cable company and electric company would work out amongst themselves. As they knew now, this, the, just the issue now is that there's a question how to divide the costs. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Oxenham is recognized for a question. Yes. Um, has the select board determined that working with the cable companies is the ideal solution? It seems that around the state, uh, fiber optic is being seen as a superior solution to providing universal access to um, broadband. Uh, that is my understanding, but it's also my understanding that a member of the board of selectmen will be here to testify before you, so you would be better to ask them that directly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Pimentel for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative Marsh. Um, from what I under, am, do I have this correct that there are some normally a broadband would just attach poles, their wires to an existing pole, but there's some reason why they float poles are somehow inadequate? Uh, yes, you are correct about that. What happened was back in the 90s, they raised the height requirements for poles to allow a sufficient margin for safety to allow for more attachments, uh, such as cable and, and uh, telephones and various other things that attach to, to, to poles. The existing poles in our town, it is my understanding, are grandfathered. They don't need to be replaced now unless somebody chooses to attach something to them, which is what the town wants because they want broadband for some rather important reasons. <laughs> Follow up. Follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just what is what is the lifespan of a uh, pole? Do you know? Uh, uh, are you asking me that question? My, yes, understand, my understanding from Krista Schutt is that the lifespan may approximate 40 years, but she again is, I believe, signed up to testify and can better answer that question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Schutt is indeed uh, signed up to testify and will testify shortly. Uh, Representative Parshall, you, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Good morning or good afternoon, uh, Representative Marsh. The full depreciation is taken already on some of these poles. Won't the cable provider have to take up the pretty much the full amount of replacing that pole? Uh, my understanding is once a pole is fully depreciated, it no longer would carry value in the books of the electric company having been fully paid for, and therefore a replacement pole would become the responsibility of the electric company. Of, of, of the electric company. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for Representative Marsh? Seeing none, I will uh, call on the next person to testify. If I can get my sheet back. <laughs> uh, the next person to testify is Richard Zocker an elected official in the town of Brookfield. So Mr. Zocker. Um, apparently he is not online yet. Is that correct? No, I, I, I see him. Oh, there he is. Okay, Mr. Zocker, you're recognized to speak. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. I'm Rich Sacker, a selectman from the town of Brookfield. Brookfield is a small town of 700 residents in Southern Carroll County. The town has about 300 homes, 
a hundred of which do not have internet service. We've been working very hard to bring service into this area, and we finally received an estimate from our internet provider to service the homes which do not currently have the internet. Most of these homes are within a four mile stretch of roads. That comes to about 25 homes per mile, which is more than adequate for them to make some money. It would seem to me that when we received the estimate to provide service to these homes, it was $700,000 or about $7,000 per home. We saw that the CARES Act funding was provided to suppliers who could deploy internet coverage at less than $3,000 per home. We couldn't understand why it was so much more for the town of Brookfield. The vendor told us the poles were not sufficient to handle additional service attachments and had to be replaced at an estimated cost of $5,000 each. Many of the poles in this town are well over 50 years old and in my opinion, are fully depreciated. The PUC guidance received from the state legislature is that the requester pays the full replacement cost. Therefore, we feel it's unlikely that Brookfield and many other small rural communities will ever get high-speed internet fully deployed. We discussed this dilemma with Representative Dr. Marsh, and he offered to submit this legislation to address the issue. With that as background, I urge you to support the bill and change the way the requesters have to pay for making utility poles ready for high-speed internet. And there was a question earlier about fiber. And yes, we reached out to Consolidated Communications and they gave us a quote of $1.2 million and we had to fund it completely. Okay, does that conclude your testimony then? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Zocker? Anybody in the room have any questions? Uh, Representative, oh, okay. I guess we don't have any questions. Representative Plett, do you have a question? Don't forget to unmute. Just earlier testimony, I've had spent uh, many years at Public Service New Hampshire. Uh, for, uh, transmission poles are over 40 year life. Distribution poles are more like 30. That's all. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no additional questions for Mr. Zocker, uh, we will move on to our next presenter who will be uh, Krista Schutt, who works for the Office of the Consumer Advocate. And She's uh, representing herself, I guess, not the Consumer Advocates Office. Um, anyway, Ms. Shute, you are uh, on to testify. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chairman Bose and committee members. Um, we did submit the testimony on behalf of the Office of the Consumer Advocate um, to support the bill. Um, fundamentally, um, because uh, we see broadband as a necessity um, for economic health, education, safety, and social needs. Um, and as a representative of residential rate payers, um, we think it's also important to weigh in from that perspective in that there is a um, socialization of utility pole replacements um, that happens throughout the industry. Um, and there are a number of reasons that, that polls get uh, replaced. Um, and there are areas where polls don't get replaced. And in those circumstances where the polls have been fully depreciated because they're um, many years old, um, it is uh, reasonable uh, for those poll replacements uh, to be um, paid for um, by the utility and, and therefore that um, winds up also being paid for by the ratepayers. Um, the way that the commission uh, rules work is essentially that the attaching entity is required to pay all of the make ready costs. The proposal before you is to allocate 
the cost to the attaching entity for any of the remaining life of the pole. The pole life, um, you know, depreciation inside of a utility is a is not a it's a complicated issue. So it's, you know, every pole in and of itself by itself has a different pole life, but there is an average um, pole life that is considered and it's and it's part of a depreciation study. So if a depreciation study indicates that the pole life for a utility is 40 years or 30 years um, to uh, one of your committee members points, I think Rep Representative Plett, um, then uh, that effectively becomes the, the life of that pole and uh, can be used as a way to create a, a rule that is, you know, relatively, um, should be relatively simple to, to, to implement. Um, so uh, with that, I would, I, I welcome your questions and I, I think that we already have a three lined up. So um, if you don't mind, I would just ask, um, I'll address one of them. Uh, the question, one of the questions was whether or not the cost of moving um, everything uh, from one pole to the other would also uh, be included. And I agree with Representative Marsh that that would be appropriate if the pole had been replaced after its um, generally accepted uh, useful life then the utility would have um, moved the <clears throat> lines from the old pole to the new pole. Um, so it seems that sharing a proportional amount of that cost uh, would also be reasonable. Um, and I will leave it to questions uh, because I, I'm not sure that I actually have the other one written down. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes Representative Thomas for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Shu, for taking my question. Um, uh, my understanding is that uh, not all of the utility poles are owned by the same entity. For instance, uh, some could be owned by an electric company, some could be owned by perhaps a telephone company. Um, and I'm not sure if some could be owned by a cable company. That I'm not really sure. But my, my question is this, um, if, we, if we were to assume that you had the same customer was taking broadband cable and they're paying their electric bill and perhaps even have a phone bill, um, that the costs that were now being you know, shifted from one to the other, really uh, that customer is going to pay the increased rates in a smaller proportion spread out amongst those three companies, because if they're paying for cable, they'll pay for some of that. If they're paying for electric bill, they'll be paying for some of that. And for people that may not be buying cable, they, they, they won't share in that cost. So either way, the cost is not being decreased. It's just being spread around, you know, sp spread around the various uh, individual bills that customers may pay if they're buying all of those services. Is that, is, is that a correct understanding? I think that if you look at it, um, statewide, that is correct. Um, the, the issue in the most rural parts of the state is that the, when the costs are so prohibitively high to um, gain access to the pole, generally because the old poles are very short and therefore there's no um, room available uh, for the new fiber line or the new cable line to be attached because generally what would, what would happen is there might be some shifting of the lines so that there could be um, space made available. Um, so I, I guess as a general um, matter, the answer to your question is, is yes. Um, as, a, as a practical matter without doing something like this, um, many of the folks in towns like that uh, don't have access uh, to broadband because there's no uh, economically viable way for such a few number of 
residents to um, pay the high cost of replacing the poles that would facilitate the height that is needed to put in the required uh, cables. Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Pimentel for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Shute, uh, hopefully this is something you can answer. Um, the, the, the fee that basically goes on our electric bill, which essentially pays for the upkeep of the poles and that sort of thing, does that get reduced after the uh, poll is totally amortized or do we still continue to pay that fee? It's a complicated question. Um, that's sort of part of the a, a depreciation study is generally done as part of a rate case. Um, and that uh, depreciation study um, is part of what identifies <clears throat> the revenue requirement um, and the revenue requirement for the utility is what helps establish uh, the rates. Um, I don't really have a clearer answer than that, um, but I believe that there is a utility representative available um, that may be able to give you a clearer or better answer. Okay, I'll save my question for them then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Seeing no further questions from uh, committee members, I'll call on our next presenter, who is Mark Dean, representing the New Hampshire Electric Co-op. So Mr. Dean, you're on. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. I have submitted written testimony, so I'll try to just make a few quick points here. Uh, so the, so the co-op sees this from two perspectives. The co-op owns a lot of poles and the co-op has to attach to other poles that are owned by third parties. And the rule not only in New Hampshire, but uh, for all the, the states that are regulated by the FCC for pole attachments is I think as it has been described, which is if there's a reason, say the, the pole is old and it uh, pat fails that a stress test that it's taken and the, the utility, the pole owner has to replace it, then the pole owner replaces that and they'll have to replace it at a higher height, make more room. If there's no other reason to replace it, uh, except for a new attacher coming and said, we'd like to add an attachment. And that the only way to do that is to have a taller pole than the FCC rule and the state of New Hampshire rule is then the attacher, the cost causer pays for that pole replacement. And uh, so as I say, the co-op sees it from both sides because sometimes it's gonna be paying because it's a pole owner and sometimes it's gonna be paying because it's a pole attacher. We think the, co the cost causation uh, rule works and is fair. I think a couple of quick points, a lot of you um, have been through the uh, property tax for utility legislation that took a few years to get through. And I think if those who heard the testimony might remember, there really is no such thing as a fully depreciated poll. Uh, the poll owners are paying property taxes on those polls. If, uh, some of them are 60 years old. And still, if, they, if they're structurally sound, we keep them in place because the idea is to provide the service uh, that is safe and reliable and cost effective. And uh, if you don't need to replace it, you don't replace it. Um, so just a, a reminder in that sense. So from the, the co-op's perspective, the cost causation approach, which is what the FCC still has, what the rules uh, here have, uh, we think is a reasonable approach. And we think a better approach is to look at uh, Senate Bill 88, uh, part two of that, which is that's another bill that Senator Bradley is on. That's the one touch make ready bill. And that's a bill that actually produces savings in costs so that the actual process of doing poll attachments 
uh, is more cost effective instead of just allocating costs differently among different parties. Uh, so while we're, the co-op itself is working hard to expand broadband in the state of New Hampshire, uh, that's the type of effort that we would endorse as opposed to just shifting some of those costs to uh, whether it's the electric company or whoever else owns the poll. And that's what I have for uh, oral testimony. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dean. I have a question for you. You mentioned the fact that towns tax polls. If a poll gets replaced, does the tax on that poll typically go up? It's a little more complicated because of the changes in the the statute used to be every town basically taxed a poll at whatever value they ass assigned to it. Now it's an average. Um, but if you replace polls more frequently, the average age of your poll is now younger. It's less depreciated because they do depreciate. So property, the overall property tax value that the utility is paying would go up. I think is the, the long and the short. So as a follow-up question, if this bill were to pass, would that be an incentive for towns to try to get polls replaced so they could collect more tax money on them? I can't say whether it, it would or wouldn't. Under the, under the reformed or revised utility property tax, you know, there would be some difference. I don't know that it would be the kind of thing that would be a motivating factor. Can't say. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Callie Pitts is recognized for a question. Don't forget to unmute. Yep. Uh, question is on the, uh, who pays for the poll attachment itself? Not for, for a new poll, but for moving wires perhaps and rearranging things if an attachment has to be made. So again, the general rule is that if, let's say in this case, you didn't even need to replace the pole, but the attachments had to be rearranged to create the proper spacing, then it would be the entity, if there was no other reason to do that, then it was whoever the last entity was that came and said, we'd like to add an additional attachment. Again, if that's the sole reason you're undertaking the activity, then that entity pays those costs. May I follow up? Follow up. We had uh, a discussion about multiple polls in one area. So if a company decides, I don't need to add you know, take down my old poll, could they add a second poll and could that create a problem? It's very hard for me to envision the situation you're describing. I guess if you're saying adding, I mean, usually what we try to avoid at all costs in this state, right, is two poles six inches from each other and creating a, a wall of poles. So as a general principle, what you want to do is you're only going to have, you minimize the number of poles you require. So it's hard for me to picture um, that it would be allowed to essentially just insert a number of poles in between the existing poles. And that would probably be no more cost effective than the current system. If I've Thank understood you. correctly. Well, it, apparently in this this particular air in, in this particular double pole, we have had a problem with double poles in certain areas. So that's just one of the things I was thinking about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Pimentel is recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Essentially the same question I asked Ms. Shute. Um, do the electric companies base the, the, the fee or that they charge their customers based on the, um, the, the amortized lifespan of the polls or the actual 
costs that the electric companies are, are having to replace poles, some of them being 50 years old, as an example. Okay. So um, I'll be a good witness in one way and, and a bad in, in another way here. And the, so the co-op isn't rate regulated by the PUC. So there will be some subtle differences, but I, I hopefully this answers the question correctly. Um, so for example, the, the co-op when it's setting its rates, it has to look at what its ongoing costs are. And that includes depreciation and maintenance and the taxes, all, all of those things. Anything that increases that number is going to have an upward pressure, all other things being equal on rates. So if you think about um, if, if we were putting in, if we were turning over poles, replacing poles every five years instead of every 35 years, uh, you know, in that extreme example, you would really see a very big cost difference because you're constantly putting in new poles. It's not the most economically efficient way to do it. It's like holding on to a car that you've paid the, you know, made the payments on uh, or getting a new car every two years. I think you know which one's more expensive. So uh, I think accelerating pole replacements would have an upward pressure on rates, generally speaking. And for a regulated utility, I assume that would mean because of the depreciation, they would have a greater, a higher rate base. That's what their revenue requirements are based upon. Uh, follow up question. Follow up. Uh, just because I, I'm having a difficulty grasping this. So uh, even if a poll has already reached its, uh, its, uh, estimated lifespan, say it's 30 years, um, if, if it is replaced at that time, as opposed to replaced 10 years later, it will make a difference in what you're going to charge your customers? I, I guess I'm not yeah. talking about poll. Let's say you had to replace all your poles at 30 years, even though they're totally amortized, or 40 years, that would make a difference? It would. It, it would. If, you, you're, if you're, I call it turning over. If you're turning over the stock of your poles, then you're going to start the, if you're in a rate making situation, you're going to have higher rate base because you're going to, there won't be fully depreciated. And again, they're never actually fully depreciated. Uh, and uh, so that is going to be, there'll be an increase in overall costs, and that will cause an increase in, in rates. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Dean? Seeing none, I'll thank Mr. Dean for his testimony and move on to our next presenter. Thank you. Who is Chris Hodgden, representing Comcast. Mr. Hodgden, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. May I continue? You may. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, Chairman Vose, members of the committee. My name is Chris Hodgden. I'm Comcast Vice President of Government Affairs here in New Hampshire, and we serve approximately 350,000 broadband customers uh, throughout the 107 communities uh, that we serve here in the state. And while we have concerns with the way the legislation is written, I, I wanna both recognize and applaud the sponsor's uh, interest and just recognize that, that we do support uh, policies which reduce the barriers to broadband deployment. And we further agree that this issue of pole replacement in rural areas is a, a worthy issue and one that uh, needs to be addressed. Um, we, we've long advocated for both here at the legislature and at the PUC policies that do reduce the cost and, and other barriers to deployment. And most recently, our trade association at the FCC advocated for 
um, policies that uh, very are very similar to the intent of this legislation, which is that in areas where there are not broadband, uh, it's unjust and unreasonable for pole owners to shift all pole replacement costs onto new attachers, uh, which would be, uh, as other uh, parties have said, the cable companies, companies like Comcast. Utility poles truly are indispensable to the deployment of broadband. They're choke points through which all communication infrastructure and all communication services must travel at one point or another. And uh, as has previously been noted, these assets are owned either jointly or solely by electric utilities and telephone utilities who are uh, either rate regulated or in many cases are competitors to the companies who wish to access the polls. So as a result of that, the, uh, these assets are, are heavily regulated uh, both at the FCC and in states like New Hampshire who have certified that they will uh, regulate them at the state level. And that regulated um, interest extends to both the rates that are paid, the terms and the conditions of access to those polls. And because of their regulated nature, policy changes really implicate a, a complex range of issues from safety and reliability to the rates customers pay and uh, attachers pay through rent, uh, use of the right of way, and, and also the efficiency and economics of broadband deployment. So it's, it really is truly a, a complex issue with a lot of interwoven interests and uh, impacts on how we all um, run our networks and deploy our services in the state. And, and our concerns with the bill, although the bill is brief, I really come down to, to two things. One is that we're, we're worried that the bill is overly broad and vague in some of the terminology that it uses. Uh, the use of terms like areas, uh, make ready, which is not otherwise used in the Hampshire statute. The use of a 100 by 100 megabit standard uh, all um, create, we, we believe, some ambiguity and vagueness in the statute, which uh, we fear will lead to unintended consequences. Uh, in particular, uh, as has been described by a couple of the folks who testified, there are two types of poll replacements that typically occur when a broadband provider needs to access polls. The first being a situation when the poll is not adequate to accommodate the additional attachment. It needs to be taller, as Mr. Dean said. And in that instance, the cost is borne by the company who wants to access the polls. Currently in New Hampshire, the second type of poll replacement, which occurs when the poll is out of compliance, either for safety purposes, reliability, or damage to the poll, that cost is borne by the poll owner and not by the company wishing to access the polls. And our concern is that in the language of the bill is written because the term make ready is used to encompass all poll replacements that last type of poll replacement which is currently not uh, it, whose costs are not currently borne by a new attacher will now through a pro rata formula uh, be borne in part by a broadband provider uh, we think that that'll have the unintended consequence of increasing the cost of this type of poll replacement for a broadband provider who currently doesn't pay for that cost now, it might actually uh, create additional disincentives for rural broadband deployment and not achieve the goals of the bill sponsor, which is to make it less expensive and, and accelerate that deployment. So, so our hope is that if the committee chooses to have a subcommittee or engage in a, a process to bring the stakeholders together, that we have an opportunity to participate in that. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, uh, Representative Thomas is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you for taking my question, Mr. Hutchinson. Um, first, I wanna clarify something I just heard you say. D uh, did I hear you say correctly that the current costs of um, moving other equipment and wires from the old pole to the new pole 
was currently not being borne by the uh, cable providers when they want to put in new broadband? W was that what you were saying? Uh, no, uh, Representative. What I was saying is that in an instance where the pole is in need of replacement for safety purposes, it's out of compliance with uh, applicable standards, the pole it, replacement is borne by the pole owner. Um, when uh, a, a pole attacher needs to move its equipment to accommodate another provider, uh, whether when um, the pole is, needs to be replaced um, because it's lacking in sufficient height, uh, those costs aren't treated the, the same way. Follow up. Follow up. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so my question then is, is it your experience that, is it, is it the cost of the pole replacement issue that is the primary and sometimes the sole reason why broadband is not being put into the rural area or are there other reasons why you, you do not put broadband into any rural areas besides the cost of pole replacement? Uh, thank you, Representative. So the uh, economic considerations when deploying broadband are complex. There's no single reason uh, that uh, a project may or may not be feasible. Um, it is certainly true, and as the sponsor noted, um, and what this legislation seeks to address is that pole replacement costs are a part of that equation and they can be substantial. Okay, thank, thank you. you. The chair now recognizes Representative Lang for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's actually a question to the chair. Uh, do you see talking at all? Uh, Sorry, I think I lost. Mr. Chair, are, are we going to have anybody from PUC speaking at all? Nobody from the PUC is here, I don't believe. Right, then I'll ask this gentleman my question. So my question is, who defines the rules about the wire placement on a given pole? Um, is that from so, Mr. Hodgson? Yeah, thank you. Yes. So um, how attachers uh, either attach to or maintain their attachment to the pole is, is found in the 1300 rules of the PUC. Uh, those rules um, rely heavily on the National Electric Code uh, for issues of safety. And uh, as an industry, we look to those standards when we um, either are attaching or maintaining our attachments to the poles. As a, a matter of tradition, uh, the lowest attacher on the pole is the telephone utility. Uh, and then as you move up the pole, you find uh, other broadband, other communications Fire. providers, broadband providers, uh, and then uh, municipal attachments, fire alarm, those sorts of uh, attachments. And then at the very, typically at the very top, uh, in what is known as the electric space, electric utilities. Follow up, okay. Mr. Chair? Yes, follow up, please. So my, my follow-up question is, do you know if there's any talk at PUC about creating some sort of waiver process to, as long as they can show that whatever kind of attachment is still safe, that they would allow uh, broadband connections? Again, you know, we've learned a lot from the current state of affairs right now and, and the dramatic need for broadband. So I'm wondering if PUC is creating any kind of waiver requirements for that. If someone could put together a poll plan that would work, especially if the poles say going to be replaced for the next 15 years and then they can meet compliance but those gap areas where the poles are not quite old enough to replace you know for any good reason is there any kind of conversation happening around that at the PUC no, I don't think I'm the right um, person to answer what, what sort of conversation is going on at the PUC I, we're not actively participating in one I, I would say that the, um, the current 1300 rules uh, do contemplate uh, what's it, what 
in what circumstances a poll owner can deny access to a poll. One of them is safety. And, and it all, those rules further um, articulate when a poll owner cannot deny access to an, a, a broadband company or another entity that wants to attach to the polls. So you, know, you may, referral to those 1300 rules may be appropriate to, to answer the question of that you asked. Okay, thank, thank you. you. The chair next recognizes uh, Representative Callie Pitts for a question. I, I, I think Representative Oxenham was far before me, but I'll ask my question of Chris. Uh, when uh, a broadband company puts up or replaces and puts up fiber perhaps, do they take down the other attachments? The other wire, the, the other words, copper? So I think that scenario is probably more appropriately directed to a, a company that has utilized that that copper based technology before. I'll, I'll say that when we um, it, when it is necessary for us to add infrastructure to our existing network, uh, we typically add that infrastructure by overlashing uh, that new infrastructure, whether it be fiber optic cabling or coaxial cabling to our existing attachments. Could, may I ask for clarification? Yes, go ahead. Could you explain what lashing is? Oh, sure, I apologize. <laughs> um, so overlashing is uh, when um, a, a company needs to uh, uh, secure, if you will, infrastructure to the carrying cable that is attached to the utility pole. And that uh, attachment, that overlashing is accomplished by uh, the use of a wire, which is wrapped uh, around that carrying cable and potentially other wires that are already there so as to secure them to the, uh, the both the attachment on the pole and the carrying cable that supports the uh, the infrastructure. Mr. Chair, may I ask a second question? Okay, go ahead. What is, can you now share room on fiber with other companies for a fee? Uh, so can companies do it by rule or regulation? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's okay. relatively uh, common for uh, companies that own fiber optic cabling to lease uh, access to uh, to infrastructure. Thank you. The chair recognizes Representative Oxenham for a question. Yes, I'm wondering if there's been, uh, do we still have Representative Marsh available? Uh, there you are. Uh, my, my question is whether you're um, aware that we have a broadband study committee bill before this committee. And I'm wondering if it would be useful to either roll these two together or to at least when we have a, this is I guess a question for the chair, whether it's appropriate to ask that they be uh, considered when we consider the bills, at least consider these two bills together because they, they certainly inter, intermerge. And I think the complexities of the discussion have have been revealed here. This is not a, the simple bill that it looked like. It has a lot of the issues that we see large, you know, across the board in dealing with broadband deployment. Representative Marsh, you want to comment? Uh, I think that the chair can uh, address his bills as whatever way he sees fit. And I recognize that it is a complicated problem or it would have been solved a long time ago. I guess I would wonder, is there any urgency uh, on the part of the selectmen and the residents of the town of Brookfield to make this happen sooner rather than later? Uh, th yes, the answer to that question is yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative Somsich for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Hudson, for taking my question. 
Um, this is more of kind of a philosophical question to you. Um, um, we all recognize the value of broadband and the, the need to make sure that everyone has access to it because of its value. Um, from, from your vantage point, uh, looking at the, the problems of trying to deploy it and make it accessible to everyone, what do you see as the, being the biggest obstacles? Besides polls. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Representative. Oh, besides polls. Oh, you know, I, I think that um, one of the unsatisfactory realities of trying to tackle this issue is that there's, there's no, there is no silver bullet that, that is offered or has been offered. Um, are the, the basic challenge that all of us have in deploying these networks is the potential market that exists for the products relative to the cost of deploying the product. So uh, efforts like this that seek to, to address that latter element um, is, def is certainly helpful, which is why we've, we've advocated for you know, both an approach similar to this and uh, as others, are, others have noted, you know, regulations that either speed or uh, ease access to these, these assets. So it's, it's, I think it's very difficult to identify that single uh, issue that, that is gonna resolve this issue. It's a combination of uh, are, are there customers there who can provide the revenue necessary to support the cost required to build the network? Uh, that's the, a very large equation to solve. Uh, follow up, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quickly, we have one more piece person who wants to speak on this bill. Okay. Uh, you see any, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hutchin, do you see any analogy between providing rural, rural electrification to everyone in this country uh, versus the broadband? I mean, that was certainly a similar situation. You know, I, truly, I, I don't see where we are today with broadband deployment in our country or in our state having a, offering a great analog between where the country was when it decided to uh, go down the path it did with rural electrification. And, and the reason I say that is that right now uh, in this state, there's two reasons. Really, right now in this state, in this country, we have, particularly in the state, high 90 percentile uh, availability of broadband. Depending on you know, what you consider broadband in terms of speeds, depending on exactly how uh, or what source of information you use, there's still, we still fall somewhere between the low to mid nineties and the mid to high nineties, 93 to 96, 7%. That's vastly different than where we were as a country when we embarked on rural electrification. And the second issue is that broadband, we, we now have a variety of technologies that I think really indisputably deliver broadband quality services. We've got uh, wireless services, uh, wired terrestrial services like the ones that Comcast provides. You've got um, really more as an emerging technology, but a, a proven technology as it relates to satellite. Um, that's not, that was not the case also uh, when we embarked on rural electrification. You don't we, we have um, a, just a variety of competing technologies that we just, we didn't have um, when that, that first decision was made. So I, I think that, I think those comparisons are, are fraught um, to be candid. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have one more person who wants to speak. So please make your questions uh, quick. Representative McGee is uh, recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Hodgson, for taking my question. My, my question's on a similar vein. I think we, we heard testimony earlier about uh, essential services that are being delivered to and areas that are blackout. So if they're in that seven, four to seven percent range of people who are excluded, 
it may be a very small percentage, but it, it still could relate to essential services. So I guess my question is, um, is it just about the cost proposition or is it about us being able to figure out a way to uh, take what is basically an, an essential infrastructure service and make it available to everyone in the state regardless of their location? Or, or to find a way to you know, support that. I mean, I thought that that was the uh, impetus for the bill, although it relates to Brookfield in a specific situation, it is not dissimilar from other small towns who also can't make right. it. Yeah, th thank you, Representative. I, I think that's correct. I, I think that uh, the this idea which found was germinated in Brookfield uh, is uh, is because the, ch the challenge is being experienced in a number of small towns in the state. So, uh, you know, I I think we, while not a necessary solution for this bill, I think we feel like we believe and we've advocated for partnerships between the public sector and the private sector, that where the public sector um, helps the private sector overcome those economic barriers. Um, and uh, do it in a way that allows all those different sorts of technologies that I just described to uh, try to have a seat at the table to solve the problem. That, you know, we, we've, we have the, the technology is proven, the means of doing it, the economic model is, uh, is proven. The challenge is how do you apply it in these, uh, these areas? And, uh, and I think you know we feel like uh, programs that allow the private sector and the partner, the public sector to partner, would really offer the best opportunity for success. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. No, I'm not going to allow a follow up at this point because the discussion have strayed from the subject of the bill. The subject of the bill is pole replacement, and now we're talking about broadband expansion across the state. That's not the subject of the bill, so. Let's, uh, let's move on and let me call on the final speaker uh, who wants to speak on this bill and that is Ellen Scarponi. And uh, Ms. Scarponi represents Consolidated Communications. Ms. Scarponi, you're on. Good afternoon, Chairman Voz and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. My name is Ellen Scarponi and I do represent Consolidated Communications. I don't wanna repeat things that have already been testified to, but I do need to incorporate them in this discussion if you'll bear with me. Of course, there is a strong consensus in New Hampshire among the residents and businesses and educators and medical providers, those who legislate and those who regulate and the providers of service that adequate broadband is necessary to sustain and expand opportunities to every corner of our state. Those are the questions that have been coming up. Consolidated Communications agrees completely and we, with that of the importance of this expansion and the fact that there are multiple ways that we need to do it. We are currently working with over 50 towns, counties, uh, municipalities, and the state on multiple ways to expand the broadband, including, but not limited to, municipal private public partnerships, which I will offer to you that I will reach out to the representative, uh, the selectman from Brookfield, Mr. Zakhar, to discuss um, how these public-private partnerships are working um, to fund the broadband to unserved people in their communities without any tax implications for their town. So I know he had mentioned that he, you know, that he had a quote from Consolidated for 1.2 million, but this was not, and he said that they had to fund completely. So I will reach out, I promise, to him to clear that up. We also have participated in the CARES funding for broadband, the Connect America Fund, and now the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, as well as our own investments in transformational fiber bills. When we've been before you in the last two years, um, there were pockets that didn't look like they would ever get broadband. And I can tell you now that we have, we and other providers now have fiber to the home in many of these very rural communities. So we very much support the, rural, the rapid expansion of broadband in New Hampshire. And 
everything regarding poles and pole attachments has, um, you know, is subject as previous speakers, our testifiers have testified to, they are subject to section 224 of the FCC Telecommunications Act of 1996 that say that it is unreasonable and inconsistent for utilities to impose the entire cost of a pole replacement on a requesting attacher when the attacher is not the sole cause of the, re of the pole replacement. And then under RSA 374.34a, the New Hampshire Public Utilities enforces rates, charges, terms, and conditions as regulated under that same act, 47 USC 224. Consolidated, again, we are a telecommunications company that also owns poles. We have always operated under this rule, but we oppose HB 308 because this bill does not advance broadband expansion except to benefit one category of provider and potentially increase costs for the others. The bill seeks to require that the poll owner absorb the cost to replace polls for new attachments, even when the only reason for the poll, poll replacement is the new attachment. This is nothing new. These are the rules that have been set out. While a poll may or may not be fully depreciated, if the need to replace it is driven solely by the new attacher, the new attacher should bear the cost because, but for that attachment, the poll would not need to be replaced. We, as I say, we have always operated under the rules from the FCC as endorsed by the PUC, but 308, HB 308 seeks to shift all poll replacement costs to the poll owner, regardless of the reason for the replacement. So we asked that the committee find HB 308 inexpedient to legislate. Now that's my formal testimony and I will submit this in writing, but I'm happy to answer any of the questions um, or, get, or provide clarification for questions that have come up during this conversation, this hearing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Scarponi. Before we take any questions, I'm going to open the public hearing on HB 371 and recess that hearing for the time being. Now, I will recognize Representative Callie Pitts for a question. Hi, Ellen. It's nice Hi. to see you again. This is Jackie. Hi, uh, you too. <laughs> question. I would like you to clarify the definition of served and access. There was a time when we said people had no access, but mm. what it was, was they had in, um, inadequate speeds. Mm -hmm. So could you just clarify those two defini definitions, please? Um, I I, I can't, I, I hope I can, yes. When we talked in the past, early days of broadband, there were issues in terms of the unserved, people who did not have um, adequate broadband to, or the unserved, they didn't have any broadband, if you will. We did put in definition, and it is in statute now, that there is a speed uh, requirement, a minimum requirement um, that was established by the FCC a couple of years ago of what we call 25.3, 25 megabits uh, download, by, uh, three megabits uploads. And those were speeds um, that the FCC at that point felt were sufficient. Uh, when we have done legislation in the last year, uh, it was recognized that 25.3 uh, is not future-proof and that there should be some room for allowing uh, expansion of broadband and the, un and the unserved definition should be what the FCC would then currently um, have defined. So that number can move. Um, the underserved are people who might have some level of broadband, but again, it does not reach that speed level. And I will tell you that although when the municipal, and, and this committee was in, involved way back when in the municipal broadband bonding uh, legislation, and uh, it was also in front of a number of other committees, but what that did a couple of years ago was enable towns to request 
they, they could put out a request for proposal for networks that applied what they needed in their community. So let's say it is the rural community of Brookfield and they have a, uh, they not even all of their residents have access to broadband. They could put out a request for information to all providers to say, where are those areas that are unserved as the FC, current FCC uh, definition is? And they could then decide as a community to put out a request for proposal to all providers of broadband and they can tailor made, this is local control, they can say in their RFP, we don't want it to just be 25 by three, we want it to be 100 symmetrical. We want it to be a gigabit. They could go for anything to uh, Representative Oxingham's question before, they can say they only want fiber and then they get responses back from providers and all of us who are on this call who have testified are those providers who can respond and then they can bond for that and work with the provider on how that bond is paid for. So long answer representative, I apologize, but did I answer your question? Yes, but may I follow up? Okay, follow up. When we did, um, and I just like a yes or no, when we did gasoline, we said, you know, when they put an octane on a gasoline, it means that's the minimal you can get, but it doesn't mean that you don't get more of an octane. So can you push speeds through current wires so that you can up the accent? And I know the charge goes up with that, but can you do that? Can that be done on existing uh, infrastructure and yes. the existing media? Uh, yes. it, it, it can be with, with electronics. However, I will tell you that um, I don't know of any town that has asked for bigger speeds on our copper infrastructure, that they are all looking for quotes on fiber for the future. Fiber. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Representative Cretians acknowledged for a question. Thank you, Chairman Both, and uh, thank you, Ms. Carponi, for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to ask for clarification on the statement, um, if but for the need for a new service, a pole wouldn't need replacing. Is there anything at all in the definition for pole replacement of um, I guess I'm just wondering why not having space for a new necessary function is not part of the definition of a pole needing replacement. Does that make sense? I'm trying to <laughs> try to formulate that question. Well, so the if you look at poles, as uh, uh, Mr. Hodgson had said, a pole is and the attachments are engineered to the nth degree to determine what the capacity is for the electric on top and how heavy, literally how heavy those wires are going to be. And then the tel tel usually it's the uh, telephone utility as, as Mr. Hodgson said, that's on the bottom. And then there are specific safety concerns and electrical concerns that determine the space between communications attachments and how many of them can be in that space. When that space runs out, you know, it used to be that there was only, it used to be there was only power, there was telephone, and then there was cable. And now we have all of these other providers needing attachments. Well, the, the engineering of these poles has to be first and foremost for safety. And so if it is determined that there is not enough space in there, regardless of what that attacher it, who that attacher is, whether it's it's cable or electric or you know wh whomever. It, it, there are times when poles have to be replaced because electric is upgrading, but there that that is part, as I say, of the FCC rules and the PUC rules um, that attachments themselves are not reason. Uh, the attachment is the reason to upgrade the pole, but it should not be borne by the 
whole owner because if they didn't want to attach, then we wouldn't need to replace the pole. Does that answer your question? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, seeing that there are no further questions, I would like to uh, close this public hearing so we can move on to the next one, which is now 10 minutes overdue. And I will close it by announcing that there were 14 people who signed in in support of this legislation. There were three who signed in in opposition. We had elected officials, Representative Brody Deshays signing in in support, uh, Representative Carol Crawford signing in in support, Representative John McDonald signing in in support, and Representative Latha Manjaputi signing in in support. So with that, we will close the public hearing on HB 308, and we will open or resume the public hearing on HB 371. And once again, uh, <clears throat> Representative Harrington, who is the prime sponsor of this legislation, has not uh, been able to uh, join us quite yet. So uh, the other sponsor of this legislation, who is myself, will introduce the bill. As soon as I dig it out here. So this legislation was requested by the consumer advocate. Both he and I have a concern about uh, some text we read in a uh, proceeding of the Public Utilities Commission that took place in October with regard to the energy efficiency resource uh, standard, Triennium uh, Energy Efficiency Plan, in which the commission uh, said that some of its proceedings are quasi-legislative. And that made me nervous, and it apparently made the consumer advocate nervous as well. And uh, so he asked Representative Harrington and I if we would file this bill, which basically says that uh, all of the commission's proceedings that affect rates and charges uh, have to be done as uh, adjudicative proceedings. In other words, they're like court proceedings where testimonies and findings of fact are um, submitted in, as evidence. Um, and the consumer advocate will explain in more detail what he means by that. Um, but it's a fairly simple and straightforward change to legislation, but an extremely important one. And so uh, I'm not going to say any further on the subject. And I will refer all questions to the consumer advocate. So if you will hold your questions, I will turn the matter over to the consumer advocate, Don Kreese, who will explain it in great detail. He submitted written <laughs> testimony, which was uh, voluminous in its detail and excellent as usual. Uh, but he will summarize that for you and uh, give the bill its due. So Don Kreese, please take it away. Uh, th thank you, uh, Chairman Vos. First of all, thanks to you and to Representative Harrington for agreeing to introduce this bill. And thank you for this opportunity to explain to uh, everybody on the committee why I think this bill is important. Uh, as you all know, my job is to represent the interests of residential utility customers. But, but really what's informing my interest in this bill is as much about that as it is about my background as a teacher of administrative law. I've taught that subject at Vermont Law School earlier in my career, and also uh, my experience serving as the general counsel of the Public Utilities Commission. Um, the first point I have to make about this bill is that in my opinion, and this is very important, this bill that Representative Harrington and Representative Vose have introduced clarifies existing law. I believe the Public Utilities Commission has made a mistake of law 
that we will attempt to correct through the appellate process if necessary. But in the meantime, uh, Representative Harrington and Representative Vose graciously agreed to introduce this bill as a way of making what I consider to be existing law absolutely clear to the folks at the Public Utilities Commission and everybody else. So the Public Utilities Commission, like most, if not all administrative agencies, uh, has the responsibility from time to time to make determinations that establish the legal rights, duties, or privileges of people out in the world. And by people, I mean both actual and virtual people, meaning human beings and entities formed by human beings. So the PUC makes decisions that affect the legal rights, duties, or privileges of people. And there are really two flavors that the commission can use for its decision-making. There's vanilla and there's chocolate. So by vanilla, I mean the commission can promulgate rules. That's called rulemaking. And rules are uh, requirements that apply generally to everybody. And then there's chocolate flavor decision-making and that is adjudication. And as Representative Vose just explained to you, adjudication when the Public Utilities Commission or any administrative agency is conducting adjudication, adjudication it really is uh, making decisions that resemble the way courts make decisions. And so you have your vanilla, you have your chocolate, but then for some reason, the Public Utilities Commission has decided to attempt to invent strawberry. And by strawberry, I mean what the commission described in the order that Chairman Vose referenced back in October as a quote unquote legislative docket. Well, I, I'm here to say that that is not consistent with established principles of administrative law. Uh, uh, the Public Utilities Commission and administrative agencies do have the right and obligation to conduct quote unquote legislative proceedings. That is what a rulemaking is. That's what rulemaking is, a form of legislating and it is legislative authority that has been delegated by you, the general court, to the administrative agency. Now, we all thought, and by we, I think pretty much everybody who practices in front of the Public Utilities Commission thought that rate proceedings uh, were adjudicative until uh, the Public Utilities Commission issued this order in October saying that the proceeding it was ruling in, which has to do with the energy efficiency uh, part of the system benefits charge, but not just that, but any rate proceeding is really legislative in nature. And as I explained in my uh, written testimony, I think that proceeds from an erroneous application of case law that's, that just talks about the fact that when an agency acts, it is acting pursuant to delegated legislative authority. That's informative when it comes to the nature of the power that an administrative agency wields, but it's not informative about how the agency has to make its decisions. And as I said before, there's vanilla, there's chocolate, there is no such thing as strawberry. There's rulemaking, there's adjudication, period. Now, as I mentioned in my written testimony, not every uh, decision that an agency makes has to be either rulemaking or adjudication because agencies make decisions all the time that don't affect the legal rights, duties, or privileges of people with business in front of the agency. And I gave you a couple of uh, somewhat whimsical examples. I think that allowing the Public Utilities Commission to uh, basically adjudicate or determine the legal rights, duties, or privileges uh, through this third flavor of decision-making is bad for both the customers and the utility shareholders whose interests the PUC is supposed to uh, serve as the arbiter between. And why do I say that? Well, in a quasi-legislative or legislative docket, unlike in an adjudicative docket, there's no definitive record. And what's important about an adjudicative proceeding is that the commission has to make its decision based on an established body of evidence that has been formally admitted into the record. Uh, now, in a legislative proceeding, such as the one we're in right now, we don't base, you don't have to base your decision on a definite re record. But as I explained in my written testimony, 
there, there's a different mechanism for constraining you, and that is called elections, right? Like if you folks make decisions that are improvident for some reason, you have to answer to your voters for that. But an administrative agency doesn't have to do that. Uh, in an adjudicative proceeding, there is a very strict rule against ex parte contact. I can't call up the chair of the PUC and say, Chairwoman Martin, I don't want you to decide this case that's pending before you in a certain way because I think it's bad for ratepayers. Not allowed to do that. But in a quasi-legislative proceeding, uh, I suppose I could do that. And again, as I explained in my written testimony, in a so-called legislative docket that isn't a rulemaking, there's really no way for the state Supreme Court in an appellate context, meaning if I appeal a decision that I don't like or one of the utilities does, there's really no standard for the appellate court to apply to determine whether it's going to affirm or overturn the PUC's decision. Now, there's another uh, little slice of this that I did not mention in my uh, written testimony, and that has to do with RSA 363.17c, so Section 17c of Chapter RSA 363. And what that statute says is that when the PUC conducts adjudication, its deliberations do not have to be conducted in public. And that is an appropriate way of allowing the commission to determine its decisions in adjudicative proceedings because it has to issue a formal decision based on an established and defined body of evidence. And it has to explain both in terms of fact and the law, what, it's, what the basis of its decision is. In another kind of proceeding, you know, you really do need the commission to deliberate in public as any agency is required to deliberate in public under the right to know law. So this new flavor of uh, uh, decision-making that the PUC has announced runs smack up against RSA 363.17c. And I contend that if the PUC is going to do that, uh, and it's gonna be allowed to do that, it at the very least has to conduct its deliberations in public. So in conclusion, I warmly recommend that you read my fairly lengthy written testimony about this bill because I elaborated on these principles to the maximum extent that any of you could possibly be interested in learning about them. But in closing, I again want to clarify for, for purposes of establishing a unassailably clear legislative record that in my opinion, this bill clarifies existing law and I asked for its introduction as a way of making sure that existing law cannot be subject to erroneous interpretation. So I think with that, I will conclude again with my thanks for the opportunity to talk to you and to uh, have this bill come before you. I would be delighted to answer any questions that the chairman might allow to be tendered to me. Thank you, Mr. Grease. I'm disappointed that there's no one here from the PUC to uh, testify on this bill or to answer questions, but that appears to be the case. But we do have uh, representatives who want to ask questions. And the first one is Representative McGee. You're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Consumer Advocate Kreese. I actually, I did read your testimony and I have heard you speak about this in our dealings over at the PUC on occasion. I think you've done a good job of explaining to us why um, it's important to preserve chocolate and try and avoid adding strawberry. Um, I guess the only question I would have is, is there any explanation for why we were moving towards strawberry? Like, I don't understand how we veered away from stuff that was fairly well established at the Public Utilities Commission. Is there any backstory that, that could help us understand that? Thank you, Representative McGee, for that extremely astute question. The, the, the short answer is, I don't really know. But the slightly longer answer is that my speculation is that the commission did not like a motion that I had filed that would have resulted if granted in the designation of certain of its employees in that uh, energy efficiency proceeding as staff advocates. And that would have uh, subjected them to, or it would have prohibited them from having informal ex parte contact with the commissioners. The commission never likes motions like that, but the statute that authorizes those designations only applies in adjudicative proceedings. And I think the commission thought that that would be a convenient way of 
getting rid of my motion. Uh, that, that's the only thing I can think of. That, that's literally how that decision got made in October. I, I think it was, uh, I think the commission painted itself into a corner improvidently, but uh, that's what they did. That's my best speculation. Uh, thank you. May I have a follow up? Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think you've tried to explain, and I want to understand this. It, it seems to me that the agency itself tries to conduct itself in a way that is as public as possible and in conformance with the RSAs around an agency of that type, where it's, you know, it's got a lot of influence over what's happening with the utilities and all. So um, is there a particular, it's, you've alluded to a number of different scenarios where you can see sort of a slippery slope happening. And I guess the question would be, can you point to particular harms that could occur in terms of these public proceedings uh, beyond what you've already illuminated? Or, um, or is the idea of having direct contact and influence with the commissioners the main um, piece that would be changed if we were not uh, managing cases within an adjudicative procedure? I, I think that the, uh, per, uh, first of all, thank you for that question. And I, I actually think to be candid that that possibility of ex parte contact is not my biggest worry because I, I have, uh, having dealt with several generations of PUC commissioners, I have a, a high degree of faith in their personal integrity. And my guess is that they would avoid those kinds of ex parte contacts. What I'm more worried about is the PUC making decisions. And you know we're talking about rate cases here, right? Rate proceedings. And so that has to do with you know what rates will Eversource or Liberty or Unitil or any of the water companies be allowed to charge all of their customers. And if you don't require the rigors of adjudication, then the commission could basically just pluck numbers out of thin air and say, well, you know, uh, Eversource asked for a 15% rate increase and the consumer advocate favored a 5% rate increase. And we're just going to decide 12% because that's what we like. And I have no way of knowing how they got to that 12%, whether there was, and neither does the utility, whether there was any rational basis for that kind of decision or whether they just guessed. And, you know, um, my favorite part of rate cases is what return on equity is a utility entitled to? Meaning, what, what is the commission going to assume its shareholders should be able to earn uh, as a result of its operations here in New Hampshire? And it makes a difference whether that return on equity is assumed to be 20%, that would be ridiculously high in the current economy, or uh, 5%, which would be so low from a utility standpoint that it would be a violation of the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. Well, if you don't require adjudication, neither I nor the utilities really have any way of determining what the actual basis of the commission's decision is. And it would be up to their whim, I guess, to uh, figure out or determine how precise they would actually be in terms of explaining themselves. And it would be well, impossible to appeal because I wouldn't know what to say to the Supreme Court about what the agency did wrong, other than, gosh, I think they were too generous to the company. So it's accountability as well as transparency. Absolutely. In, in a nutshell. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. that uh, excellent question. Uh, Representative Mann is recognized for a question. Don't forget to unmute Thank yourself. You. I, I, I finally remember. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have um, I have an example I would like to ask you about, Mr. Kreis. Um, and that is um, assistance benefit charge is um, can be uh, added for benefits. And um, as I guess, as uh, determined by regulators, this is a statement in the legislation. How does what you have talked about relate to that? Is that is that not um, um, legislation if you are choosing to raise the assistance benefits charge to pay for a certain thing that they decide is a benefit? Well, thank you, Representative Mann, for that, for that question. And I, I guess my answer is that it, it's, 
it's it's a difficult example to focus on because obviously the system benefits charge is itself a matter of uh, I guess you would say controversy or discussion or uh, reevaluation. Uh, to, to my way of thinking, and and this is the way the uh, PUC chose to treat the subject, uh, a decision on what the system benefits charge should be, what cents per kilowatt hour charge that should be for an electric utility, is a decision pursuant to RSA chapter 378 about what a rate is that is the requisite just and reasonable rate. So I would contend that the system benefits charge is like any other utility charge, at least for purposes of this conversation, meaning it is simply a just and reasonable rate as determined by the PUC that is imposed on customers in exchange for a service that they receive. And all the discussions that we've been having about the SBC are about whether that service is really sufficiently valuable to justify the uh, level of the charge. And, and again, it's authority that has been delegated to the PUC that the legislature can take back. And these other conversations we've been having are about whether and to what extent the legislature should reclaim some of that delegated authority. I, I hope that was a sufficiently lucid answer. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Callie Pitts is recognized for a question. Don't forget to unmute yourself. I, <clears throat> thank you. I have a very simplistic mind. And in my mind, if deliberations have to take place in public, isn't that, doesn't that make one more aware? I am going to assume, and please correct me, that information from both sides have to be presented in a, to be uh, to both to, to the commissioners, and then they have to deliberate it, deliberate on it, and come to a conclusion. If those deliberations have to take place in public, I would assume there'd be a record of them somewhere. And again, I'm making a lot of assumptions that sets of information would be available. And why wouldn't that be more transparent than having deliberations in private? Uh, thank you, Representative Callie Pitts. Uh, <laughs> and let me just come out of the closet as a fellow simple-minded person. So thank you for giving me permission to be forthright about that. Uh, so a short and maybe glib answer is that back in 2007, the general court decided that it would be desirable for deliberations and adjudicative proceedings at the PUC to be conducted privately. And I, I, I tried to explain a little bit about what I think the justification for that is. But as a general principle, what you just laid out, the premise of your question is the same premise that are, underlies our right to know law and particularly the open meeting provisions of the right to know law. Uh, overall, the legislature has determined that we want government bodies like the PUC to conduct their business in public so that we know what the basis for their decisions is and what kinds of uh, influences are being brought to bear on the decision makers. Uh, the, the RSA 91A requires public bodies not just to, to meet in public, but to keep minutes. And when the PUC does meet in public for public deliberations, they do uh, develop and approve minutes. Now, you know, they don't do a lot of deliberating in public, so there aren't a lot of minutes to review. And you could uh, argue, I guess, about the extent to which the minutes adequately reflect the actual deliberations. But that's how it works as a generic matter with respect to government agencies. They are supposed to meet in public, they're supposed to discuss things in public, and they're supposed to keep minutes. And, and may I clarify? Yes, follow up. Then, then my understanding, and again, in this simple-minded view, was that your bill does not want this to happen. This bill wants them to be able to, the, the process to be public, but the liberations to be private. Is that correct? Uh, Is that what you're um, advocating? Uh, thank you for that question and that follow up. I, I, I guess I disagree, or at least maybe I haven't expressed myself with sufficient clarity. 
the main public utilities commission, just to cite the example that comes right to my mind, does do all of its deliberations in public, whether they have adjudicated or not. And I, I, I think there's much to be said for that public policy. That's the way Maine and the Maine legislature has uh, constituted their public utilities commission. Here, uh, for whatever reason, back in 2007, and I, that, that actually does go back to the days when I was general counsel, so I could talk about why that happened in 2007. Uh, I have a two-word answer. It would be Clifton Below, just for oh, those who around. Um, but uh, in other words, former Commissioner Below thought this was a really good idea. There, there are arguments in favor of allowing adjudicative deliberations to be conducted in private. And when you think about it, it makes sense because we don't require judges to deliberate in public. We are uh, willing to rely on the written orders that they issue because they contain detailed findings of facts and conclusions of law. So I, it's not that I'm trying to drive the PUC into private deliberations. I'd be perfectly happy if you repealed RSA 363.17c and said all of the PUC's deliberations have to be public. It's more that I think when the legal rights, duties, or privileges of anybody are at issue, the PUC either has to promulgate a rule or conduct an adjudication. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are no other people signed oh. up to speak on this bill, uh, and there uh, are oh, sorry. Uh, no hands raised. Nope. So I have a raised appears, hand. Uh, Representative Harrington is recognized just, for a question. Thank you. Uh, just to, as a follow up to what uh, Mr. Kreese just said, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, back and forth was discussed over the years on whether the, all the deliberations should be public with the PUC undergoes. Uh, having been a, a commissioner, I can tell you that I think there's more open discourse behind closed doors than there would be if you thought everything you said was going to be quoted. I mean, for example, someone might play the devil's advocate and make a statement that you really don't necessarily believe, but you put it out there in order to stimulate uh, discussion. That could then next thing you know be uh, show up on the Facebook or the newspaper or something like that. And the, the other thing that, that was the reason that we sort of leaned towards keeping the deliberations uh, private was because unlike most other agencies, when the PUC issues an order, it comes with pages and pages of justification. The standard procedure is it gives you the, the position of the staff, the position of the, let's just say there was a utility involved, position of somebody who opposed the utility. All that stuff is laid out, and then the PUC gives their justification for why they ruled as they did. I think there's plenty of information provided in these orders, and that having to do everything in public would just make it kind of difficult to have a free and uh, open exchange of ideas between commissioners. Okay, thank you, Representative Harrington. I see a uh, hand raised by Representative McGee. You're recognized for your question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is to Representative Harrington. D does the bill actually talk about uh, public and private? I thought all it did was uh, clarify that adjudicative proceedings are that's that chocolate form of <laughs> of how how uh, the PUC conducts its business. I thought that that's what it was asking for. I, I believe you're correct. I just it was we were commenting oh, okay. on the on the discourse thing. That's why I brought it up. But uh, Mr. Okay. Kreese, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it, it doesn't address it in this particular bill. Uh, that's exactly right, Representative Harrington. Uh, the reason this whole sort of uh, uh, subsidiary conversation has erupted, I guess, is that RSA 363.17c says the commission's deliberative processes in adjudicatory proceedings, dot, 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 uh, are exempt from public meeting notice and disclosure requirements. So th that's how we got there. But the question of whether RSA 363.17c is a good idea, and Representative Harrington just laid out a pretty convincing case for why it is, that's not a question covered by this particular bill. Okay, uh, well, looks like we have another question. Um, Representative Oxenham is uh, recognized for a question. 
Thank you very much. I was just uh, perusing the attendee list to see if there was a representative from Clean Energy New Hampshire because I believe they put out a statement that they're opposed to this bill and I would have I would have liked to have heard their reasons why. Um, can, can, you, can you tell me whether there's a cost to this change? Is, is it the case that if there, everything is going to be a contested case, that this is going to be imposing additional costs on participants? Uh, before you answer, uh, Mr. Kreese, I uh, just want to point out to Representative Oxenham that Madeline Minot from Clean Energy New Hampshire did sign up uh, in support of this bill, according to the sheet I have. Go ahead, Mr. Kreese, and answer the question. Thank you. Uh, well, first, thank you, Chairman Vos, because that's my understanding of Clean Energy New Hampshire's position as well. And thank you for your question, Representative Oxenham. Uh, I, I don't think that adopting this bill will increase the costs of either having the PUC or appearing before the PUC. And here's why. As I said twice, and as I will now say for a third time, this bill, in my opinion, clarifies existing law. So we will simply tell the PUC that it has to continue doing uh, or making rate decisions the same way it has since the commission was formed in 1911 or whenever it was back then. Uh, the other thing is that, that from the standpoint of parties that litigated the PUC and you know, maybe some of the private interests that have PUC matters could comment on this, but it's my impression that what drives up companies' costs of the cost of regulation is uncertainty, right? To the extent that we can make the PUC's decision-making process and therefore the decisions more predictable uh, investor-owned companies like that better because they can plan for things that are fairly certain. Thank you. Hey, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Kreese. And seeing no further questions and having no further speakers signed up for this bill, I think we can uh, close the public hearing on HB 371. We had 25 people uh, sign in to support the bill, and seven people signed in to oppose it. We had four elected officials. We had uh, Representative Elaine Thomas signing in in support, and uh, Representative Latha Manjaputi signing in in support of the bill as well. So with that, we will close the public hearing on HB 371. And since we have uh, some time, I'm going to turn uh, running of the committee over to uh, Chairman, Vice Chairman Thomas for uh, an executive session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I declare uh, executive session, session open for House Bill 614. And with that, I'm looking for a motion from Representative Harrington involving the amendment. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, can, can I have a point of order, please? Go ahead. Um, I am a little bit confused again, uh, not again, but <laughs> I'm a little bit confused about exactly who is authorized to vote in this executive session. I see a number of new people who are uh, logged into this session uh, I don't know who is a substitute for who, and I would like to, to ask the chairman to clarify for us who is a voting member in this executive session and also what the rules are for uh, sub substitution. Well, I can answer that if you want. Um, first of all, earlier this morning, it was announced that Representative Lang was a uh, substitute for Representative um, White who wasn't able to be here today. And um, as you know, uh, Representative Hamola has been assigned to this committee since uh, day one and is still assigned to this committee. So we have a full committee here of uh, the only substitute we have is uh, Representative Lang, who was uh, duly appointed as a substitute for today. The rule involving that was if the chair is notified uh, or if the chair notifies the day before 
a meeting or executive session uh, to the House um, of the absence of the member for the entire day, then a substitute can be appointed, which was in fact the case. So with that, I have to contradict that. My understanding is that one needs to be appointed an hour before, not 24 hours before. Is that correct? I don't believe it is, but even if it were, he was appointed yet, uh, you know, yesterday, I mean, as a yeah, result I, of the I weekend. Understand, so. I understand that, but what, what is the actual rule here? When does a person, by what time does a person have to be replaced? An hour before the hiring or 24 hours before hearing? I believe the leadership uh, has specified that a committee needs to notify leadership 24 hours in advance that a replacement is needed on a given day. And leadership will then affect an appointment to uh, replace the member who cannot be there. Um, I don't know if there's an exact hour listed in the rule. I don't believe that there is. The only thing I think the rule deals with is notification of leadership uh, 24 hours in advance in order to get a replacement. In other words, I don't think leadership would accept it if you called up an hour before you wanted to do an exec session and said, hey, I need a replacement. That wouldn't be acceptable. Okay, and uh, then Mr. Chair, uh, Chair another uh, follow-up to that. Um, the uh, uh, we had a replacement for a representative Platt when he was no longer able to, not able to attend. He's now attending. So whoever replaced him would not be part of this committee at this point, right? No, that's not correct. Uh, representative that's Platt is attending as um, any representative can attend any committee meeting. Uh, he's not a voting member. Uh, right. The leadership has submitted a letter reinstating him as a voting member as of February 15th, which is next Monday. So he's here to observe. Uh, I'm allowing him to participate because um, we want to keep his spirits up. You know, Absolutely. Understand. we, we want to keep him involved. Absolutely. Um, I, I was just confused that I thought he was going to be a voting member this time too. He will not be voting with us uh, this afternoon. Okay. And okay. one final clarification from you, Mr. Chairman, this is not on this topic, but a different topic. Um, I think uh, Representative McGee asked previously uh, that as a co-sponsor, she, she wanted to ask a question. And I remember you distinctly saying in the beginning of our sessions that uh, a co-sponsor could in fact ask questions if there is time available. Is that your position at this point? Yes, time permitting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Very okay. Much. Okay. With that said, uh, again, I'm looking for a motion from Representative Harrington uh, on the amendment to 614. And the amendment would be uh, 2021022H. So moved. That would be, I, I move that, that we adopt uh, 2021022H as an amendment to HB 614. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Go ahead. Has the amendment been circulated? Uh, my understanding is that it has over the weekend. Is it the one that we had before the last hearing on this bill? I believe so. <laughs> I need a firm answer on that. I, I, can, so. an I can answer that question. Thank you. Uh, this is a new amendment that was circulated um, on Thursday, uh, February, what was last Thursday? <laughs> anyway, it was, it was circulated last Thursday. Um, that would have been February 4th. It was sent to all the committee members on February 4th and to House Committee Services for distribution to members of the committee. Has anyone seen it? Because I haven't seen it. Uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, point the of motion order. has been made. I'm looking for a second from a representative. Mr. Point of order. 
Um, What's your point of order? I, 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 I would I would request that if it would be possible to take a, a short break recess, perhaps um, to review the amendment and have a caucus, that would be very helpful. Well, we did pass the amendment uh, around last week. Is there a reason why you didn't get to it until now? Um, just to be clear, it sounds like there are quite a few folks who haven't had a chance to review the amendment, uh, and it doesn't make sense for us to vote on something that people haven't read. Uh, certainly, we have received hundreds of emails between Thursday and now. I, I believe we all get the uh, emails that go to the whole ST &E committee. I believe the amendment was passed out with, with sufficient time to be read. So um, I'm going to uh, respectfully decline that and proceed with the second to the amendment from Representative Nodder. Yes, I second the amend the motion to uh, submit the, uh, I'm sorry, hold on. Adopt the amendment. Motion has been seconded. We're open for discussion on adopting the amendment uh, 2021-022H. Go ahead, Representative Donner. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to uh, point out that, uh, to again, um, it'll say unapproved on it, but we went over this the last time that we talked about amendments. So th this is the actual amendment. It just says unapproved on it. That's a correct. The um, OLS this year has said that this is the official amendment, even though it says unapproved on it. They're not going to have approved on it until it's been adopted. Mr. Uh, Chair, Representative Oxnaham, go ahead. I see your hand up for a question. Thank you. Is it the case that the change here builds on the previous amendment and only gets rid of that free rider issue that we discussed at the hearing? So if, if you are exempt, you cannot ask for money under the program? I'll let uh, Representative Vos address that question. Yes, thank you for that question. That's exactly what this amendment uh, does. It adds a new section E that uh, says that if a town accepts its exemption from paying the RPS, that it cannot apply for grants from the Renewable Energy Fund. So it deals with the free rider question that uh, Representative, Representative Somsich uh, talked about um, when we discussed this before this executive session was recessed. Thank you. And, and other than that, it's the same as the amendment, not the same as the original bill. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Representative uh, Christian, uh, you recognize for a question? In executive session, it has to be a question, can't just be a statement. It can be a statement too. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I feel like even I appreciate um, the intent of the amendment to eliminate the free rider situation. I just know that our municipalities are dealing with a lot of things that they have to think about. And I think that this just adds an unnecessary layer of confusion and effort for them to participate in this program. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions, I'm going to ask the uh, clerk to um, Call the vote. Um, Mr. Chair, it, it, you're saying now members cannot discuss what's in the bill. We can only ask questions because this isn't a hearing. This is an executive session. So if we have discussion points that we'd like to raise before people put their votes on the table, shouldn't we be allowed to do that? Well, as I explained to Representative Christian, she was correct. She can also make a statement as well as a question. I just got through saying that. So yes, you can, you know, you can, you, if you have a discussion point, go ahead. Okay. Well, I mean, I think um, what I had said in the last hearing, I'd like to reiterate here, which is that this basically guts the idea of there being a, a benefit to the state of New Hampshire in having uh, energy efficiency subsidized through a, an S, you know, through a system benefit charge. 
and that's what it was designed for. So we're really undoing the ability of our towns to be able to invest in energy efficiency to lower their costs permanently, which is the whole reason that we want to have funding for that. And it's a very, as, as, and as the testimony in the hearings showed us, that's a really good investment. That's a four to one, you know, rate of return. And so based on the evidence and also the support for the bill, um, I mean, the, the support, <laughs> not the support, the opposition to doing away with this money. Um, I, I don't see how we can do this in a, you know, to, I don't see how we can be responsibly take this away. I don't believe uh, uh, this bill covers that subject that you were talking about. So, um, but your comments are, are noted. What, what subject are you referring to that it doesn't? Representative Harrington, I see uh, you're organized for a uh, comment. Yeah, I just wanted to say that no one's taking anything away from anybody here. It just gives the towns the uh, option to decide whether they want to get involved in the program or not. I mean, some towns uh, have enough resources. They have an energy committee. They may even have a full-time professional who works on uh, trying to cut their energy uses and save them money. A lot of the small towns don't have anything like that. And they just as soon say, hey, you know, let us keep our money and uh, we'll figure out, and if we decide we want to change in a few years, there's nothing stops us from saying we want to go back in and we'll start paying the extra fees and hopefully get something for a project. But there's a lot of towns that just aren't going to take advantage of it. And we're giving them the option to say, okay, if you don't want to play, you don't have to pay. We did have a discussion. Thank you. Uh, Representative Pimentel, you recognize for a, a comment? Oh, let me put this down. Do this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I mean, the fact that this thing is really, you know, just another uh, slice in the the SBC funding, another cut, another bleed. Uh, it's also, it appears to be, have an opt out provision rather than an opt in. I, the the fact that as soon as this bill passes, all the subdivisions as far as the way I read it, no longer are going to be uh, paying this SBC unless they, um, the majority vote of the governing body elects to continue payments. Am I correct in the way I'm reading this? Uh, Representative, uh, no, not exactly. This is involved SBC that involves uh, R RPS. So your comments are noted. Representative, um, McWilliams, you're, no, you're recognized for a comment. Uh, thank you to the chair. I, I, I just want to say on the record that this creates a huge discrepancy between haves and have nots for the different towns and municipalities here in New Hampshire. I think that this is incredibly unfair to small towns. And I think that we're going to see the, the horrible repercussions of this for years to come. This is really concerning to take away uh, funding for the RPS and to get rid of energy efficiency. This is really short-sighted. I'm very concerned. Thank you, Representative. Representative Oxlingham, you're recognized for a comment. If I could come back, I'm, I must say I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to get my mind wrapped around this and I, I don't think I can verbalize efficiently. So if, if someone else could go first and I'll come back in. Okay, thank you, noted. Uh, seeing no other hands raised, uh, we're oh. moving into the vote, please. Uh, no. Where? No, no, in in that case, raised. I think I better, I better verbalize Excuse my me, question. My hand is raised. Oh, sorry, I just see your hand raised, uh, Representative Sampich, go ahead, my apologies. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, even though I was, my name was mentioned, I, I was not involved in negotiating this amendment, just to clarify this. Um, and, uh, but I did make the comment about uh, not paying and uh, is, is not is unfair if you're going to take the use of the benefit. So actually, I, I w am in favor of this amendment, and I will vote for it but I will vote against the final bill because I think it's a bad effort to try to gut the RPS. So um, I just want to put that on the record. And, and in my personal opinion, if the towns 
opt out because they're not going to make use of this benefit, I have a strong feeling that very few of them will make use of it anyway. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, your comments are noted. At this point, I'd like to recognize uh, Chairman Vose. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I would like to um, open the public hearing on HB 309 and recess it until this executive session is over. Thank you. Uh, Representative McGee, you're recognized for a comment. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke before and said and translated uh, SBC for RPS. Um, I, what is not listed in the bill is whether or not towns would still be selling recs, which would still have a free rider effect. So I'm just wondering if the bill is still ready for prime time, because this is a very significant change, um, depending on how many people uh, adopt it based on their financial circumstances uh, to get the short term benefits while losing the long term gain. So I, I just have that question. I don't think I see anything in the language here that speaks to recs and how they would be handled by somebody who decided that their subdivision wanted to be excluded from paying into the RPS. I'll let uh, Representative uh, Vose answer that question. Thank you, uh, Representative, for the question. This would have no effect on a town's ability to sell recs. It only would affect a town's ability to apply for a grant from the U Renewable Energy Fund. Representative uh, uh, Christian, you're recognized for a comment. Thank you. Um, this time it's actually a question. So just clarifying, last time we spoke about this, we said that the default would be to opt out of the program, right, for, for municipalities. Um, so I guess my concern is how will municipalities be notified that this is going into effect and how long will they have to decide whether to opt back in? I just am worried about blindsiding, um, you know, small towns who, as it was stated before, don't have one person who's, who's dedicated to that, even in Manchester, <laughs> I think it might be challenging, um, but just to make sure that, that municipalities have enough time to really deliberate over whether they want to stay in and get those um, get those benefits or opt out. Thank you uh, for the question, Representative Vos, uh, comment. Uh, I guess my, my answer to that question would be that towns would see their electric bill go down by some percentage, um, depending on how much they used. And it would be up to them to uh, determine if they need to take a, a vote of their governing body to re-enter the program. Uh, there would be no notification according to the bill about uh, to the towns and cities and towns about their being opted out from the program. That's a follow good question. On. Can I follow up on that then? So opting out disqualifying every municipality from participating in the system until they explicitly opt in. That's really concerning to me. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Re uh, Representative Kelly Pitts, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to say that I believe that this bill will be better off with an amendment than without an amendment. I think that uh, the amendment seeks to adjust some differences and some problems with the bill. Not all of them, but some of them. So I think it's better off with the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not hearing any more different information, so I will ask Representative Oxenham to say something different. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't believe the question of difference comes up in our discussions in an executive session. We're, we're trying to work our way through this, this um, amendment. And the fact that it towns, my town in particular has been discussing for years options and is now coming up with a plan and is ready to go for, well, we think they're ready to go forward, but it's entirely possible that they may not put it forward before such time as this is voted on 
And then all of the work, even you know, with trained professionals and consultants, could be down the drain because the rug's been pulled out from them that the programs they thought they were going to be involved in, they're no longer qualified for because somebody in Concord has changed the rules. I, I, I find this um, not, not a good uh, amendment and, and a, not a good bill, and, I'm, and I intend to oppose it, and I hope that others will also. Thank you. Uh, Representative McGee, you have some comments? Thank you, uh, Representative Thomas. I want, I, I would like to reiterate something uh, that I, I'm not sure is clear here. The change that was made was to address um, Representative Somsich's concern that people would be gaining benefits from the Renewable Portfolio Standard Program without actually participating in it. And when I asked the question about whether towns would still be able to sell uh, RECs, um, it, they basically would be making revenue from a policy that they're not paying their share to participate in. So it's going to really destabilize and um, The, I don't think this amendment takes us to a place where we have something that's basically a stable policy. That is my concern. I feel like it's being pushed through and it's not, it's not uh, a suitable solution for whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. You're saying that you'd like, the, that you'd like towns to save money um, by opting out of something that everyone pays into. And if we do that, but we allow towns who decide to still reap benefits from that program, it's gonna become very lopsided. So I'm, I'm asking you to consider uh, your actions with this bill. Thank Listen you up. very much. And uh, again, for your comments involving the same concerns, I, I see no other different concerns coming up. I am moving into the vote right now, asking the clerk to call the roll for the vote. Uh, okay. This is on the, uh, amendment. And the amendment is 2021022H. We are in the voting mode. Okay, on the amendment 21 2021022H. The motion is ought to pass. Adopt adopt the amendment, I'm sorry. Representative Thomas. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Myrna, yes. Representative Homola. Yes. Representative Bresney. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Kembrels. Yes. Representative Ploge. Yes. Representative Lang. Yes. Representative Sausage. No. Representative Callie Pitts. Yes. Representative Meehan. No. Representative Oxenham. No. Representative Vincent. Representative Vincent's not here. I didn't call the roll this morning because I got hit a half hour late. Okay, I'll say not voting. Representative McGee. No. Representative McWilliams. No. Representative Cretion. No. Representative Pimentel. No. Representative Paschal. No. And Chairman Rose. Yes. Mr. Clerk, I, I did not see the image of Mr. Lang or Representative Harrington here. I don't think they're allowed to vote unless I see their image. I okay. Seen them. Yes, I did. They seen him and then they let go of their screen. He's, he's, he's waving now. Okay, I see. I see Representative Lang. How about Representative Harrington? I didn't see him. If you look, you'll see me because I'm right there. Oh, okay. okay, thank you very much, Representative. With 12 yeas, 
and eight nays and one not voting, the amendment passes. Yes, we have adopted amendment uh, 2021-022-H for uh, HB 614. I now uh, ask for a motion from uh, Representative Harrington. Yeah, I'm trying to get this thing to go work again here. Just be able, ah, where do we go? Uh, I yeah, like I move, seeing you. I move that we um, pass um, the bill as amended by 2021-022-H to HB 614. Thank you. Uh, Representative Nodder. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, we are now uh, for uh, HB 614 uh, ought to pass as amended, uh, open for discussion. Representative Pimentel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, I wanna reiterate that, that this is going to uh, be to the detriment of the RPS and I strongly object to um, the uh, section D, which basically makes it an opt out bill and not an opt in for towns. Opt out is not gonna be easy. It says it has to be passed by the majority vote of the governing body. Well, in my town, the governing body is the entire town, which means it has to go to the town at uh, town meeting day to get out of this. I just really object to that. I think it, it's ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pimentel. Uh, before we go to the next uh, qu uh, comment, I just wanna remind everybody that this is an early bill that needs to be tended to it as soon as possible. Uh, Representative, um, Lang, uh, you have comments, please. I just want to speak to that statement about governing body. The governing body is your select board or your town council, if you have one. The legislative body would be your town meeting day and vote at, at that kind of thing. So just a clarification on that issue as town moderator. The governing board is always the select board or the city council. The legislative board is your town, uh, entire town on a ballot vote. Thank you, Representative Lang. Representative Somsich, you have a comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, I, I, I uh, didn't consider at the time of uh, the previous discussion the impact on being able to sell recs that municipalities can do that uh, Representative McGee brought up. So um, that basically just solidifies my uh, opposition against this bill. The rest of New England states are increasing their RPS. Remember the RPS is our goal setting mechanism to say how much renewable energy we would like to have. Uh, the other states around us are growing up with their RPS and this, this bill here would, send to, would tend to depress the RPS and, and under support it. So I would definitely oppose this bill. Thank you, Representative Somsich. Uh, Representative Pimentel, you have another comment? Uh, sorry. Put my hand down. Thank you. Um, Representative Oxenham. Yes, um, as, as the other states in New England who share our regional grid with us have moved uh, aggressively to uh, raise their energy efficiency and their renewable energy, uh, many of them now having you know, close to or more than 20% of their total energy coming from those sources. Uh, we, we've, we, we've, we've touched on the past, but I don't believe our new members are, are really aware of what this means for regional transmission costs. This, you know, this small change that you say someone might notice on their electric bill is where our, our peak demand, our, our total demand is going up as, as the other states 
are, is going down, which means that the proportion of the charges for regional transmission that New Hampshire will have to pay could be increased by passing this bill by millions of dollars. And I don't think that very important issue has been discussed here. And I, even though we need um, rapid decision because of second bills, I think we need someone from DES to speak to that because that is a concern they have raised with us in the past, but we have not had addressed in this session because we haven't been able to get our orientation from the DES that informs people about that very important aspect, which will be dramatically affected by this. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Harrington, you recognize for comment? Yeah, yeah, I'd have to respectfully disagree with the last speaker. Um, the portion of the uh, electric bill, the transmission part, is a pretty small portion. Now, I know it's been going up over the past uh, 10 or 15 years, mostly because we've spent billions of dollars on transmission, and that gets allocated across all of New England. Now, the fact that we use more electricity in New Hampshire uh, is generally a good thing because that means our economy is thriving. Our unemployment rate, even during the pandemic, is much lower than the rest of uh, the uh, states. In fact, at one point, Massachusetts had the highest unemployment rate in the United States, and ours was one of the lowest. So the use of electric consumption is obviously we don't want to be wasting electricity, but, but just by saying we're using more is a bad thing. No, tell the people that got a job that's such a bad thing that they now are working. So I have to disagree with that. And I think the amount you're talking about here is very, very small amount when you're going to say uh, spreading it out over you know millions of kilowatt hours, how many more are you going to uh, pay for because New Hampshire uses uh, a fraction of a percent uh, less or more than some other state. It's just isn't it, it, it's insignificant amount of money. And to a town, it might be a substantial savings, especially if they use a lot of electricity. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I'm hearing the same comments over again. I will take one more from uh, Representative Somsich and um, then we'll move on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would just briefly like to contradict Representative Harrington. Uh, using a lot of electricity doesn't is not a positive thing. Using energy wisely is a positive thing, very wise, and that's where energy efficiency comes in. In fact, using a lot of e electricity or energy, uh, as the U.S. has done in the past history, where they have been one of the most wasteful countries in energy, does not make us a better society. We need to be smart and use that energy wisely. That's where that's where this RPS comes in, and that's where the energy efficiency comes in. Thanks. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative um, Meyer, the clerk, are you ready to take the vote, please? We are in the voting mode uh, on the ought to pass for a six fourteen. Yes, I am. As amended. On Bill six fourteen, OTP as amended. I will call the roll. Representative Thomas. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Myrna, yes. Representative Homola. Yes. Representative Bresney. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Kembrels. Yes. Representative Plose. Yes. Representative Lang. Yes. Thank you. Representative Sompsage. No. Representative Callie Pitts. No. Representative Mann. No. Representative Oxenham. No. Representative Vincent. Representative McGee. No. Representative McWilliams. No. Representative Cretion. No. Represent Pimentel. No. Represent Partial. No. And Chairman, Represent Vos. Yes. With the vote 11, 9, and one not voting, motion passes as amended. I declare executive session for 614 closed. Use your mic. Oh. Yeah, I. Mike. 
mic challenged. Uh, the executive session for uh, 614 is uh, hereby closed and I'm turning the uh, next proceedings over to uh, Chairman Vose. So we'll now uh, resume our public hearing on HB 309 and I will call on the prime sponsor of the legislation to uh, introduce the bill. Representative Harrington, you're recognized to introduce HB 309. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, this Point is a of order. Pretty, oh. Mr. Chairman? Point of order? Uh, who, who's asking for a point of order? Peter Somsich? Yes. I just want to clarify, uh, we, we have a minority and majority report on this? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I, I would suggest that uh, uh, if, if uh, Representative Oxenham is willing to write the uh, minority report. Will do. Good. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank Please you. have it to us by Thursday afternoon at three o'clock. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Representative Harrington, you're on. Uh, yeah, this uh, this bill is uh, pretty straightforward. It's fairly simple. It actually came up last year. It was from the governor's, uh, whatever they're calling themselves now, strategic something or other office there. Um, and it was just to correct what was really a mistake in the, uh, in the law. I think this might have been a compromise back a long time ago, but the capacity factor to, that should be used for estimating purposes, according to ISO New England, is about 13.5%. Now, that can change. So what we've done in the bill is just say, use whatever ISO New England puts out instead of saying it's a blanket 20%, which I think to be in all honesty, even though this isn't usually where I'm coming from, that would mean the utilities were getting credit for you sold it that they weren't actually being produced and they were buying less recs because of that. So yes, will this have an effect on electric rates? Very, very small and it would be increasing, but it gives you a more accurate picture of what actually is being produced and we should be using the best information we have, not a over generous guess. Pretty straightforward. Thank you, Representative Harrington. Any questions for Representative Harrington? Seeing none, I will call on the next speaker for the bill, which would be Joseph Kwasnick, a member of the public representing himself. So, Mr. Kwasnick. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Be, yes. be sure to speak, uh, speak up uh, clearly. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully this headset will make the difference from this morning. Um, it does, yes. Yes, great. I am submitting both written testimony and oral testimony in support of House Bill 309. And the reason for doing that is to um, echo what Representative Harrington is saying, that this proposed legislative cha change is warranted as the, as the PV energy forecast referenced in the legislation provides a more accurate estimate of the capacity factor rating for PV installations than the current 20%. In fact, the PV energy forecast results have resulted in a lower capacity factor rating, approximately 14% in recent years. This lower capacity factor rating will result in fewer class two renewable energy credits to be distributed to each electricity provider in New Hampshire. Some total of that is they'll have to come up with more RECs um, than they have in the past. So that completes my testimony and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Any uh, questions for Mr. Kwasnick? Seeing none, I will call on the next person who has signed in to testify, and that is Madeline Minot, a lobbyist for Clean Energy New Hampshire. And Ms. Minot, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Vose, uh, and thank you, members, for the opportunity to testify on this bill. Clean Energy New Hampshire supports House Bill 309. Um, as a little bit of background, two years ago in 2019, uh, there was a bill passed, Senate Bill 72, which would have repealed um, what we call the REC sweeping credit, which is the credit given to all energy suppliers that have a renewable portfolio standard obligation for RECs for which the owners did not register to be eligible to market their own RECs. So uh, Senate Bill 72 would have repealed that provision and it was vetoed by the governor. Um, however, in the governor's veto message, it said um, that our focus should be to fix the credit mechanism in the law, not repeal it. 
currently. So uh, what that reference is talking about is making that change in the capacity factor used to calculate the credit. Um, as I mentioned also in my written testimony, the Public Utilities Commission in their last review of the RPS also recommended making this change uh, in the capacity factor used to calculate the credit. To be clear, Clean Energy New Hampshire opposes the credit entirely because we view renewable energy certificates as a commodity owned by the renewable energy system owner. And uh, we see this rec sweeping credit as the taking of their property without their knowledge or compensation for that property. However, um, the capacity factor used currently um, of 20% is just inaccurate for solar and almost the entirety of the credit is solar. It actually makes up a very considerable amount of the total obligation for solar renewable energy certificates in the RPS. Um, in the last year that we have information for, the credit made up 0.4794% of a 0.6% obligation. So it's, it's quite a bit. So using the 20% capacity factor artificially inflates the credit. And so the least we could do is to actually use a realistic number, which is exactly what uh, HB 309 proposes to do. So we support making this change recommended in House Bill 309 and ask you to vote ought to pass on the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Minot. Are there any questions for Ms. Minot? Seeing none. And having no other people signed up to speak on this bill, I guess we can uh, close the public hearing on HB, whoops, Representative Callie Pitts, a last minute hand, go ahead. Well, I, I, I wanted to ask a question of Representative Harrington, and I guess I can't because he presented and he can't ask, answer questions, is that correct? No, you can answer, you can ask questions. He can't ask questions. Oh, I can ask a question. Yes. Yes, of the last witness, no. But I, I wanted to know why you would advocate when you said electric rates increasing. Why would you advocate for an electric rate to increase? Can I answer the question, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for the question. I, I'm not advocating for an increase in electric rates. What I'm saying is that's a result of this, but it's a result of being of using a more accurate number. The 20 percent was some kind of a I don't know exactly how it came up. I think it was, you know, is, is how one gets a camel with a horse and all that stuff. It was a compromise that came up to uh, push the numbers artificially low. It just isn't accurate. Uh, it's a simple thing is that 20 percent we shouldn't be used because it's not the right number. And as the, one of the gentlemen spoke there, he said around 14%. I, I heard 13 and a half, whatever comes out of ISO in New England. That accurately reflects what we're getting. The 20% was artificially high. So the utilities will have to buy some additional recs based on that, which means they'll put that into the rate. So there'll be a slight increase, but it just is an increase that we should have had to begin with because that reflects the reality of the situation. Thank you. You're very welcome. Are there any uh, further questions for either Ms. Minot or Representative Harrington? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing on House Bill 309. And I will report that we had 40 people who signed in in support of this bill. We had two people who opposed it and one person who was neutral. Uh, we had a few elected officials who signed in on this bill, uh, Representative Manjaputi from Nashua was opposed to the bill. Uh, Representative Thomas, Elaine Thomas, supported the bill and Representative Paul Ely opposed the bill. So those were the um, elected officials who signed in on that bill. So with that bill having been, uh, the public hearing on that bill having been closed and we still have uh, some time left before we uh, have to open the public hearing on the next bill, I would like to open a public session 
on HB one executive session rather on HB one one nine, and I would like it like to uh, recognize for a motion, uh, Representative Cambrils. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to make a motion to ITL this bill, HB 119. Representative Cambrils has moved that we move ITL on HB 119. Chair recognizes Representative Bernardi. I would second that motion. It has been moved and seconded that we uh, ITL HB 119. Is there any discussion? Representative McGee. Uh, don't forget to unmute. <laughs> I just realized. Um, I would like to ask why we are recommending ITL. Do you want to address that, Representative Cambril, since you made the uh, motion? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I just see this simply as uh, I do not feel that we, the legislature, should be giving away this authority to uh, unelected bureaucrats when uh, this is what I, the people of New Hampshire elected us to do is to be their voice. So that's, that is why I, I, am, uh, I am recommending ITL on this bill. Representative uh, uh, Oxenham, I guess, is next. Thank you. Um, again, I must protest going to an executive session on this bill ahead of our ability to hear the orientation from the Department of Environmental Services, which would educate our new members and many of our old members as to the reasons why certain things are done in certain ways and how they actually work in a composite to affect public policy for the public good in the state of New Hampshire. I think it's, it's just wrong to be um, working on these bills. I mean, yes, we could have the public hearings in advance, but not to move to taking final votes. I protest. Thank you. Uh, Representative Somsich is recognized. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think um, to, to the reasoning why one would ITL this to say this should be a part of the legislative process, uh, I think uh, that looks like a little bit too much optimism of what the legislature can actually do. Setting the rates for the SBC is a very complicated process as we heard, and it's whether they're unelected uh, officials or experts who know what they're doing is a big difference. Uh, I suggest that none of us would say we know better what a surgeon should do with our with our injuries than than they do. So let's get a committee together to say what the best treatment is. We have experts who know how to do this. They're doing this right now. They've been doing it, and to put this in the lap of the legislature, which cannot deal with it in a timely manner, is quite irresponsible. I think. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Mann. Well, on mute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, I, I agree with the preceding um, objections to this bill, to this ITL. Um, first of all, um, I can't imagine uh, anyone wanting to get into the business of doing energy efficiency work if the legislature uh, which can change every other year, um, is going to be deciding whether or not to uh, include uh, energy efficiency payments uh, or uh, funding in the um, system's benefit charge. And I, I think the, uh, the history of this bill is uh, this whole concept of uh, supervision by the uh, legislature was based on a completely erroneous um, and really fallacious uh, um, attribution to uh, the Constitution. Basically, the Constitution requires blah, blah, blah. You know, you, you, the people can, only the people or the 
the representatives or authority derived therefrom so can uh, impose something like the SBC. Um, the last three words, uh, last four words of that constitution will clause Article 28 do justify, completely justify the SBC being uh, decided by the organization called the Public Utilities Commission. So the question is, what is the motive for this, um, this insisting that the, the uh, that the let well never mind that um, I just wanted to say I think the effect of this was just to be freeze our our ability to do uh, the energy efficiency work we need to do. Now I've worked on uh, some analysis about the energy efficiency. In a sense, we're doing such a poor job in this state. Um, Massachusetts has been doing this work for. 25 years and they've way ahead of us and they've got a tremendous amount of work done. I think what people don't understand is that once a house is insulated, say, or improved, it stays improved for the rest of its, until it burns down or it falls down. The, uh, so there's a revenue stream, not a revenue stream, a savings stream. It's money we don't send to the oil industry to buy fuel. We have a saving stream from the first year you do an energy efficiency program, from the second year, from the third year, and they just keep going. Massachusetts's first year, 25 years ago, has been producing saving stream, that saving stream lasting 25 years. What they did 24 years ago is a saving stream that's lasted 24 years and so on. You all add up uh, those numbers up to what they did this year, give you a saving stream, a little short one of one year. Um, that, that you add dolls up, you got 325, you don't have 25. You did this 325 in 25 years because of the continuation. What we're doing is we're robbing ourselves blind. This is absolutely stupid to do this. And I'll rest my case for that. So Representative Mann, I, I, I'd like to register my opinion on this. I think the question here is not, does the legislature want to get into the business of setting the system benefits charge? The question here is, who is accountable for a mandated government charge? Is it bureaucracy or is it the legislature? And I think some of us believe that it is the legislature who has to be held accountable to the public for whether or not the system benefits charge goes up or up, up, goes up or down. If the legislature can be convinced that an increase in the system benefits charge is legitimate, then I'm sure the legislature will agree to that. But at some point, somebody has to be held accountable. And we believe that, uh, many of us believe that it's the legislature that is the body that will be held accountable. So the legislature needs to be, have oversight over the system benefits charge. Uh, okay, who else has a comment much, here? Uh, uh, thank you very much for that. But the fact is we do have oversight. We can at any time, if we feel the system's benefits charge is excessive, if we feel something is done wrong, the legislature can step in and complain about that and set it come up with a bill saying, you know, the maximum will be this or anything else. But that's prior to a problem. The SBC has been set very accurately and very productively over the years. And there's no reason, no reason has been given for wanting to put, or for feeling that the legislature actually has to do anything in terms of supervising the Public Utilities Commission in this very good work that they do. Thank you, uh, Representative. And again, are wasting tremendous amounts of money. The money that Massachusetts has saved that I illustrated, we're sending that to oil companies. The oil companies should be thanking us for our, our failure to do energy efficiency. Thank you, Representative Mann. Representative Homola. 
Thank you, Chair. I just want to comment on something that Representative Mann just said, saying that if for some reason the PUC has this authority to set rates and the legislature has the oversight to that, and if we see that there's any issues with that, we can step in and propose a bill to, um, to change those rates, then we're right back to square one. So the, the authority ultimately lies with the legislation or the legislature, not with the PUC. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Representative Callie Pitts. I've been uh, dealing with energy efficiency since my landlord told me at one point, not my current landlord, that the ice on the inside of the window was really insulation. Um, and we've we've come from duct tape and plastic to really knowing what insulating a home is and what it would save. I truly believe, and I and I sat I sat in on many discussions because I've been here as long as Moses that we couldn't do it as a legislature. We didn't have the expertise to sit down and go through everything that is in, that's entailed in the SBC and how much it should be and what. So we, as a legislature, ceded that authority to the PUC. And at this point, I think that's the place where it stays. I don't know if anybody, I was on electric oversight and all kinds of, I don't know if anybody is qualified to gen those numbers. And, I, and I, I don't think we are and what we need. Uh, I've sat here and heard testimony that there were 25,000 people on the waiting list. Now that's gone down quite a bit, I do believe, but still more is needed. And even new homes, it's needed because new homes are not always energy efficient. So I would say that this is a really important program but it should not be in the hands of the legislature because then every two years it can change. I think we need some consistency, we need some stability, and that's why we should do this and do it properly. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cretion. Thank you, Chair Both. Um, I think I'm mainly just echoing what other people have said, but I do believe that as wonderful as our 400 person legislature is in terms of breadth of expertise. Um, we don't have the depth of expertise needed to do something as specific as rate setting. Um, there's many, many places in the government where the legislature has delegated rulemaking authority to um, to other, <laughs> other bodies um, completely appropriately. And uh, yeah, I will not be voting to ITL this. I feel like this is an appropriate delegation of responsibility. Okay, thank you, uh, Representative Oxenham. Yes, if, if I may just turn to RSA 21119A for the moment, where the policy of New Hampshire is set out with regards to uh, state agencies. <clears throat> it shall be the policy of the state of New Hampshire to prioritize public health and environmental quality while maximizing economic benefits through the use of economical energy efficiency measures including but not limited to, and then it goes through the laundry list of all the different energy efficiency measures that are available to us. Then going on to say, and it shall be the policy of the state to encourage municipalities to incorporate such measures into their properties to the greatest extent possible. What energy efficiency about is about saving money why anyone would want to possibly not save money, but waste money, I don't understand. Why anyone would want to send $4 billion of our state's money out of state. We don't produce any fossil fuels. We have renewable energy businesses in this state. We have renewable energy jobs and energy efficiency jobs. Investing in those measures grows our economy, grows our wealth. I cannot understand why anyone would support this bill. It hurts our jobs, it hurts our economy, 
it hurts our environment, and it reduces our wealth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to uh, comment and uh, build on what uh, Representative Oxman has said. Uh, you read the statute, uh, statutory requirements about it being the legislature's responsibility to set public policy. We are capable of doing that and advising that and presenting that position to the broader legislature for its approval. We don't have to make technical decisions. When we have technical issues, we can defer those to technical bodies. But we are the body to make that policy and set the policy and determine how much of whatever we're going to do needs to be done. So I, I think this bill is totally in order and totally coincident with that fundamental philosophy. Thank you, uh, Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to, to that point, to Representative Campbell's point, I think that's the crux of the matter, right? The bill is about who should have the authority to determine the system benefits charge. And it's getting a little confusing because we're talking about ITLing a bill, right? So um, what I wanted to say about the argument of whose hands it belongs in is we're the ones that gave rate setting to the Public Utilities Commission. Yep. And now we're saying we should take it back from the Public Utilities Commission. And I think the point that we're trying to make is that the legislature tends to be a political body, which means that our perception of what should go through and what should be stopped changes frequently, which is why the PUC is not a bureaucratic agency. The PUC has a stronger mission and mandate than we do to keep politics out of it and serve the masters of least cost, greatest benefit, you know, to the most people. They're less political than we are in terms of how they implement their role in the rate setting process and do everything above board in a, in a public and adjudicative proceeding, which is not the same as us arbitrarily taking a vote on yay or nay based on our political parties, which happens a lot. So I would, I would ask that Representative Campbell understand that we're not taking it out of the hands of a bureaucratic body. We're really putting it in the hands of a bureaucratic body by ITLing the idea uh, that's set forth in 119. So I think we have different perspectives on that clearly but rather than just argue the benefits of energy efficiency, we should understand that we gave this authority to the Public Utilities Commission because that is all they do. And we don't do this. So giving it back to us seems to be uh, setting us back backwards. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Brezhny. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to just build on the analogy uh, that uh, Mr. Somsich uh, gave with a patient going to the surgeon instead of uh, performing the surgery themselves. Um, when you do go to the surgeon, the surgeon doesn't just start operating on you, right? There's, there's a communication. There's, um, uh, the, the, the surgeon explains what's going to happen and then asks for your approval or permission to start you know, performing this surgery. Uh, the same thing happens with the PUC. The PUC will, is the professional and they will determine what needs to happen and, and will explain that. And then the legislature can confirm uh, what needs to happen. Thank you. Uh, rep no. Representative McGee, did you have your hand? No, you put, took it down. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Representative Callie Pitts. I, I, I guess I didn't understand the last um, speaker because that would seem to me like, okay, public utilities, you do the work, you do the adjudication, you do what you're gonna do now, and then either the legislature will rub, rub a stamp or negate what you're doing, even though we don't have the evidence and the proof and the numbers. That's what I heard. Can you correct me if I heard that wrong? Uh, 
Oh, I was just comparing it to going to a surgeon. I mean, the surgeon is not going to tell you every single detail of what they're going to do, but they will explain the pros and cons and let you make the decision. So I assume the PUC would do the same. I would just okay, thank say, you. okay, I'm not going to. Okay, I have received an email right, uh, from uh, represent, uh, from uh, Michael Fitzgerald from uh, DES. I only need it when I'm active, but uh, if I'm okay, sitting and walking slowly, I can do without it. Craig, I just, mu I just muted him. Um, I've received a, an email from uh, Michael uh, Fitzgerald at DES. He would like to comment on the next bill that we're going to be hearing, which is HB 373. And he has to leave for another meeting. So we need to start the public hearing on HB 373 promptly so that we can uh, recognize Mr. Fitzgerald as uh, I think it's a courtesy for us to allow him to speak on that bill uh, so that he can get to the other meeting the that he has. I, under I understand that. So I, I'm, I'm just explaining to the committee right now why why i'm going to cut off further discussion on this bill so that we can take a vote okay so that we can finish this executive session on time and start the next public hearing on time to give mr fitzgerald a chance to speak and still make his subsequent meeting okay. so uh having said that i would like to call on the clerk now to call the roll on the question before the committee, which is ITL on HB 119. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. On bill HB 119, motion of ITL, Representative Thomas. Yes. Representative Harrington. You get here so I can get back in the picture. I guess I'm there. Yes. Uh, I vote, uh, yes for ITL. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Werner. Yes. Representative Homola. Yes. Representative Bresney. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Kembrose. Yes. Representative Plosier. Yes. Representative Lang. Yes. Representative Sompsage. No. Representative Callie Pitts. No. Representative Mann. No, no. Representative Oxenham. No. Representative Vincent, not here. Representative McGee. No. Representative McWilliams. No. Representative Cretion. No. Representative Pimentel. No. And Representative Paschel. No. And Chairman votes. Yes. The ITL stands 11 9, 1 not voting. So, Representative Cambrils, you'll be responsible for producing a, a majority report. Will there be a minority report, Representative Somsich? Uh Yes, there will be. I'll let you know, Mr. Chairman. You'll give me the uh, assigned writer. Yeah, uh, later. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. And with that, um, we'll close the executive session on HB 119. And we will take a six minute break before we start the uh, public hearing on House Bill 373. After the introduction of the bill, I will call on Mike Fitzgerald to be the first person to speak after the introduction. We'll see you back here exactly at four o'clock. Seems like a waste of six minutes. <clears throat> Sometimes you just have to go.
Mr. Chair, you're muted. I can hear myself. It doesn't look like I'm muted. Um, well, it does show that I'm muted, doesn't it? Okay. I guess uh, now I hear an echo. What happened, uh, Representative Bresney? Can you tell? Our tech guys 
probably the nearness of the next laptop that's creating the echo that usually can't be right next to each other when you're got your mic on. It's just the room that needed to be unmuted. And Representative Volos, you can keep your, your device muted. Um, the room is unmuted now. The room is unmuted. Okay. My device is muted. So are we okay now? We can hear you. Okay. All right. So are there any questions that um, representative, I mean, uh, that Michael Fitzgerald from DES can answer before he has to leave to go to another appointment? Uh, Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Mr. Fitzgerald. The question that I have is if this bill passes, whether it would inhibit your department from doing its job. Uh, well, thank you for the question, and um, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for your consideration in allowing me to uh, to respond uh, due to my uh, next commitment. Uh, the uh, department uh, has previously participated in these type of activities um, solely from the standpoint of being able to inform our executive, uh, chief executive, the governor, the governor's office and staff and the legislature as to what these regional activities are and how they might impact New Hampshire. An example would be the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative where we participated for several years. We were the last state to actually sign on and we did not sign on until uh, actually uh, after the first auction had begun. Um, and that, uh, that was because we were unsure of the impact on New Hampshire and uh, what our participation would mean. We were able to get a report, get a study and get information provided uh, to then Governor Lynch to recommend that um, New Hampshire's best interests would be served by participating um, because we would be uh, better off being in and receiving the, re the funds as has been in expressed this committee many times. So our participation in these regional discussions, although it's not directly required by statute or anything, is just uh, simply to, uh, to better inform the legislature as to what the potential impacts would be. Um, in the case of the low carbon fuel, there was some news media uh, about this last fall that uh, seemed to imply that we had spent uh, a significant amount of funding after the governor had directed the state not to participate. Um, that I just want to clarify that uh, some of that, that um, my letter clarifies that that information, the uh, amount expended was expended between 2012 and now, and that uh, that was all relative to our participation in these ongoing discussions to determine what the nature of the program was. Last fall, we were not able to recommend to the governor that we, that we should participate because we did not believe that the impacts had been, uh, common, uh, had been quantified. And uh, we advised the governor's office not to sign on to the, uh, to the MOU. Um, so uh, that's the role that we've been playing. This was recognized in 2012. There was another bill to prevent us from participating in LCFS discussions at the time. Senator Bradley brokered a compromise that allowed us to participate in the discussions, but not to be able to bring any, uh, any program forward. And that's the current statute as it exists now is that um, uh, we would not bring any, any, uh, any program forward um, uh, or, or attempt to sign New Hampshire on to participation without the uh, appropriate legislative authority, which is the way it stands currently for, uh, for Reggie. So that's, uh, and I, I would also just note that the expenses that were um, uh, reported as in accordance with the statute were expenses of staff, uh, staff time, which um, those expenses and hours were attributed to this but they were not over and above or in addition to any, any uh, staff time. Um, they were uh, staff that were allocated to participate in this based on uh, the direction of prior governors uh, to better understand these, these discussions. And um, uh, we, we did participate, uh, but the, that, those funds would have been allocated and, and used uh, in any case, these were not expenditures 
over and above our budget. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. What is your time constraint? What time do you need to leave? Uh, I'm uh, 4.30 or so. If, uh, if, I, if I could leave by 4.15, that'd be fine, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer as many questions as, I, as is possible. I'd... Okay. Uh, Representative Thomas, do you have a question for Mr. Fitzgerald? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald, for taking my question. Real quick, was your staff's participation in, in this um, for the last, uh, say, couple, three, four, five years, was it voluntary or did the governor um, express or insinuate that he would like you to attend these meetings? Uh, prior governors, uh, uh, Governor Hassan uh, in particular, um, had, uh, uh, we, uh, again, we, we consult with the governor's office all the time on these type of activities that come up on a regional basis. Um, they had expressed an interest and we, we, uh, we were participating. We continued that. We had no specific direction from Governor Sununu, but we were able to advise him um, that based on the information that we had and our participation in the discussions, two things. One, we had um, uh, been able to, to represent New Hampshire's interests in the design and development of a program, but two, we were not able to determine that um, uh, any impact on New Hampshire would be either positive or negative the way that we had been in Reggie. And so therefore um, we recommended, we could not recommend to the governor to sign on to the MOU signed by the other states. And as you'll notice in our letter, New Hampshire did not ultimately sign on and the governor ultimately determined that he would not participate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Oxenham, you have a question for Mr. Fitzgerald. I actually didn't think I was next, but um, uh, yes, thank you. Mr. Fitzgerald, does it make sense to you that a state which is part of a regional electricity grid, which is part of a regional cap and trade program, which has many interests in common with the states that surround it, should not participate and not discuss issues of regional concern. And, and if that is too personal a question, I, I, I apologize, but I, I honestly, I cannot understand anyone putting forward this bill. Well, thank, thank you. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the reasonable answer to that is that um, we want to be aware of what's going on around us. I would draw some distinction between the electricity grid. This program was a fuel program, but there is a regional fuel distribution system uh, so analogous to the electricity grid. Uh, New Hampshire does not have the opportunity to, to impact that um, regional fuel distribution system overly much because the amount of fuel we use is relatively small. Uh, again, similar to the uh, to the electricity grid, but we feel that being at the table, uh, we're at least able to protect our state's interests and concerns as expressed by the governor, uh, whoever the governor may be at the time, and that um, uh, we 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 carry those into those discussions, and we we hope and believe that uh, that our opinion and and our governor's concerns are heard and reflected in the development of the program. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Representative Somsich. You have a question for Mr. Fitzgerald. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald, for taking my question. Um, first of all, I want to say that in the past, I have made extensive use of your staff on various issues that I was less informed about. And I always got very good information and very good solid backing for uh, what they what they uh, support it. And so my question goes to this. Um, in the future, I mean, if this bill were to pass, don't you think that it would impact the kind of advice you can give this committee and others of us who go to you for advice, if you're being cut out of the discussion? Well, again, this is a regional discussion. And uh, uh, as I said, we would never take the step of trying to uh, commit New Hampshire to anything without the legislature 
Bruce's involvement. That was how Reggie came about. The governor agreed that we should bring it forward. We brought it forward and the legislature agreed. Um, uh, our, our participation in these discussions, I, I do believe, is, is of value to the, to the legislature um, so that they can better understand whether or not they, they think that um, uh, we should be participating in these things. I will say, since the governor's announcement, we have not been participating in TCI discussions except to a very limited extent um, because uh, uh, the governor uh, determined that we would not be part of that pact. Um, but if we, we do get some briefings, we do continue to, to hear some discussion. And if something were to change in the design of the program, <coughs> where we felt it was necessary to advise the governor that there would be an impact to New Hampshire, <coughs> the, uh, a negative impact to not participating, I guess that's a double negative, but uh, um, we, would, we would then so advise. But it would be, again, a decision of the governor as to whether we brought it forward to the legislature and um, it would be a decision of the legislature as to whether or not to, uh, to approve New Hampshire's participation. Thank you, uh, Representative Callie Pitts. You have a question for Mr. Fitzgerald. Yes, Mr. Fitzgerald, thank you for taking my question. I, I'm gonna make a statement first. I just think this is a gag order. There's a song that's go, that comes from Hamilton in the room is it better to be in the room and hear things firsthand or to get your information either on paper or without discussion and without input? Do you consider that as good? And the second part of that question would be, does participating in these particular events cost an exorbitant amount of money? Well, as you can see, uh, we the expenses you, you can see the expenses we did report. Again, those are personnel expenditures that would have been incurred one way or another. They're not over and above our budget. They weren't additional. Um, uh, staff were allocated to the uh, to participate in these discussions uh, based on uh, the interest of the governor's office, um, both prior gov uh, governors and and the uh, uh, the current governor. Um, we. Uh, we were able, we were able to pro properly advise him. We feel, um, I think, one in answer to your question um, about being in or out, being in, we are able to bring New Hampshire's interests to the table. We are able to, uh, uh, you know, ensure that there's some consideration. Ultimately, our decision may be to participate or not participate, um, and whether or not those factors that we bring forward. But I do believe that we've had an outsized uh, influence, uh, for instance, in Reggie, and we've been able to negotiate things that we think were important to keep, a, a, you know, to uh, a, a keep the program uh, meeting the needs of the uh, of the citizens of New Hampshire and continuing to receive the legislative approval. And I think it's the same with this. If we're there, we're able to to carry New Hampshire's interests forward. If not, they're not heard or considered. Can I follow up? Follow up very quickly. Um, it, this bill specifically designates Department of Environmental Services, shall not. Are there any other departments or offices in the state of New Hampshire that are designated to participate in these discussions? Uh, we have been the primary participant. Uh, we, if there's a need, we consult with the Department of Transportation, um, uh, and we have at times. Um, we've also discussed and consulted with uh, uh, what was the Governor's Office of Energy. Now I believe it's OSI. Um, so um, we, we have been the primary participant at the table. Um, under Reggie, there's two participants for the state. There's the PUC and the state of New Hampshire that are authorized to participate in the uh, program and discussions. And um, uh, in, in this case, uh, this is just an idea at this time. It's an initiative. It's not, ha hasn't been, no pact has been formed. An MOU right. was proposed. We did not sign on to the MOU. Um, but uh, um, we believe our in the state's interests were, were at least heard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Fitzgerald has expressed a desire to leave uh, anytime uh, between 4.15 and 4.30. So take that into consideration as you contemplate questions. Uh, Representative um, Parshall. 
No, Representative Cretion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald, for taking my questions. I'll be really quick. Um, can you think of, off the top of your head, a benefit to not participating? A in the benefit to, discussions? Uh, again, we have not been involved in the development discussions since last fall, since the governor's announcement last fall. So I'm not familiar with the, where the where the program is headed. But at the time, it was a cap and invest program. Um, it seems seems possible to me that there would be some charge um, associated with fuel usage uh, on a regional basis and that um, the uh, return on investment would be allocated to the states. So it's possible that it might that this could be analogous to Reggie. But um, again, we're not party to those discussions anymore. And I, I couldn't say what the actual program design is is. Um, coming to look like at this point in time. We, we've not continued our participation since la the governor's announcement last fall. We did not sign the MOU, so the states have not invited us to continue to participate. Thank you, uh, Representative Harrington. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, Mike, just a quick question. Um, you're saying that as of right now, effective for the rest of this year, if nothing happens, you will not spend any time or effort being involved in this thing because once the governor made his statement, you basically stepped out of it? That is correct. And if you look at our expense allocation in our testimony letter, you'll see that it declined dramatically. Um, we may have a few hours here and there participating in calls that are open to us just to, again, to, to hear what the direction and the thinking is and so on. But um, our participation at this point is... Uh, um, almost nothing. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, for making yourself available to um, answer questions. And I would like to also point out to the rest of the committee that Mr. Fitzgerald and I have been discussing a time when we could have DES come in and make a presentation to the committee. It's uh, difficult to schedule such a time right now, but we're hoping that um, maybe by early March or certainly by early April, we'll be able to find such time. So Mr. D, Mr. Fitzgerald will be back with other members of DES to give us a, a full committee presentation. So thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman for accommodating me and we look forward to uh, providing you with any information that uh, you might feel is relevant. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to uh, uh, the next speaker on our list and that would be, uh, Greg Moore from Americans for Prosperity. Mr. Moore, you're on. Point of order, Mr. Chair. We, we did not hear from the sponsor of the bill because of Mr. Fitzgerald's need to go first. That's not correct. We actually heard an introduction from Janine Notter on the, the contents of the bill and the rationale for its introduction. I'm sorry if you missed that. Uh, represent um, Greg Moore, you're uh, recognized to speak. We did. This bill was not introduced properly, Mr. Chairman. I didn't hear I didn't hear any such introduction. And so I, did you hear Janine Notter speak? Representative Janine Notter? I, I think that you were muted and I think she was muted. I think we thought you were just talking in the room during the break. Yeah. Your thing. Okay, I was just informed that the room was muted, apparently by accident. Okay. So Representative Nutter, could you reintroduce the bill? Thank you very much. Take two. I have to find my notes because I gave them to him. Sorry. You gave them back. All right, a little background first. In 2012, the New Hampshire legislature passed a law that New Hampshire shall not join, implement, or participate in any state, regional, or national low carbon fuel standards program or any similar program that requires quotas, caps, or mandates on any fuels used for transportation, industrial purposes, or home heating without seeking prior legislative approval. The Transportation Climate Initiative is a regressive gas tax that increases, I'm sorry, is a regressive gas tax increase 
that harms those who can least afford it, like the elderly on fixed incomes, the working poor, or those who commute to work, like my adult children do. They cannot afford to have to pay more at the gas pump. It's unfair to place this burden on their backs. It's no secret that I despise tax increases, and it's never just for one thing. It causes increases to everything connected to it. Nearly every product that we buy at the store is delivered by trucks. TCI would drive up the cost of goods because it will cost more to run the trucks that deliver them. The increase is then passed along to the consumers. TCI would raise those taxes for years to come. However, unlike in the legislature, where our constituents can hold us accountable for tax increases that hurt them in the wallet, TCI shifts the responsibility of raising gas taxes to an unelected and unaccountable board. The public deserves the right to know and hold responsible the people who are taking money out of their pocket. Governor Sununu has confirmed that we will not be joining the Transportation Climate Initiative but the TCI website shows that New Hampshire is a participant. And the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services has spent close to $50,000, I have the chart, since 2012 to study the proposals that our state is banned from entering because the law still allows them to do so. House Bill 373 will take out six words and replace them with, we shall not participate, to save Granite Staters some of their hard-earned money. It should be the simplest bill we vet all year. I ask you to support House Bill 373 and pull the plug on TCI and stop having DES staff from wasting time and money on a program in which the state will not be participating. Okay, thank you, uh, Representative Nodder, and my apologies to the committee for not realizing that the, mun the room was muted, one of the uh, many vagaries of doing community, uh, committee meetings using Zoom. So are there any questions for Representative Nodder? Uh, Representative Somsich, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Representative Nodder, for taking my question. Uh, I heard from you your motivation for this bill and but I don't see how this is anything about TCI. TCI is currently an initiative and not really a, a fleshed out proposal. And so to, to rail against it at this point makes no sense to me. So my question to you is, uh, wh why should we not even have a discussion? Why should we not have information? We don't have to buy into it, but we should be informed what's going on. The other states around us together have a bigger influence on New England than we do, and we will be dragged along unless we're at the table. Why shouldn't we have discussions and information exchange? Because it will, TCI will raise the gas tax, and it's gonna keep going up, and you know how I feel about taxes. And um, I'm Right, lost my train of thought here, I'm sorry. Um, oh, they, I have the chart of how much money they spent. I mean, I'm sure that the TCI has reports they could read without using the resources that could go to something else. Follow up, Mr. Chairman? Follow up. Well, again, you refer to TCI and we should be supporting it, but no, one's, no one has finalized that proposal. It's like, the draft of a treaty that you, you're saying, I'm not gonna ratify even though it's not completed. Why, why shouldn't we be at the table until we have to make a decision? Because it costs money to do that. And I ran as a fiscal conservative to try and lower um, spending as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative uh, McGee is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative Nada, for taking my question. Um, I think us going back and forth about which programs are pending uh, that might be affected by this change uh, is, is, you know, separate and distinct from what this change actually does, because it's basically not saying New Hampshire isn't going to participate in any low carbon programs. It's saying that our Department of Environmental Services 
is prevented from having any involvement and can't do any planning and can't do any discussions with any other states in the region. And my concern or my question to you is, to me, the Department of Environmental Services is a resource to us because they have information that we need. And if we are telling them they can no longer participate in securing that information, aren't we, to go back to my original question to Mike Fitzgerald, aren't we preventing them from doing their job? And, and, uh, and the one caveat I just wanna say, I participated in the Emissions Commission over the summer with Senator Bradley and others and the Department of Environmental Services provided a really wonderful presentation to us where they uh, were able to give us information we would not otherwise have had about um, how the state has worked on lowering its emissions, where we're at on that trajectory, and that we're going to level off basically in 2021 without, um, without additional um, policies to affect that, that downward trajectory that we've been on. They are the people who provide that information and a lot of what they were giving us had to be separated from what are other states doing, what's happening in the region, what's New Hampshire doing. They can't do that if they, if they can't work with anybody else, if they're prevented from, from doing that work. So I, that's what I don't understand is the words in this bill say, the Department of Environmental Services shall not participate in discussions or planning for any programs. So it's not specific to TCI. It basically says anything to do with us addressing uh, our environmental responsibility on, on emissions. Uh, they can no longer provide us with that information because they, they can't get it. They can't work on it. I just don't understand what the, what the impetus is. Because like they said, once the governor said we're not doing TCI, they, they're not working on it. Um, so this goes further. This basically says it's a gag rule. So, so is there a question there, Representative yeah, McGee? I don't understand how they're supposed to do their job with this gag rule. That was a very long, long question. I got lost in it somewhere, but they're spending money on a program that we're not going to be a part of. So why spend the money? Well, we're paying them to do a job for us, and this inhibits them from doing the job. That's the way I see it. Remember, That's we're not here to debate. We're here to ask questions, remember? I understand. I understand. And it's the same question that I asked at the beginning. Is the Department of Environmental Services going to be inhibited from doing their job, which we pay them to do, by not being able to ask questions or participate? Okay. In that question was asked and answered. Thank you. So okay. uh, next up is uh, Representative Cretion. Mr. Chairman, I did not hear anyone answer that question. That's why I'm posing it again. I did not hear anyone answer I that heard question. you ask that question of Mike Fitzgerald when he was here, and he answered it. Okay. So why ask it again? I didn't hear him answer Representative Cretion, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Nader, for taking my question. Um, so understanding that your concern is that we are spending um, we might be spending money that we don't have or don't want to spend. Are there any concerns that not being uh, participating in these discussions or planning of programs might actually cost us money in the long run if things are happening that we're not aware of that we need to uh, catch up with or, or that we're going to be impacted by? I'm going to ref, um, defer your question to um, the next speaker that's coming on, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, Representative Callie Pitts, you're recognized for a question. Yeah, I think my question is going to be referred, but I have another question for Representative Nodder. Representative Nodder, why didn't you say that no department shall not shall not participate in discussions. Why target DES? Because we know that there are probably other people in the administration that could do this. So it seems to me that um, DES is targeted. Could you tell me why? Because those are the figures that I have on how much they, they have spent. I don't have the figures from other departments. If they're out there, then I will address it in another bill. May I follow up? Follow up. What does it cost for people to listen and gain knowledge 
just like sitting here, what does it cost me to listen and gain knowledge? I, I don't understand that. Is that what we're saying? That it costs too much to listen? I, I'm, that's a legitimate question because it seems to me that they cannot participate or commit the state to anything, but they can listen and gain knowledge of what's going on around us and maybe what we should be doing. Okay, you've asked the question. Can uh, Representative Nader respond? You're asking what it costs? It, well, and 2012, it cost $914.27. In 2013, $182.57. In 2014, $533. 2015, $421.53. 2017, $3,205.10. 2018, it was $3,055.15. 2019, they spent $38,980.43. And then in 2020, $455.93. That adds up to $47,747.98 to listen to a, a program that we're not going to be a part of. Okay, uh, Representative Cretion, you have another question? I do, thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering with those numbers, can you give any insight as to why um, in some years it was only like $100 and in other years it jumped to 3,000? What, what was the difference there? That would be a question for Mr. Fitzgerald. I suspect it, it has to do with how often the TCI uh, committee was meeting and how often D DES uh, listened into those meetings. But Mr. Fitzgerald would know for sure. Uh, Representative Jackie Kelly Pitts, you have another question? I, I'm sorry, no, I, I, I'm i gonna go back to Mr. Fitzgerald's statement where he said that's not money that they would not have spent anyway because that's money they apportion to people. So they have to account where the people were spending that money and it's money that would have been spent. I just wanted to clarify that. That's what's his testimony. Okay, thank you. All thank right, you. so seeing no further questions for Representative, oh, Representative Ploche, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to Representative Nader, may I? <clears throat> this, uh, Representative Nader, um, can you build paragraph two? I'm sorry, I can't hear you very well. Get closer to the microphone, please. In, this, in the bill 373, uh, line three, shall not participate in discussions or planning of such program. Is it your intention that DES could not discuss any information they received from other states in DCS meetings? No, I'm just watching the wallets. <clears throat> Follow up. Follow up. <clears throat> so the way I'm reading this, if it doesn't need any clarification, they are not to participate in the program's discussions or plans with the program, but they can still receive an information into DCS and discuss it internally. Is that correct? I believe so. Thank you. What it says. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further questions from the committee, we'll move on to our next speaker. And I'd like to call on Greg Moore from Americans for Prosperity, New Hampshire. Mr. Moore, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Excellent. Always, always a good idea to test before you just leave empty amounts of dead air. Uh, for, the, for the record, my name is Greg Moore. I am the state director with Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire. And uh, if it's okay with the indulgence of the chair, would it be okay if I gave a little bit of the history involved with uh, this particular program? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, so the history of, the, of this program dates back to 2009 when three commissioners, uh, our commissioners of, of then commissioners of transportation, uh, the Public Utility Commission and Dep Department of uh, Environmental Services signed a MOA, a Memorandum of Agreement, to begin moving forward on a program relative to low carbon fuel standards uh, uh, to, to seek to reduce transportation emissions. 
Uh, now, at, at the time, that, that's what it was, it was about low car, carbon fuel standards, which mostly were focused on uh, auto and, and, and gas standards, things such as California emission styles or, or actual blends of gasoline. That was the initial intent of moving forward. And now, in 2012, when I was serving as the chief of staff of the House of Representatives, uh, there, was a, there was legislation brought forward, which is now seen before you, which is 21023. That was House Bill 1487 back then. Uh, the speaker and the majority leader were on the bill, so obviously I had a, a keen interest in it. And uh, that basically uh, took the approach and, and the, the, the view that the legislature should be the policy-making body, not the executive branch, unlike Congress who uh, likes to outsource policy making to, to the executive branch. Here in New Hampshire, the legislature historically has been the, the organization and the entity driving policy. So uh, that back in 2012, and, and as uh, Mr. Fitzgerald pointed out, the, the Senate made a change to, to ensure that DES could continue to have the opportunity to, uh, to discuss those plans, to make sure that, that we could have a chance to voice any concerns we, we might have. Well, fast forward seven years, and now the low carbon fuel standards morphed into a regional cap and trade plan. Functionally, it would work like a secondary gas tax, a gas and diesel tax administered by a third party in a ma manner similar to REGI. However, an important distinction for REGI between REGI and the Transportation Climate Initiative, or TCI, would have the ability to add or eliminate credits without authorization from the participating states, meaning it functionally would have no, uh, no direct oversight by the legislature. This means a TCI could increase or decrease a secondary tax uh, with no votes by the general court. Whereas with REGI, uh, as, as the, many of this committee know, when, when the number of credits is going to be increased or reduced, it requires approval of the various participa participating states. Um, and using, using REGI's, I mean, using TCI's own numbers, uh, but between 2022, so next year, and, 2030, uh, and 2032, so, so over that 10 year period, vehicle emissions will drop by 19% just by cars getting better mileage and uh, switch over to electric vehicles. Uh, during the initial rollout of TCA, TCI back in December of 2019, uh, the planning efforts suggested that TCI would further re reduce those emissions by between one and 6% for a, a total uh, emission reduction in the transportation sector of 20 to 25% when you add in the 19% that was already coming down the pike. Now, TCI estimated uh, that that would translate into a gas price increase of between five and 17 cents a gallon. However, uh, a detailed study by Tufts University that came out last year suggested a th just a 3% reduction by, uh, by TCI as a, uh, or an overall reduction of about 22% would result in a 24 cent per gallon in increase in the price of gas. So we were talking about a substantial hit at the pump. And, and, and by the way, that's by design. Uh, since the stated goal is to reduce the use of gasoline and diesel by, make, by making it uneconomical. And so last month, three states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, announced that they were signing an MOU uh, at an admissions reduction target of 7% or 26% overall when you add the 19% in, which is more than the double the 3% figure that the Tufts study used. Um, and, and moreover, that MOU is actually a concrete MOU. It's, it's not, a, um, it's, it's not a, a hypothetical, it is a, a fairly concrete MOU. Uh, I have spent a fair amount of time listening in to the, the TCI discussions. One thing I'll say about them, they are incredibly transparent. They are open uh, and those discussions are open for any, anyone to participate in. And uh, I've, I've read through the MOU for this, uh, from the, the, the states, the three states uh, south of us have signed. And, uh, and that, that is gonna have a substantial impact uh, going to that 7% uh, reduction of emissions on the price of gas and diesel in those states. Uh, come 2022. Now, uh, a couple things to keep in mind is that, is that, um, you, you know, at, at the at the very least, I think Representative Nard is concerned about the, the actual impact that, that the pump is a significant one. However, it's also important to understand that when a state like state like New Hampshire starts using those resources to go and, and engage in these planning efforts, those are resources that are not used elsewhere. Um, as a former director at DHHS, I've had a fair amount of experience of uh, understanding at, when you allocate staff to a goal, those, there are things that that staff can no longer otherwise do. So DES 
cannot otherwise do a number of other things if its staff is going to be heavily focused on something like the planning and implementation of, of a program like TCI. So for those reasons, uh, we support House Bill 373. Uh, this is an issue that, again, that I've had a long history with, and I'd be happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moore. We do have some questions. First up is uh, Representative Sompsich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Moore, for taking my question. Uh, Mr. Moore, um, did you help and assist in drafting this bill? Uh, did I help and assist in drafting this legislation? I, I did have conversations with Representative Nodder um, at, the, at the early, when, when she first brought it to me, yes. Thank you follow up, Mr. Chairman? Follow up. And uh, your organization, the Americans for Prosperity, uh, nationwide is well known as a lobbyist group for big oil. Isn't that correct? No, that's not accurate. How would you describe your organization? Our, our, our organization is, is a uh, grassroots uh, focused citizen organization in New Hampshire. We have over 51,000 individuals who, who to take action with our organization. And, uh, and, and we are, we are uh, definitely focused on a whole host of issues. Uh, energy being a very, very, very small one relative to the uh, focus of a whole host of other areas, including uh, tax policy, spending, uh, worker freedom, uh, criminal justice reform and issues like that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Representative Pimentel. You're recognized for a question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, uh, Mr. Moore, you stated that the uh, the talks at TCI are very open, and that uh, anyone can listen in to what's going on. And I guess my question is, why do we not want DES to listen in too, if it's so open? Thank you for the question. Uh, again, there, there is an opportunity cost. Uh, the time and energy that, that is used and utilized to put focus on it, on these planning efforts is time where the staff cannot otherwise engage in other uh, ways of assisting New Hampshire residents of Resolving other issues they have before the department. The, you know, again, it is not. It's not an. It, there is not an infinite amount of, of time available. Uh, staff staff resources are limited, and when, when you take resources away from from one area to put it in another, that other area is is lessened by that. So, without question, uh, again, as someone who who's worked in the executive branch here in the state of New Hampshire, I have seen it firsthand. Uh, if you if you the more tasks you give folks. Either, either other tasks are not going to be done as well or other tasks are not going to be done. Thank you, follow up. So why are you listening in? Because, because the, uh, the uh, impact of, of TCI would be substantial on the, uh, the, the motorists of New Hampshire. It would have a, a huge impact at the pump and, and an impact that would continue to go up year, year over year, the, the stated goal of TCI is that they want to make the price of gas and diesel uneconomical to, to get people to shift their, their habits to other modes of transportation, whether that be public transit or other, other areas. But fundamentally, uh, their goal is to change the marketplace and, and the way they envision doing that is through, is through making uh, the use of gas and diesel uneconomical. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Representative Callie Pitts. Don't forget to unmute. Mr. Moore, I want to thank you for your information, which I gather you have gleaned from extensive listening. Um, I wonder, can you, because what I, I think has been implied, can you explain? Give me one instance where DES has neglected to perform its duties because that's what it sounds like. I, I, Representative Nada's figures were pretty quick with me, but I think they around sixty thousand dollars or so. If I quickly added them up in my head, but maybe less. Can you 
Give me an instance where you believe that funds have been misdirected. Representative Callie Pitts, that question doesn't relate to the substance of the bill. It certainly does, Mr. Chair. I beg to differ with you because what I'm hearing is that because we spend money on this program or on learning about this program, we can't spend money doing that program. And that's what was said. And I think that was the reason given by Mrs. Miss Nodder. And I Mrs. Nodder, and I think that was the reason that I just heard from Mr. Moore. So I want to know that because if if he believes that funds are being misdirected because we're spending too much time giving information or seeking information, then I think perhaps we ought to know about that. And I- Well, if he, if he said that, that, then why are you asking the question again? Because I wanna know if he can give me an instance where that's, if this is an allegation, I wanna know if he can give me an instance. All right, I'll allow it. Go ahead, Mr. Moore. Representative Kelly Pitts, thanks for the question. Uh, the 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 answer is, as I mentioned, it's it's a matter of overall resource allocation. Uh, and and if you're asking for a specific instance in the in the uh, air division of DES, I certainly I certainly would would encourage people to talk to people about the Shoreland Protection Division. That's a whole separate question. But I, I suspect that the, it's different personnel from Shoreland Protection and then over at Air. But uh, at at as far as a specific instance, I don't, but I do know that there is a that there is a finite amount of work that you can ask a finite amount of staff to do, and those staffers, uh, when they are diverted to one area, they cannot do other work. That doesn't mean necessarily that that someone necessarily was left without any services. But what it means is they they could have perhaps gotten better or quicker services. The turnaround times on permits, for example. Who knows how long perhaps it might, they might have moved faster had, had more resources been dedicated towards that. But, but in a management position at, at a large state agency like DES is, you are constantly focused on the allocation of, of the time resources of your staff. It is a critical component to having a, a, any sort of successful, uh, successful effort. And when, when, you're, when you're coming and dealing with as many legislative mandates as you as the folks on this committee give these these uh, these individuals, they cannot continue to do everything and and not have something suffer for lack of resources. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have four more people who have signed up to speak, so I would just remind everyone of that. And it is currently nine minutes before five, and the speaker has asked us to exit the building at five o'clock. So keep that in mind as you ask your questions. Representative McGee, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Moore, for taking my question. Um, you just represented TCI's mission as making gas uneconomical. And when I heard about the TCI regional initiative, what I heard was that they were looking at the uh, transportation sector as the next large sector that they wanted to address in terms of lowering emissions. And for some of us, we're still looking at the environmental impacts and cost of us not participating and also not addressing what is happening because of those emissions. So I, I want to know if you can answer for us since you presented this from your perspective, if you can actually tell us any more about that perspective, because you, you said that that Americans for, for Prosperity is a grassroots organization, but how are you funded? Uh, we are funded by over 100,000 donors. Um, a number here in, in New Hampshire, uh, probably about uh, 1,500 here in New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, that I, I understand that that's not germane to the legislation. I would, I would like to correct one thing. I, I hope that I didn't give the impression that it is their mission to make gas and diesel uneconomical, uh, but it is their intent. And I, I understand that's an important distinction between a mission and an intent, but they, yeah. but they, they, they don't, they, they don't uh, mince words about that. They, they realize that, that the way to get there, or they believe the way to get there is not through mandates. In fact, that's how, where they began. They began the process uh, of doing low carbon fuel standards of actually doing mandates. And they felt as though a better, a better vehicle would be to, would be to make uh, gas and diesel less economical as a more effective strategy of actually reducing emissions than 
than, than doing things that they had initially proposed, like having all the states in the region pass California emission standards, like changing the fuel blends. And they felt it was a better, a better vehicle or a better tool to accomplish that. To accomplish that. Uh, does that answer your question, Representative? I just, yeah, what, what, what you said made me think of one other thing I could ask you. So is what you're saying that they're trying to go directly to a market solution by taking the externalized costs and putting them into the price of the product? Because that's what I see it as when well, I look at one would think that if it were a true cap and trade program, the, the issue, one of the issues with, um, with TCI that's very different from the regional greenhouse gas initiative is that TCI actually has what they call a circuit breaker, meaning that if the price of gasoline were to increase too much, um, that they would just add more credits. So, this, or if they felt like that they felt like the price of gasoline hadn't gone up enough, they would, they would reduce the number of credits. So in other words, clearly they have a target for how much they want to increase the price of gasoline in their head. And they would, they would execute, execute um, with that goal in mind. That's not market related, that, that, that's command and control. And, and I think that is, that's an important distinction uh, between that and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Whereas, whereas with Reggie, when you wanna reduce Reggie credits, Reggie comes before the, the participating states and, sa and says, vote on this. Whereas TCI would be able to change the number of credits uh, without, without any, any involvement of, of the legislature or, or either of the states, whoever is authorized within the state to make that decision. Um, and as is, is the legislature with, uh, with Reggie, the, none of that would take place with TCI. Okay, and I would very much like- I to would I would remind you. members that we're not here to debate. We're here to ask questions. Well, and I, debating I, about the climate transportation climate initiative is not the subject of the bill. The subject of the bill is much more narrow than that. So yes. uh, I would also remind members that if we uh, stay in this meeting room beyond five o'clock, we're imposing on the staff of the uh, legislative office building who have lives and would like to go home uh, at a reasonable hour. So with that said, uh, Representative Cretion, you're authorized to ask a question. Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Moore, for taking my question. Um, getting back to this issue uh, of being germane, I see this bill as sort of inappropriately micromanaging how DES is spending their time. Can you give me any other examples where we've forbid agency staff from participating in particular meetings or topics um, in the interest of telling them how they need to spend their time to achieve their goals. So uh, I appreciate your comment, but remember, we're here to ask questions, not to deliver our opinions. Yeah, I, I was asking if there were any other examples of places where we're telling DES that they can't weigh in on a particular topic in the interest of making them more efficient. So, so uh, first of all, Rep Representative, thank you for the question. And if I, if I might do a quick aside, I want to give my best to uh, Representative Pled. It's great to see him on, uh, on the camera. So great to see you, Representative. Uh, and to, to answer the question, I, I will say I have worked both in the legislative and in the executive branch of government. And the answer is constantly uh, the legislature does micromanage if, you, if you're sitting in the executive's perspective. Uh, if you're in the in the agencies, you you feel a constant pressure of micromanagement that's taking place uh, by the legislature. When you're in the legislative pr perspective, you're you're simply ex executing your priorities. So <laughs> it really depends on whose seat you're sitting in uh, as to how, what your perspective on that. I I agree with the legislator's perspective. I think it's better that elected people actually make the decisions and set the policy. And I understand that the executive branch will always view that as micromanagement, but I actually view it as a good thing. And I, that's someone who's been on both sides of the fence. Thank you for that uh, response. Uh, Representative Mann, you recognize? No, Representative Mann put his hand down. So I guess we're done um, uh, with Representative Moore. I'd like to call on the next speaker, who is Paul Nikolai, who represents the Granite State taxpayers. Mr. Nikolai, you're on. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay, so did that work? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. 
I'm Paul Nikolai and I'm from Grantham. I'm here today as a Granite State Taxpayer Board Member. I and the Granite State Taxpayers are here to request that you recommend that HB 373 ought to pass. We don't have to debate climate change or global warming to talk about this bill. The bill ought to pass to prevent a waste of New Hampshire taxpayer money. Regardless of your position on global change or global climate change or global warming, it is in fact a global issue. New Hampshire's contribution to global warming is minuscule. New Hampshire's contribution to any proposed solution will also be minuscule. That's because New Hampshire is, thankfully, minuscule. And Mr. Fitzgerald even said, he effectively confirmed this when he said that we participate in the discussions, but nowhere did you hear that the result of TCI or any other program was changed because of New Hampshire's position. And if you think about that, it makes sense. They have 98% of the problem. They're gonna contribute 98% of the solution. Whatever we're going to do is an afterthought. If in fact, tomorrow, New Hampshire emitted zero carbon, nobody would notice, including the environment. So whether we're at the table or not, the result of what happens in these deliberations is going to be the same. We can read about it in the newspapers, we can get the press releases, we can see all the documents. These are, after all, public agencies. The public has as much access to what they do as we have to what we're doing here today. So given that, it's a far more effective use of our tax dollars to not divert staff into discussions and debates where we will have no effect. We should rather have them work on things that we can affect in New Hampshire and that is for the benefit of New Hampshire people. So it's far more effective to use our tax dollars to simply analyze the result of these multi-year debates and then decide whether we want to join the program or not. For that reason, you should recommend that HB 373 ought to pass and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Nikolai? Did you provide written testimony, Mr. Nikolai? I did not. Uh, could you? We'd yes, appreciate it if you could. Okay. I will do that. Thank you. We do, would, would appreciate that. All right. Seeing no questions for Mr. Nikolai, I will call on the next speaker, who is Joseph Kwasnick. Mr. Kwasnick, you're on. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a couple of points. One is um, I actually participated in the development of Reggie back in the back in its formative days. So I do bring that perspective of uh, all the states that participated in Reggie, which included all the New England states, including New Hampshire. I found that um, those participants from the states and other organizations actually had quite an effect on um, on shaping this, the uh, the the uh, the development of Reggie, including New Hampshire, even though we're a small state, it had an outstanding um, uh, influence on how Reggie was developed. So uh, uh, the previous speaker's comment about why we even try, we should be trying, but let me just take a step back. Um, New Hampshire is a import of transportation fuels from overseas and from domestic producers in other parts of the United States, and as such as engaged in regional and national uh, fuel markets. And uh, as New England learned from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, any regional program such as Reggie or a low carbon fuel standard will likely significantly affect the price, characteristics, and the availability of transportation fuels imported into New England, whether we participate or not. Now, enacting House Bill 373, which would prohibit the DES from participating in the development of a low carbon fuel standard would likely leave New Hampshire with no ability to influence the development of a regional low carbon fuel standard, but for all intents and purposes, subject to all of the impacts of such a program and none of its potential economic benefits, surely not a good outcome for New Hampshire and its energy consuming citizens. Let New Hampshire DES uh, take a seat at the table. Thank you, appreciate the time uh, to provide this uh, testimony. I've also provided a written testimony, which is in the record now, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kwasnick. Any questions for Mr. Kwasnick? Seeing none, we'll move to our final speaker of the day and remind everyone that it is now three past five o'clock. 
And uh, there are committee staffers in the building here who would like to go home. So with that, I'd like to um, authorize uh, Mr. John Gage to make brief comments. You have two minutes, Mr. Gage. Hi, thank you. Well, I'm for prosperity too. I disagree with uh, the state coordinator of Americans for Prosperity though in how to get there. And um, I'm also a New Hampshire taxpayer. Um, and my, mate, my biggest concern for my family's future is carbon pollution. And I think that our environmental group in New Hampshire, the DES, should be involved in state, regional, and federal discussions um, on how to reduce carbon pollution. Um, I don't see TCI anywhere in the bill or uh, the um, amendment that, or what, what it's amending. Um, what I read is that this affects all low carbon emission standards at the state, regional, and federal level, um, basically putting blinders on our DES to, in any discussions about reducing carbon pollution um, that are going on at any level. Um, I don't, you know, this just seems like we're trying to stay ignorant and removing ourselves from discussions that um, our legislators should be aware of. Uh, we should be paying attention to what's going on at the regional and federal level, and we should have the experts in our state um, participating in discussions about reducing carbon so that we can make good dis decisions at our, at our state level. Um, you know, it, the, the Taxpayer Association fellow um, basically said we should just free ride. We're a small part of the problem. So why should we worry about our pollution? 30 seconds. Um, it's everybody else's pollution that's the problem. Well, <laughs> when everybody thinks the same way, nobody solves the problem. Um, I believe the correct way to address the problem at the global level is to put a price on it, on carbon at the federal level and return the money back to households. Um, and we can use border adjustments to push that carbon price around the world. What we can do at the state level is to prepare for a price on carbon. Um, many groups say we'll have a price of $100 per ton by 2030. Time's up. Be... Thank you. Uh, Thank appreciate you. that. Did you uh, submit written testimony on this bill? I do not, but I shall. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate your contribution here this afternoon. And we appreciate, uh, I appreciate the committee's hard work today in uh, getting through another five bills and uh, getting us much closer to our goal of getting through the entire 32 bills uh, on the calendar. So thank you all. We, uh, our work is not done this week. We will be right back here on Friday to hear another six bills, uh, including a couple of really um, hot button items such as HB 315 about community power. So we'll see you then and thanks again. Have a good uh, midweek. Take Representative care. Representative Bose, can we get the sign-ins for and against blue sheets? Oh, sorry. Thank you for that reminder. So for House Bill 373, we had 17 people who signed in in support and 74 who signed in in opposition. And we had um, Representative Manjapudi signed in as an elected official in opposition to the bill. Uh, Representative Tony Leckis signed in in support of the bill. Representative Maureen Mooney signed in in support of the bill. Um, and I know uh, there was one other, John Potichek, Potuchik, sorry, uh, signed in in support of the bill. And Susan DeLumis signed in in support of the bill. Kevin Craig signed in in support of the bill as well. And did uh, Chris True signed in in support of the bill as well. So all representatives. Uh, and then Vanessa Sheehan uh, signed in in support of the bill um, as well. So those are all the blue sheet sign ins for House Bill 373. So I'll close the public hearing on 373 and bid you all uh, farewell. Yes, so speaking. Can I just have your attention for one minute. I just wanted to add a little bit of information about the 
capacity factor for solar, I calculated for my solar for one year, I got 13.7% capacity factor, which is pretty close to what we were talking about. And incidentally, I'm getting energy recs. Uh, I've sold, I think, six of them this past year between $22 and $38 per megawatt. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, everybody have a good uh, midweek and we'll see you back here on Friday. Representative Cretian, did you have a yeah. question? I don't want to keep you. I just um, was wondering if you had any sense of um, subsequent committee meetings that are being scheduled just to help me work out my work schedule to make sure I can uh, be here. <laughs> okay. So yes, we're having a um, full day of committee work sessions, uh, committee sessions on Friday, the 12th. And again on Friday the 19th, and then again on Monday the 22nd. Thank you very much. Okay, Appreciate thank you. It.